Don't fear what you don't know Cause we're far from certain
to break their spine and reclaim what once was mine. Those cravens backstabbed me, deceived me. Never shall I tolerate their crimes again. Now let the hunt begin. Oh, seven thousand souls scared and daunted. Such a tale of old. Not too long ago, this village was a golden scene of hope. Call down the reckoning to bring back hope and peace. Restore our glory to live forever. Bring down the dark regime. I know. Eternal power, lead us to order. I am the light bringer.
era of metal has begun. And metal shall prevail. For we know what they have done. Five legends of our realm who sought to follow the path of their dark musings. But they did not know what they had summoned. Pentakill. To these creatures, there is but one thing left to do. <laughs> Heavy metal! Everybody and welcome back to the LPL. Welcome back to Playoffs. I'm Munch. I'm joined by Nymera as we head into day number three of our playoffs. As we we've got back-to-back -back days here, and I'm loving every second of it. Just pure best of fives coming straight at your faces. And we finally had, I say finally, we very quickly had our first five game series coming in yesterday as well. We really started to kick things up on a pretty high level of intensity. Uh, we saw that, you know, uh, Weibo overcame IG in that first round uh, on the bottom half. But when we were last casting, we saw that WE really ended up did, uh, doing a really good job versus OMG. It felt like they found their comfort zone and played towards their ideal conditions and played really well versus them. They certainly did. So the final score of Weibo versus IG was 3-2 to Weibo in the end. That happened yesterday. Uh, Weibo winning the first two games, then IG coming back in the next two games, and then finally it finishing out in favor of Weibo. Uh, again, Weibo consistently inconsistent. Is there yeah. a better way to describe that team? I really don't think there is. I feel like we say it all the time. I feel like it's... I'd well, keep saying it until it stops me. It's exactly, it's completely true every single time. I don't understand that team at all, but it was a bit of a bagger series. It was fun to watch, that is for sure. Um, but we're going into WE versus NIP today, and I think we should start off by looking at WE and how they approached their first series because they managed to take down OMG. A lot of people predicting OMG in that series, but WE, they did a really interesting thing with their draft. After game number one, they completely switched the way that they wanted to play. If it's broke, yeah. fix it. The opposite of the, the classic phrase. You can see here, swapping where the carries are in their rosters to, to have 80 carries in the late game and more utility in the draft. So typically WE were a team that played utility AD carries and then they kind of put towards, uh, you know, carries on the top side of the map, particularly in top lane, but sometimes through from the jungle as well. You can see that, as you rightfully said, you know, they changed that around midway through the draft, despite what happened in the rest of that too. And 
Honestly, I feel like WWE did a really good job by giving themselves the right tools and drafts and then getting their important players into the game in the right point too. In particular, I think that Iwandi and I think that Wayward had an absolutely fantastic series. Right here, six minutes into the game, Wayward in game two gets a gank onto mid lane. You can see that in a load of these other clips too. Iwandi goes absolutely monster mode and gets some huge team fights on the bar. You know, this is a pick which we've not seen. It's not particularly an LPL specialty. It's an Iwandi specialty though and he has done so much work in various different carries um well enchanters and, and kind of like different picks from the bot lane you can see that he even played like a jana game in this series he's had a really good get uh, series for himself yesterday he certainly did the uh the tristana as well from fofo definitely a highlight pick not just uh for we but across playoffs so far it feels like tristana is going to be a focus but we it felt like the longer the games went on the the more time they had and the more kind of just front to back team fight these compositions were it seemed to work better for them so expect to see more of that today uh, but their opponents today are also going to be a lot tougher because nip they are very much a top team but it's been sort of a turbulent split to get to this point nymera it has been because this team went to seven and one they were poised to make playoffs very very early into the split and then things started to go a bit awry later that things went on you can see that though despite all of this fantastic early game presence and presence around objectives so then you have to ask yourself the question, well, if they're getting some of these First Bloods and Dragons and Heralds, these are all important objectives, what's happening to this team? Why did they fall off a little bit towards the end of the split? Well, a lot of the time it is about what happens in the very late game. As we were talking about, you know, the First Bloods are fine. They're managing to get active into the game early. That is a very important point in the game. I think this happens across the map too. We see a bot lane, we see a top lane, and they can transfer that to some objectives as well into the mid game. The problem is, sometimes when it comes to the hyper late game, I'm going to particularly reference Top Esports. Maybe not a particularly fair series because you are playing against the likes of one of the best teams in the league. They got really, really just outshone in the late game. And this isn't a unique thing to them. They have occasionally had this. So today, we're looking to see if they don't replicate this. They need to cleanly close out games. Yeah, we saw the stats on our screens where in the early game, you know, very good at getting first straight, very good at getting first blood, very good at getting the heralds. They're good at building those early leads. It's a question of using those leads and actually closing things out. Because as you can see, the team fighting has been a little bit of a struggle for them. And it does feel sometimes they're a little bit lost as a team. Sometimes they're not necessarily on the same page. And up against WE, a team that we've just shown that the, the more scaling and team fight focused their compositions got versus OMG, the better they started to look. That could be a, a scary dynamic for NIP. I do still expect NIP to be a favorite coming into this series, and a huge portion of that is because of the man in the mid lane. I mean, we would be remiss not to talk about Commander Rookie in that mid lane coming into this series because he's had a phenomenal split. You can see first in the league for damage per minute, second for damage percentage in his role. His CSD is always exceptional. He's had 10 solo kills across the split. And all of this while playing a lot of control mage still and he manages to do this while being involved in pretty much every fight I, I actually cannot believe that rookie is having such a good individual split his laning stats are some of the best i i think that particularly in terms of lpl mid laners the laning phase rookie has been really at the top of the table for that's him and knight maybe the two i throw out there and he's managed to take over the game whilst also connecting to his team when he's been on a load of globals he can do a lot of great things there but he makes the solo plays too he literally just does it all this clip in particular really um impresses me he could have altered down to bot side instead he hides in fog of war and uses the combo from out of it on the salir and that's just this heads up play to realize actually i can use both of this again using the playmaking late game as well particularly on the ari it's been one of his best picks and i think he's one of the very best aries in the world right now as well yeah. to make some absolute heroic plays in the late game i mean this play i think is one of the one of the best Ari plays we saw all oh, year yeah. long so far in the rpl like rookie really showing what you can do on a pick like that and one of the big things for Rookie for me is I want to see that kind of gameplay. I don't want to see him on Karma. I don't want to see him playing the supportive style. It's not that he can't do it. It's that you got Rookie on your roster. Let the man carry the games. He's got the power. He's got the ability to do it's it. Like, I just want to see it on my screen. You've got like this fine, fine cut of, you know, dry age steak and stuff like this. <laughs> and you're just like mashing it up and making it into a mince. A burger, yeah. and it's like, it's like, okay, yes, it's still going to be good. But imagine what could have been. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely feels that way to me as well. Uh, let's take a look to the top side, though, before we jump into our draft and kick this series off, because we got to talk about this top 
top lane, Shanji versus Wayward. Two names that I think have built quite a reasonable reputation within the LPL over the last few splits. Wayward really having a bit of a resurgence this year after a pretty lackluster summer. Um, but Shanji on the opposite side feels like he's been a bit hit or miss when he's been on the Cassante. He's looked fantastic. He's had some rougher games, but generally I'd say a good split. And it feels like two quite different players when they approach the rift. You can see from these stats, and this is what we want to highlight here, they both get involved in the game. The kills and assists at 15, both very high between these two. The kill participation, very, very high between these two. Very high in their respective roles, of course, uh, compared to that. But Wayward is managing to do that whilst also still being ahead in lane, whereas Shanji is giving up some of those laning advantages for the early skirmishes. Now, I think that if this game does get scrappy, Wayward does get on something like the Rek'Sai or the Gragas, or something like that, which he showed the other day, um, there is a chance that Shanji can't play the frontline team fights as well as he could do because he's going to be too far behind on an individual level. I still want to see them go with getting involved. I love to see early top side skirmishes, particularly yep. players of such high caliber as these two. In fact, one of WWE's game plans is how much, how involved can we get Wayward um, early? But they need to make sure, particularly NIP, that the top lane matchup doesn't fall out of hand when that is happening. Yeah, I mean, literally, the first, me and you cast the first WE series off playoffs. One of the things that we said so about this ago. team is that they are the grub gang, right? Like, so often they love to focus on those grubs. We actually saw them shy away from that a little bit versus OMG, and it does feel like they changed the stance a little bit. But a lot of the value is being through Wayward. But that Rex side pick does seem to be, like, kind of changing the way they play around Wayward they play around Wayward, and instead him kind of moving out of the top side, and we saw him roaming on that right side, making plays towards mid lane. Like We saw the clips of that earlier. It does feel like a slight shift in how they approach playing around their solo laners, and that could be needed, honestly, because you're going to have to shut down Rookie somehow, and I don't know if Fofo in the 1v1 is going to be able to find a massive advantage individually, but maybe Wayward can come in and influence that lane. That definitely helps. I do wonder whether we're going to see something like real again, uh, Tristana first pick priority. Uh, Rookie hasn't played it so far. He's been playing much more of the roaming mages. Now, if Fofo gets his hands on Tristana, it gives you really good lane push. It gives you really good ability to scale up into the game with the uh, ADC itemization buffs as well. I wonder if that could be kind of, a, I'm not going to say it's a silver bullet because uh, it might help them in one game. It's not going to silver up the whole series, but it could end up helping in terms of that mid lane matchup, just getting that push and making sure that Fofo can be so, so relevant. That's a pick which I've got my eyes on. It's feeling like a very much an LPL, pa LPL power pick. And on the other side, you know, Azir is back for Rookie. Rookie has yeah. been a fantastic player of, you know, a great many mages. The mage of all mages right now is Azir. And we've, you know, we, we had that one graphic. He's like, have you seen this bird? Parents are worried sick. Um, he's back. He's been found. Don't worry. We found the missing bird. Um, and I would expect that to turn up for Rookie a couple of times in this draft today as well. Yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, obviously the Azir being back is, is fantastic for Rookie. I feel like his Talia is also exceptional. Oh, and yeah. they both kind of fulfill a similar role within a composition, not just that you're kind of a control mage that can theoretically set up picks and can, can play around the map, but more importantly, you can peel. You can protect your AD carry, and it does feel like we're headed towards a meta where AD carries, especially in the late game, become extremely important. We saw WE starting to shift towards having late scaling AD carries. Having a Talia or an Azir can be that protection. The alternative, obviously, being having something like a Maokai in the jungle and just having another AD carry in the mid lane in the form of that Tristana, or we even saw AD LeBlanc yesterday. So it does feel like quite an exciting time to be watching drafts right now because it feels like we're mid-shift in the LPL of a meta change and I don't exactly know where we're going to end up by the end of it. Yeah, you know, just that the huge shift by, you know, the itemizations and AD carries and then Azir being back has really profound impacts on each other's lanes as well because for a while we were seeing, you know, real lane dominance bot side with Karma in the mid lane to help kind of like have this mid-game spike at one item so you play through multiple pushing lanes. With the Azir back in the table, with AD carries being able to play mid lane with Tristana, I, I even wonder whether we can see other AD carries being put into mid lane as well, but there is a chance for the crit itemization <laughs> being put there. <laughs> what are these, it's one of these ways to the cap. But anyway, right, that is stuff. With Azir being back and carries being in mid lane, it means you can shift that late game carry responsibility around the place a little bit. And if you can end up in a strong draft with, you know, uh, Azari and a Tristana on the same team like WWE have shown us, then yeah, you can just sit pretty and not have to worry about the early fight so much, scale up to two, three items and absolutely blow their heads off in the late game because AD carry itemization is very, very strong right now. It certainly is. And I, I feel like we kind of have to talk about the bot lane matchup as well in the context of talking late game AD carries and all of this. You know, I want the and stay 
looking pretty solid as a duo. I wonder, especially, I think, one of the best players on WE during yeah. um, their, their series against OMG. I do have a little bit of a worry for NIP down in that bottom side. I feel like Juo has had a few funky games across the course of this split. Like, I, I don't think he's, you know, I don't think he's a liability or anything like that, but I do think there's quite often a few times where he's not necessarily on the same team page as the rest of the team gets caught out of position and sets up his opponent when you look at the blg series when you look at the top esports series at the end of the split for nip a lot of the plays are set up off of picks of Juo being out of position and then that snowballs into something more so he really needs to be on form today particularly because it's one of those kind of unseen well not unseen but it's one of those underrated facts i think in pro play because supports aren't the ones that are doing damage you don't always see things in stats but a support difference in a full series in a best of five at the high level like the lpl can absolutely determine the series um it wouldn't surprise me to see nautilus first pick banned for between both these um supports throughout the entire series i mean it was in the first round um against iwandi lpl has loved the melee supports and the engaging picks being back to um to allow that sort of playstyle yep. even more of course i want he's a little bit different because he doesn't just need the melee supports he's one of those um lpl kind of uh support players that can play a really big menagerie of different picks as well and he showed that four different champions of four different games in the first series but you just need to make sure that draw is not on comfort on the other side i think that if maybe you target the support pool maybe i want he comes out with some of the weird stuff and then uh draw is left in a bit of an awkward situation yeah we'll have to see i, I mean what the support pool ends up looking like today, like you say, could be determined by bans. Like like you say, the Nautilus is uh, very much a high priority for pretty much any team. I'm really curious if we start to see a little bit more Leona as the meta shifts towards, like, if we do get more hard engaged supports coming in. You know, we've seen a bit of the Blitzcrank, which has had uh, varying levels of success. Certainly WE kind of, I think, regretting that pick in their first series. We've seen Thresh come back in, you know, Nautilus is picked ban, Rakan is locked in a lot. I feel like maybe there's a maybe there's an angle for Leona. I don't know if her stats just aren't good enough or what, but it feels like it Probably. feels weird to me to see Nautilus this high priority and not see Leona right there with him in the, the LPL. The like after all of problem, these years, the big problem is there is so much more tenacity now in the game, and Lord, Nautilus doesn't have to care about it because the hook's mainly a displacement. Up, yeah. uh, you have the the, the passive which is a stun, but most of it's knockups. And tenacity doesn't care about that, um, so. Yeah, I mean, the Leona can, it can be one of those picks where, like, you go deep enough into the champion pool, it can really, really um, threaten that. Um, I, I, I would quite like to see it too. Uh, you know, I think if some of the, you know, the famous um, LPL Leona plays, like the, the, the Sword Art Finals play with the Leona, the, the, the around Herald Pit, the, the three man stunt, fantastic plays from history there too. And of course, um, both these players, they know how to find and engage, thread that needle that way. Let's see what champions they have to do that today. So we come out onto the stage and an upbeat tune to welcome them back. It certainly is, as our teams will step on out. I'm excited for this matchup, honestly. I feel like this is a matchup that really has the potential to go either way. WE, I think, impressing a lot of people in their first series against OMG. Now, a much bigger challenge ahead of them. This is a team that they're really going to have to show up to beat because NIP, they've shown that obviously their early games have been really strong. They have vaulted in the late game, but it feels like you know, coming into playoffs, you'd expect them to be focused on that. You'd expect them to be cleaning some of that up. And a lot of it is small mistakes that are reasonably easy to fix, you would hope. And I just want to shout out as well, um, the, the little blue ribbons everyone's wearing that everyone's pointing out, that is for Autism Awareness Day. So great to see our players supporting as well. Oh, I never realized that. That's a cool uh, initiative to put that. So thank you for telling me that, Joe. I, I'm glad I learned this. I, I have to credit Ashid for messaging me on this card. Okay, me. well, thank you, Ashid, then. All the same. Thank you for letting I me know. I can't take credit, yeah. But good to see, anyway. Good to see. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see what form NIP are going to come in today. I certainly hope it will be good form. One of the matchups I'm really excited for as well is Aki versus Hunt, because I feel like when you look at that matchup, you know, Aki has... Theore like when when we start this year, you're looking at Aki in this roster. He's got Shanji top lane, rookie mid lane, like very very strong laners to play through, and it feels like just Shanji didn't necessarily have the most lane dominant split that you'd maybe expect from Shanji. And Aki has had some. He, I feel like Aki is always one of these players where he has some games that are just exceptional, and then he has other games where. You know, kind of a similar conversation to what I've said with Joel, right? Where sometimes he's just caught out of position and, and it ends up 
the game kind of unravels from there. And I feel like Hung is a really intelligent jungler, and especially like his early pathing, the way he thinks about the game is very good. I worry that if Aki does make any missteps in the early game, Hung could be a player that really punishes that. There is definitely a degree towards uh, just the mindset of these junglers and, and, and the game's play that you're kind of like describing there. To me, the way it comes across is that um, Hung is much more of the reserved jungler who has a, always holds a little bit back for when push comes to shove. So when it kind of comes to the big fight, he's, he's not just throwing himself into the play, the play too early, he ends up waiting for his moment. Aki has no reservations. This guy is going <laughs> in. Um, there was actually a quote from... Um, from Lyric earlier in the season, I can't remember which series it was, one of the regular season games where um, I think that Aki struggled for a bit. Remember, there were some there were even some rumors that Tarzan was going to come into the team and there was um, you know, some worries about Aki stepping back from the roster and being replaced because he had a really awkward mid-split. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of that was because he wasn't used to the fact that he wasn't on the old OMG team that would follow him into Hell's Mouth at a drop of a hat, and they would always follow the engage. He's had to temper his aggression a little He's bit more. He's had to start thinking about He's the game. He's had to start thinking Instead about, will this champion, just lose me the champion. game? <laughs> <laughs> but he was so successful with that for such a long time that it's hard to change that mindset. Now, I do think he has done that towards the end of the split. I think the yeah. top eSports series is actually very good from NIP, despite the fact that they walked away with a 0-2. They lost in two very high pressure late game scenarios and a lot of their victories in team fights did come from the likes of rookie and aki and shanji all do it you're kind of comping up well on that top side so if they are on that kind of form then maybe you know the intelligence of hung is going to just kind of get sucker punched out of him you've got to make sure that you land the first blow well you can't give you, you can't be pushed off rhythm rhythm by a time a team like nip see if they can i'm nervous for the early game for we that's where i feel nip should be coming out with an advantage. That top lane matchup. Maybe Shenji could have trouble, depending on what Wayward does end up going for. If Wayward does manage to get himself that Rek'Sai again, I feel like we saw different uh, levels of Rek'Sai play from Wayward across that first series, but it felt like the longer the series went on, the more comfortable it got. Um, but I wonder what Shanji will answer that with. It's very possible that we have a very passive lane up there with like, you know, <laughs> Kudir versus Rek'Sai kind of thing where it's not necessarily a lot of action going on. But it do, both of them give you that ability to get out on the rest of the map. Shanji did play a game of the Rek'Sai too. So this could be, t and particularly when we've had a break between um, regular season and playoffs as well. And also NIP have had the extra two days to prepare for their first series. Every chance that Shanji has got a counter, has play, pick, prepared the Rek'Sai to an even higher level now. So um, definitely one of those factors where, you know, you've got a team in NIP that have had a full series to watch now of WWE playing. And yep. to me, one of my worries against OMG, and one of the reasons why I thought OMG would overcome NIP, were, uh, not NIP, uh, WWE rather, was um, that I felt like WWE have a very specific set of conditions to be at their best. And that is Wayward getting involved early, and Iwandi getting a, a quiet laning phase bot side, which then allows him to roam across the map and also get involved early. If those two players have a hard time, if you punish them in bot side and you have, you know, Aki roaming down bot side and forcing players bot side, if Rookie is permanently roaming bot side as well, I don't think Iwandi gets to be part of that conversation. And that can be a real thorn in the side of WWE. So, if NIP have had this whole series from first round to watch through, and they've seen the regular season, and they're on form, if I was uh, NIP's coach, I would be feeling confident going into this series, because yeah. I need WE to show me a little bit more. I need them to show me that they can withstand early pressure, and their key players in Wayward and Iwandi to me, if they're not going to be so easily put into the game, I need yeah. to see WE overcome that. And it does feel a little bit like when you just look down these two rosters, there's just a bit more gunpowder on the side of NIP, you know, like there's just a little bit more value behind the names on the roster. And you do wonder when you get to those situations where it is do or die, when you get to the high pressure moments, like, you know, Rookie is going to step up in those moments. The question will be whether or not the, the players on the side of WE do step up, whether or not they're able to to show that, mm. that they're made of something stronger, you know, because I feel like this is a WE team that They've made it into playoffs. They, they were a nice place coming in, and that's exciting. I'm glad they made it. I feel like they're a team that deserved playoffs, but now we need to see them show us that they are more than just a round one, round two team. If they want to make it to double in, if, if, if whoever wins here is going to go up against FPX. Like, yeah. I, I feel like you need to really show something great today if you want to 
be in, be part of the conversation of that second series. Smiles on the faces of the players on stage. Can I just have a big shout out as well to all of the artists in the crowd? Um, very rarely yeah. do you see such creative communities kind of like show up in force so regularly to an event like this. I think in in League and in the LPL, we're we're really blessed to have ourselves a lot of creators around there. So if you're a creative watching this as well, we we appreciate you. It brings a little bit of a culling creativity to our crowds and to our screens and. Um, you know, I think it's uh, just nice to see that the players are, you know, in a good mood here on stage too. I think I really hope that NIP come in um, in full form. Coming into the first draft now, we'll have to see whether we will see stuff like uh, the Maokai, the Tristana, the Azirs, these crit AD carries and bot side. We're going to see Jinx rise up in priority as well. Are they going to be big factors in this series? Time to find out. First game, first champ select underway here. NIP on our blue side and straight off of the bat. The Tristana we've been talking about, banned away. The Ari we've been talking yep. about, banned away. <laughs> I wonder you getting the respect man of that Bard as well and the Nautilus removed from the table. So many of these things I expect to be 100 picks per six, uh, percent pick and ban. I think that Rookie uh, might be a top three Ari in the world right now. The guy's insane on this pick. I think Fofo has looked insane on Tristana. I want you. Incredible Bard. That does mean, though, with so many pocket pin picks banned out, you're going to leave a lot of very powerful things available. Now, we have seen Jinx ruin series. When Jinx comes through as a first pick, we saw OMG run over a game with it in game one versus WE, and they didn't have a lot to say about it. I'm worried for now WE, they need to make sure that they're not just going to be shoved in by Jinx rockets early, and they won't have Iwandi be, um, being kind of controlled on the bot side of the map. Already, this is danger signs for them. So Rakan locked in. Could lean towards that Zai that stays played, but no, the Zeri going to be a higher priority for them. And NIP already hovering the Ivor. Now, we've talked a lot about yeah. the Tristana Maokai as a combo. Behind the scenes in the LPL, as casters have been talking a bit about the Ivor and whether or not it'll yeah. show its face. The AD LeBlanc already played in playoffs, and Ivor works so well with those AD bits. We, uh, we had a bit of a laugh yesterday about, uh, of course, IG versus Weibo, where it felt like Weibo, uh, no tree, no win. It felt like that was the case. <laughs> so we might have to see if there's more arboreal firepower to be put onto the table as well. It's going to be the Tom Kench locked in for draw. I do think that his Tom Kench has been one of his more stable picks. Uh, and it really does help with this kind of composition where um, it's now very obvious what you want to do with this Jinx, right? You are there to be the savior for this Jinx so they can get that first reset. Shanji on Renekton, very comfortable pick for him. Now, I wonder whether Wei would just go straight towards something um, like the Rek'Sai for lane pressure. It would make a lot of sense. It's locked in there. It will be there just to nullify the Renekton. Um, in terms of getting a dominant laning phase, Renekton should still get pushed early on. But once you get towards one, two items, Rek'Sai really starts to take over in terms of tankiness. Yeah, the sustain. Also, just the ability to, to push out those waves. You can kind of trade your health to push the wave and then use that passive to, to sustain back up again. So just, like you say, nullify is a great word for what Rek'Sai is bringing to that top lane. Now we move towards our bands as we've got top lanes and bot lanes locked in on both sides. Rookie has his Talia removed from that pool and it's Maokai taken away from Hung on the opposite side. Yeah, I think Hung had a really good couple of games on the, the Maokai throughout the split as well. The thing about Marco is that it's just a very obvious go button, which is very reliable. You don't yeah. have to throw your body into the play as well. Y you know, you do have something like the Rakan, but even then, the Rakan is the sole source of engage. feels much worse than when you have another engager alongside with you. Um, it wouldn't surprise me to see if NIP potentially even lock in something like a, a Poppy for Aki in the second round. You've already got a lot of dash champions on the other side, and if you're looking for that Rakan, Rek'Sai engage, the W can do very uh, lot of heavy lifting in regards to denying that. So NIP looking towards that Poppy, and looking to see what Rookie can do to be another long range backliner as well. Azir's open, might be a bigger pick for them. Here. Yeah, I was about to say, Azir is wide open. Fofo, Rookie both love that pick. Incredibly strong. Control Mage works well in these late game fights, which, you know, you've got Jinx Top Kench on the other side. You're probably leaning towards late game fights here. Looks like that will be the pickup for Fofo, yeah. and I can't say I'm surprised. I wonder whether we're going to get ourselves uh, an... Oh, okay, that is different. We have ourselves a Yone for Rookie okay. and a Sichuani locked in for Aki. Now, this is a very OMG 2023 draft. Double melee synergy, AD topside with the uh, Sejuani. Very good ability to early brawl with the Sejuani permafrost passive on that E. Very, very impactful. Now, if W are out of position on topside, they are going to get absolutely smashed by the early damage of NIP. Yeah, this is a... 
sheer top. I mean, this is like classic drafting, right? From the side of NIP, where you've got Sejuani with two melee solo laners, like pure power in the top side of the map. And then you've got Jinx Tom Kench, which is one of the most weak side available weak side lanes that, that you can think of down in that bottom lane. It does feel like a pretty telegraphed early game from NIP, but it's a strong early game, that's for sure. Hung answering with a trundle as well to be able to right. duel a little bit in the early game with the Sejuani. And what that does mean is that you're likely forcing the Sejuani going into phase rush. You don't want to go aftershock into the trundle because if you pop your aftershock and then trundle ults, you go into negative amounts of armor. It's very bad for you. However, you are now playing around immobile jungle into a pretty good heavy CC composition from NIP. The problem with this trundle is yes, you deal with the Sejuani, but if you do get caught out, you only have one flash and you are very likely to get locked up for the Jinx resets. Yeah, if you get resets now as well on that Jinx, feels like Jinx is kind of queen of the late game once again. We've seen this for a great many years at this point, particularly now with the changes to the passives, being able to stack up through a team fight as well. You cannot let this champion get ahead and get involved. So, very strong early top side from NIP. Need to see whether WE can overcome that storm and get themselves into the game. Can they survive to the late game? It was the story of their series against OMG. It's going to be the story again here for game number one against NIP. And looking at that mid lane as well, Fofo bringing out the Azir. It's an absolute classic for him. 60% win rate over 91 games in his career. Whereas Rookie bringing out the Yone. This is only his sixth game ever, but he's four and one on the pick. Every single game has looked great. Let's get into this banger mid lane matchup and game number one of our third series of 2024 spring playoffs. <laughs> There's a little rookie Jayo at the end there. You know, it was a bit of a standoff. I wasn't sure if uh, we were going to get the Jayos coming on through. I almost lost the standoff, but it came through in the end. Important to mention, Hung managed to clear a ward there. Just get slightly more XP. I don't know how much that really influences things in the jungle. Obviously, if solo laners are able to get that last mm. hit, can get them an advantage. But you can see vision there. So Hung will be spotted on his opening clear. A very aggressive positioning from Photo can drop. It is. They just want to get themselves um, a little bit of information to understand whether if they push up early, and you can do as a Jinx, level 1, of course, you have way better wave clear than a Zeri who only has the single target kind of Q. Um, Jinx gets to rocket down the wave. Now, they might look for themselves a strong early trade, as say, and I want you to come back to the lane as well. Doesn't get the tongue lash, though. It's a little bit unfortunate. But now they know that hung has started on the bot side of the map, they'll be happy to push out this bot wave, knowing that they're not going to just get uh, ganked at level 3. Just having that range advantage so valuable at level one. Straw and I want the begin as they mean to go on here. Just immediately go for these trades, but Jinx should be able to get the priority there. One thing about the Yone, obviously, you are going to fall behind a little bit in these first couple of levels. Once your abilities are online, that's when you can start to threaten. But Fofo should have absolute control in the early stages of this mid lane. And one of the big things that, um, actually, I'm actually a little bit surprised here that Fofo still went for the fleet footwork in this matchup because I feel like if you go towards the Conqueror, you can really, really bully out the Yone in the first few levels of the game. We saw um, uh, Scout last time that um, Azir was in meta doing that an awful lot, kind of going away from the fleet. Of course, the fleet footwork, very good when you're getting traded on uh, multiple times. You can keep regening up, but I feel like in the early levels, you get so much value out of this one. Also worth noting that it's not going to be the tank Azir that we have seen sometimes coming through as well. This is going to be uh, fleet footwork into what we assume to be, you know, Nashes and something like a Lich Bane or a Leandris. I'd imagine it's a Leandris in this game second. So Fofo looking to try to pick up some of that backline DPS that Rookie won't bring out in terms of DPS, but will do in terms of burst. You're looking to play two long range carries compared to the one on NIP with Jinx. And it's going to be down to playmaking. And honestly, I feel like I've been given a Christmas present here to start yeah. off the series. Because, you know, I literally came in saying, I want Rookie on carries. I want to see Rookie <laughs> having agency in this series. It brings the Yone into the mid lane. And I think this is one of the things, you know, this is the conversation of Azir. There's a Reddit thread this morning talking about Azir's back and suddenly he's 85% presence again. Look at this trade from Rookie. Big damage there. I don't mind Azir being in the meta because things like the Akali, things like the Yone 
kind of get enabled as well by being having that matchup into Azir, where Assassins can do well into these scaling uh, control mages. So definitely hmm. opens up for creativity if players Ooh, are willing pops. to go for it. Voting using that ghost pretty liberally, honestly. Uh, I think um, maybe just I, I can't. I, I was trying to track that trade, and I, I was looking at the minimap instead of looking whether Stay had used his E. If you use the E on on Zeri, it means that of course he can't use it to go back over a wall, and um, it means that Fodzik can kind of use that early ability to run at people and use the extra range and damage bluntly that Jinx has over that Zeri. But yeah, no, largely I agree. You know, I I like Azir as a champion. He's a he's a champion that at least makes plays as an interactive. I do think in terms of drafting. Um, it can kind of make things a bit of a snooze fest because Azir is such a good blind pick and you just know that yeah. it'll fit into most compositions. I mean, whereas if you're picking towards like the Nico, the Karma or the Ari or something like that, you kind of know you're committing to a team fight identity or something like that, which means that teams have to think a little bit more and they can't just slam in an Azir and think, oh, it'll be fine. On that level, I'm kind of a little bit annoyed that this champion is just once again permanently here. Um, but either way, glad to see Rookie picking out something and saying, you may have picked uh, the vanilla of the mid lane. He's picking up, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know what ice cream flavor Yone would be, but but not, not vanilla. I mean, he's like, he's like rum and raisin. It's not yeah, for everyone, yeah. but but for the people that like it, oh boy, does it hit different. <laughs> uh, and Rookie's Yone certainly does hit different, that is for Still sure. The First pool party skin as well, you know, he's in the right mood. This is summer does. weather. Yeah. Uh, is it pool party Rexai up top as well? You'd hope so. Bit of jet ski <laughs> action. Um, Looks like first strike going to be kicked off already here by WE. We saw a reset coming out from Fotix, so an opportunity there for WE, and they are more than happy to capitalize on that fact, which is pretty big, honestly, considering we we know NIP across the course of the split love their first strikes, but with this draft, with the you know Tom Kench Jinx bot, not exactly playing for that bot pressure. Yeah. So now NIP are getting towards ultimates on the top side of the map, though WE needs to be very, very careful. Once you get level 6 on Trundle, yes, you can overcome some of that initial burst, but it's not going to be enough to win you a trade. You need to have damage there and available as soon as NIP pull the trigger. So WE, you need to get good vision. You need to understand when Rookie is roaming and what he's going to be doing with those roams, particularly with relation to what Aki and Shanji are doing. Even just walking up like this from Hung, he needs to back off. He needs to be so, so careful, because you do have that melee synergy and the early burst of the Sejuani Yoni being very, very dangerous to go up into. And it's how, oh, hang on, we've got an all-in on the bottom side. Chompers come out, but pretty much everything misses on both sides, and so nothing comes of it. Again, heavy trades from Rookie in the mid lane. But you're right, the, the Sichuani CC, such incredibly good setup with these melee solo laners, but also with the Yone specifically, you can layer so much with his ultimate and with his Q3 knockup on top of everything else. Like, there is a massive CC chain that you can get going there. Uh, one thing which I do want to talk about as well is we do have the Aftershock on Aki. So it's very good when the Trundle doesn't have six and doesn't have ultimate, but just <laughs> just be aware that I that, that, that does exist, that interaction in regards to making Sejuani and Ramus drop to negative armor amounts. It's very funny um, up until you are, in fact, the player with the negative armor and you realize you take a infinitely yeah. more damage. Red buff being started up, Aki is going to spot them. Feels like WWE have the first roam on this, so I want the out on the map. I want to just get absolutely chunked there by Aki and hung forced to flash as well. Good roam from Droll and from Rookie. Fopo was still in that mid lane and so hung just loses a summoner. You see that Rookie chose a really good angle there and now Rookie oh. did a pretty good trade. To gets himself the E to go and stop on the way. It still takes the damage from the ultimate so it's pretty much the same trade as it would have been all the same. But see that Fofo starting to get um, into a really bad lane state here. Because Fofo was trying to push Rookie in so he couldn't um, roam towards the plate but didn't finish off the push. Rookie now has the wave kind of frozen outside of his mid lane turret. You can see as the Ono versus the Azir, even on the CS but now actually starting to threaten to jump beyond the wave. Very much how you'd like to play as someone like the Aurelia. You can do Ooh. this. Big damage, I thought that was going to be more, but I won. He arrives on the scene and Rookie, Rookie realizes he can't go any further. Sees the opportunity though, and that's what we're talking about. Rookie yeah. having a champion that shows off his killer instinct. Yeah, again, just freezing the wave outside of his turret and saying, okay, you got to put yourself into our position, has led to this entire series of play. Aki doesn't have ult, but Shanji is here. Remember that with the Sejuani, you have really good CC synergy. Rookie really going aggressive. It doesn't matter if he has such low HP because of that W shield. With the CC chain, you can trade very aggressively, and you see building a minor CS lead at this point. It's only going to get worse as he's now resetting. We'll be able to pick up a little bit more damage, perhaps even a 
Bam Scepter. We'll see what first item he's going to go for. It is going to be that Bam Scepter and a pot coming in. So he can consistently go for these trades. Yeah, looking towards maybe the Blade first item. Seen a bit of that. I'm actually quite interested to see what Yoni build we get out of this. Because we have seen some... I mean, obviously, stuff like the Infinity Edge. Very, very strong on this patch because of the extra 10% yep. crit damage. But um, a lot of Yone players have been playing for a while, kind of like half tank. You go towards something like um, an Iceborne Gauntlet and you just become really insufferable because you can't blow up the Yone if he misses engage at that point. He's a much more forgiving champion. Um, so we'll have to track that as it goes through, but still, the Vamp Scepter early in the build for uh, champions like Aurelia and for Yone and Yasuo just means that you can't shove them out of lane and it's really annoying to kind of um, push them out of extending laning phases beyond that point. Uh, it certainly is that sustain. So difficult to deal with. And Fofo, once again, finding it difficult to walk up to these waves. Juo mm. has moved in to try and get some vision control, but I want these here to answer and protect that control ward. Now, the second Drake coming up in a minute's time. WE were able to get that first one for themselves, and it was traded for three grubs for NIP. I wonder if they'll be able to find a second. Well, I think NIP are ready to fight now. You have the level sixes, you got the Sejuani. You need to be careful not to give the Trundle huge value in this early game, because, of course, again, we talk about the Trundle Sejuani matchup. Aki has his ult back up, but WWE have really good vision control. They've lit up the bot side, but you can see that Fofo still in danger. He's having to be babysat in his laning phase so much now because Rookie is threatening so much from this laning phase. NIP, they're not being able to play around Fog of War, though. It's hard for them to find a true engage. Oh, on the, he's a little cautious. He's trying to wait as long as he can and gets the W on to draw. Gets a little bit of sustain. But NIP, like you say, now very willing to posture aggressively. Very willing to try and test WE. We expect leads from NIP in these early games. That is kind of the the identity that they've shown us over the course of this year. Whether or not they're able to find it, though, is a different question. I wonder, could it be stunned up? There's the chain CC we were talking about. And I wonder, cut down where he stands. WE had all the vision control in the world, and they still can't get away from the combo of NIP. It's one overstep from my Wandy. Which means that the full grub take on this second second round is not going to come through from Team WE. It's going to be five overs out of NIP now, with Hung not being able to contest the remaining two. Wave is going to poke his head down to see if maybe he can stop one last one going over. I don't think he'll be able to, but we'll have to care, keep. Well, what's happening in the topside river? I mean, Wave is still there. Needs to be a little bit careful. Um, you know, it dude, look, like, does seem like it's just been the five take pretty cleanly here though from NIP. Dragon now being started up by Hung. Yeah, I'm surprised we didn't look at what was going on with Joel yeah. way with there, to be honest. But uh, our observer's confident that it wasn't going to lead to anything. They don't were don't right about it. Drake started it. up, though. Photix moved over. Stayers on the scene as well. This is a full-on 4v4 at this point. Top laners neither uh, in the area. But Shanji has that TP available. Looks like not going to be willing to pull the trigger, though. And the rocket just a tiny bit too early. So Drake taken by WE in the end. So if you don't have the Sidrani and Yone ultimates, you understand why NIP don't feel confident taking that fight, particularly against, again, uh, the full um, array of weapons available from WE oh, they had all of their ults. That's going to be another backstop. I don't think it's going to lead to anything more damage beyond that point. But still, NIP get themselves a kill on the board. And that's uh, important for them, particularly because it's a kill over to the Yone, and the Yone getting gold is really nasty. Yone, if he gets ahead of the game, is so different from right Yone is behind. And we, we just see that Permafrost comes up. This time it's Aki actually doing all of his own stunts and Rookie capitalizing on that one. But it can happen in so many different ways that it feels like if any yep. one person is on your screen, you need to be afraid that two others are going to fly over the wall at you afterwards. And I feel like this is a game where Rakan is a champion that's really, really difficult to punish usually. Sichuan is pretty good <laughs> at punishing that champion. Like you see there, Iwandi, I don't know if his W was on cooldown to start with, but the fact that Aki just gets the full stun without even needing to Q, without needing to ult first, uh, means that the rest of the follow-up is just too easy for the rest of the team. Like you said, Rookie, now with a kill. Scary stuff for the side of WE. They're not too far behind in this early game. Just a thousand gold, but they got the first two Drakes. So I think overall, not gonna be too worried about how this one started. Yeah, I think basically the whole way that this game has organized itself has been Rookie is on a pick that can't get out of lane easily. So the whole game plan has shifted around, well, how do we make sure that Rookie can still be in the game and capitalize off his laning phase? Because he's not been looking to push and roam. He's been looking to freeze the wave and take hard trades. But that means that every single other person on the map is going, well, we don't want our Azir to die. Well, we want to kill the Azir on the other side of that. It means that everyone roams back towards this mid lane because Rookie wants to be here. And um, freezing this lane like this means that he can get some really good value out of this laning phase. 
against that is it. Does mean though that I wonder and Wayward have had very chill early games. Wayward has got a full Thornmail first item against the triple auto attackers of NIP. That could potentially be very dangerous as well for NIP if they allow Wayward to get very, very tanky. It's a full AD composition. That's going to be a problem later on. Again, big damage out from Rookie on these traits. Does take a hefty chunk back, but now finishing off that Blade of the Rune King. Big moment for him. Both AD carries swapping up to this top side of the map as Herald spawns on in. And NIP, they love this Herald. Going for the Heralds has been something that they have kind of specialized in in a lot of their early games, and especially when you've got Sichuani and double melee solo ladies. You expect to want to Ooh, go for the Heralds. Stay with a bit of an all-in on the top side, but kind of just getting outranged. He's getting outranged, but he gets the burst of the ult there, which means that um, he gets a decent amount of rookie going in. But yeah, this is Thornvale and Wayward. I don't think he cares about this as much. I don't know. Rookie's still doing a lot of damage. There's the follow up. Shanji trying to chase, but Fofo saves his top laner. WE in full retreat because that Dominus Croc is scary. Okay, uh, maybe he does care about it a little bit. Right. Uh, one of the big things about Yone is that every other auto attack gives him magic damage instead of uh, physical damage. And his W does half and half of physical and magical as well, so it means that even against the Thornmelt, you can do some extra damage which doesn't really get blocked out by that armor. It means that Yone is so difficult to lock out in terms of damage fully on. Still though, gonna be some big ults taken away by Wayward, who's now back out onto the map, has of course regen because they're a Rex sign. It does mean that Herald going up to WE, yeah. despite the fact that the initial pick looked good for NIP. Did, but Fotic forced to reset on that top side. He's going to move back down towards that bottom lane. And NIP being challenged in this early game. Yes, they are still a little bit ahead in goal, but with that Herald, if that leads to a tower, it will pretty much even our game up. With WE getting those first two drakes as well, it's a Hextech Soul. This is a really great start to the series for WE. It is, and by and large, if an early game is quiet, I favor WE. Because when the game is quiet, look at look just look at the mini-map as well. Great red wards across the map. You can see there's even a red ward um, just outside of the Raptor Pit to see if there's any roams from mid lane into the bot jungle from NIP. WE, think Hung and I Wandi, once they have a quiet early game, are so good at setting up vision across the map to allow them to approach the next fight, so allow them to approach the next phase of the game. It could potentially be very dangerous now for NIP as they've let that go over. Joel's been caught out of position. The ultimate comes out from Hung, but won't be followed up on. The Flame Chompers come on through from Fotic, and that AD carry is enough of a threat. They don't want to dive too deep for a Tom Kench. Towers traded in terms of those tier ones on the top and the bottom side. Nothing more going to come from it. I'm looking towards where Hung goes on the map with that Herald, but with Drake spawning in 15 seconds, you can just use that mid to get yourself control of River. So first item, Spike means that I think both teams uh, are, are ready to fight should the opportunity present itself. You can't give a Hextech Salt Point over. You can't do that sure as NIP. I, I feel like you just got to fight this one now, even if it's not going to be opportune for them. This is going to be potentially a bit of an issue. We've had some questions about NIP's team fighting. Fodic getting chunked out early before this, even with the Nice Fab being put oh, onto God. now, means that he is not in position to fight. Harold being put down in mid lane, WE with presence in mid lane and the bot jungle, they should be in prime position to take themselves a jungle unless NIP can find themselves a clutch engage. I mean, there's no way, right? Fotic has to reset off the huge chunk before a fight is even thought about for NIP. Drake started now by WE. Oh, it is Hex Soul though. So actually Fotic getting back on the map a lot quicker than you'd expect. He is using the Hex but now Shanji's caught out. Oh, Shanji, that's not the place to be. Dominus flash slice and dice, but he's electrocuted to death. Stay finding that kill and NIP forced away. This is a rough early game. It is, but on the other side, wonderful setup of the map from WE. They've oh, allowed Wayward and Iwandi to get onto the map. The Herald's been put out into the mid lane. And just look how well they're controlling NIP. Now NIP need to fight without a top laner for one of the most important objectives here. What can Rookie do? He's going to try and find something. NIP really forcing this because Fofo has stayed in the mid lane trying to get that tier two. Wayward could be the target as Juo tries to get onto him, but he just tunnels away. Aki goes back on the Drake. And look at this the rotation from WE. They trade the third Drake in the game and get a tier two instead in the mid lane. That is massive map control acquired. Yeah, they were the ones that made that decision. Now, the big takeaway from this is uh, that WE chose to give up that dragon for the extra gold in pocket. Now, I don't know if I love that. I think getting towards an early sold point is still so powerful. And when you have a team composition which has been 
pushing it across the board. You know that the Rek'Sai is happy to take on all comers at this point. You have vision control across the map too while all this is happening. You have the choice of what you go for. Great pick on Shanji at first. This is the payoff for getting such good ward control and getting such good control of the map and every lane in it as well. Once Shanji's off the board, very hard to fight that dragon for NIP afterwards. But the big takeaway is now that WE, they are the ones controlling this. NIP, despite the fact that we've praised their early game and their stats and their first bloods and their first heralds, are being controlled heavily. The question now will be what happens in terms of late game decision making? Because I know it's only 19 minutes on the clock, but it does feel like we're already getting close to the late game with the way these two teams are playing. It feels like everyone's grouping up to posture around these objectives. So it's going to be down to split second decision making and how well these teams can play the match. Whoa, Yo. potentially caught out of position here. Quickness going to be used and the pillar denies the dive. Stay with another and the gold onto Zeri is perfect for WE. Oh, considering how much of a fall off WE had towards the end of the split, I am so happy to see them playing like this. You know, I thought that NIP would come in as favorites. I thought OMG would come in as favorites, though, in the first round. And WE, in this game at least, are um, showing that there's more to be said about that. WE, again, really showing what they can do once they have that quieter early game to get all of their... Um, all of their ducks in a row, really. It feels like NIP, um, they have just been controlled. You don't have Rookie roaming across the map. He's played for laning phase, and it hasn't actually ended up leading to that much so far. We're now waiting to see whether NIP can get themselves a clutch team fight somewhere. And that's not necessarily something that they've been specialized in so far in this split. It's certainly not. NIP really being tested here. But the mid game from WE is fantastic to witness. Doing such a good job of... Like you say, setting up vision around objectives and then punishing when somebody missteps. And we literally came into today talking about, you know, both Juol and Shanji at times have been known to misstep, have been known to get caught out of position. Both of them now have been caught out yep. of position in this game. And those have led to the advantages that we have built for themselves. A thousand gold lead, two drakes. Next one not spotting for another couple of minutes, but Baron is on the map. So a big misstep at this point with an Azir and Azeri on WE's side. That Baron will be gone in seconds. You can see that Aki was just hoping that Fofo would overstep his bounds just there. Aki, he's not really had much ability to influence this game, and I don't really think it's his fault. He's now had to play on complete vision. Again, just look how many wards are on top side. Just before this as well, there was a ward very deep into just the mid lane itself, and I wonder he's replacing that. They've really valued that vision deep in mid lane to see whether someone is walking out of that lane to go respond to a play. And it means that Aki has to walk directly into a lane. And just by process of elimination, I mean, this is a lesson that we learned in Season 4. This was the big um, lesson that vision control happened around there, which is, if you don't see someone on the wards, it means they're in the area where there are no wards. And that means that WE know exactly where NIP are. They're going to start up with the dragon, they're two-manning it, with the Leandris, Nash's Azir, and the Trundle. They're checking with the Jinx Rocket, they'll know this is happening, but that's about it. That was a replay, that was a replay. They've already checked with the Jinx Rocket, it's on cooldown here, which means the WE, they're just going to steal this. It's daylight robbery. It's 21 minutes on the clock, and WE are just taking Baron without any hope of a contest from NIP. Aki is so drunk. Baron taken down, and Aki's gone through a hex gate. Oh, this is an absolute disaster for NIP. Aki flies over the wall. He's trying to get an execute at this point. I think that's all he can hope for. I don't think he's going to get away with it, though. Iwandi should be able to get at least an auto in. And Aki, nowhere to go. And that's with Drake spawning in 50 as well. Oh, normally it's ninjas who do their dirty work in the shadows, but Team WE are showing them how it's done. Perfect map control into a perfectly timed Baron sneak. That puts them in great timing to reset, go towards Dragon, which comes up 50 seconds after they take that. The WE are steamrolling this first game in regards to just control over the entire map and just rolling one objective into the next. NIP, they have like one team fight in them. That's the one problem here. Now, maybe in another game, you could have thrown a Hail Mary and then still come back for another one. You don't have that now. You have one fight left in you, and it's so hard to find that angle towards it. I mean, this is going to be third Dragon's WE spawning up. Baron will come in afterwards as well for WE to push across the map. What do NIP do? That's the question. They know they've got to fight. You can see them grouping up, trying to fight for that vision control. There is a ward behind them. It's only Fofo with TP available. I don't know how much you really want Azir 
on the back line, <laughs> flanking, to be honest, as Drake started by WE. Stun's come through onto Wayward, but he's just tunnels away to the rest of his team. And that's Aki and Shanti both having used their ultimates at this point. NIP, I don't know how you even start Feels a fight. It. He gets it anyway. Who needs a fight? Aki's got smite. Well, that's the start of something for NIP. How do you get into a fight? Well, maybe they can't do that, but they can press their smite keys pretty damn good. The last one was snuck away. This one not quite so easy for Team WE. They still have themselves. Huge Baron power play coming through all the same. They're going to push in mid lane and bot lane. The wave clear from NIP's composition isn't great either. They only have the Jinx, which means Ooh. that WE had a bit of difficulty. But now Stay getting caught out. So Rookie used his ultimate Stay. Both of his summoners being used there as well. Not entirely sure what happened for that situation. Photic doesn't have his own ult available, but with Iwandi in the area, Stay is going to be safe to just push that wave in. Chanchi trying to clear in the bottom side, but... Honestly, very difficult for a Renekton to deal with Azir Siege, and this tower will slowly be whittled down. I kind of expect WE to go for a reset. Looks like they might go for that now, but I like that they're putting this pressure on. Yeah, and you know, they're getting a huge amount of gold in pocket from the Baron power play, plus 3,000 gold up, including the, uh, the gold from the Baron just before that as well. Really does feel like NIP. Ooh, um, yeah, it was a really good catch up from Rookie, actually. I mean, that could have potentially broken the Baron Siege, and you can see that Rookie um, you know, we asked Rookie to be on a pick that can influence the game. You know, we didn't want to see him on the Karma. And we were asking for something that could take over the game. I think that WE have done a really good job of never allowing Rookie individual laning phase. We saw for like the 130 seconds or so that he had it. Really started pushing Fofo back and got some good moments. But besides yeah. that, Rookie has been controlled and now he's alone on top side. Q3 just about gets him out of dodge. Loses half of his HP, but does survive the play. I love the amount of pressure that WE are putting on in this game, because I, I really want to point out the fact that this is a scaling composition. We've got a Zer Zeri. Like, there are many teams across the world that will happily just handshake the entire game with this kind of composition and just look for a fight of 40 minutes. WE, basically since the second they felt they had any advantage, have been pushing their vision line forwards and choking NIP out of the game. This is a really nice game for it is. Now, they need to show that they can close out the game. Um, they did a really good job with the, the, the with the Baron. Of course, they did manage to secure that Dragon, which is a bit of a hiccup. And they need to make sure that they can recover from that. Because um, all it takes is, you know, a couple of shutdowns. Particularly if Zeri dies, 400 gold shutdown, and then the Azir as well. If you get both those carries, NIP with five grub buffs can take a lot of structures across the map. So the job's not done. Uh, everyone can throw up that, uh, that one quote from uh, times past. Job's only half done. Uh, but they do need, they are in a good position to close out this game all the same. I think particularly Wayward is becoming unkillable. Um, you know, he's going towards you know, three items. He has a Titanic Hydra and a Thorn Mail. He even does yep. significant damage. Um, we're getting towards the point where Wayward can actually just hold Rookie in a 1v1. He might not win the 1v1, but he'll hold him for long enough and take him down to, you know, a third HP if the trade goes long enough. But WE feel really, really confident around their individual moments of power. So NIP, they need to take fights probably away from the group now. They need to find, um, a way to go forward. The problem is, if they even take the fight near Iwandi, he has a Mikhail's. And that means that suddenly the first target they're going to get cleansed out of. So NIP, yeah. their options are really shrinking now. One of the tough things as well is NIP, a lot of AD within this composition. Very easy to itemize against. And if you're like Foti, needs to go for the IE to, to have that big team fight damage. It just makes Wayward even more invincible to not have that armor penetration available and ready. WE continuing to push, but like you say, it's kind of difficult without that Baron, but it's coming up in 45 seconds. They have pretty much complete control. There are a couple of blue wards scattered around there, but they're getting close to timing out. By the time the Baron's up, I'm not sure those wards will have lasted. Ah, uh, and NIP don't exactly have the presence right now to, to fully push up into the river. They might be able to get some shallow jungle vision, but that might be just about it. Speaking of that, I think that draw up Rookie and uh, Aki can now finally get some vision out. That's an important moment for them. W not been able to completely hold the chokehold over them. Big problem here now uh, for NIP is that they can't control both sides of the map. And there is every chance that WE can you know, hold fast on one side, take an objective on the other side if they just hold around Baron and they have send yep. someone down to take the Baron. It feels like they don't really have a great answer towards that either because they'll be walking over vision if they try and contest either of those sides of the map. So WE, once again, they have NIP in check. It's not checkmates, but it's check right now. NIP needs to some, find somewhere to slip the net. Oh, Dwo forced to flash waywards on him. The pillar comes down, but they've used their CC a bit too early. It means he can get out with a deep water dive. 
Fotik back out onto the map. We just saw him resetting. He's on 300 CS at 27 and a half minutes. I'm assuming IE was finished there, but I'm looking at milk on the bottom of my screen currently <laughs> instead of those items. I have to assume that was the third item completion. Yeah, I think that's um, third item completion, but you don't have Last Whisper in yet. Once you get to four items, I think Fotik might be able to take over. You see that Wayward. Again, yeah. takes a lot of damage from Rookie, but it's not enough to kill him. He gets out safely with tunnels, and he can teleport back out onto the map. NIP still on their own side of the map. Both objectives Look are spawned. Stay. stay is taking the dragon like we predicted would happen. WE holding NIP in place while they take one of the objectives. They get that one for free. They don't want to contest with this one, if at all possible. And then they'll go right back towards the Baron proper to see if they can finish off this game. And we get to see another one of the big strengths of this is here, right? Being able to just slam that tower just forces NIP back even further like because you can have this kind of strength in the <laughs> wayward <laughs> it's a void battle <laughs> Greg Sai the <laughs> queen of the void up against the Baron itself uh, I'm not sure this is a 1v1 <laughs> that wayward will win uh, but you know back to Bolly oh here comes now gets a double not good for the engage it's too easy for WE they just walk forward slowly and NIP fall to pieces immediately they return to the Baron this is a rinse repeat situation NIP are lucky to not have more deaths in that fight but it is the jungler going down and this time it's not going to be a 1v1 between the Queen of the Zersite and the Baron itself it's going to be the full team issue NIP they got one more clutch what can Ricky do nothing yeah I mean, he's 1v5 in that situation, just trying to make something happen, just trying to do anything. There's nothing he can do. WE immaculate team play this game. Has been. And you know, um, again, just really have to reiterate this. NIP are the favored team here. WE, they showed a great series versus OMG, but we were wondering whether they could consistently reproduce this controlled style of gameplay. In this game, at least, they absolutely can. They've not missed a beat. They've had really good uptime on their vision, and they've had very good organization for the way that they're approaching their engagers. Coaching staff in the back room, <laughs> Warhorse. Very happy alongside the rest of the, the team there in the back. WE, I'd be so happy with them too. They're on yeah. Soul Point, they have Baron, they've scaled up into Infinity, they have a luxury Zonyas now into Fofo, so good luck even finding your Yode combo onto him. Yeah. WE, everything is green lights are go for them. This Warhorse, much happier than the musical, it has to be said. <laughs> He's over the moon with how this one is going, and I don't blame him because you're seven, almost 8,000 gold up against NIP as the underdogs, as the round one team. WE making me cautiously optimistic about what we could see from them in playoffs. It's only game one. Got a whole best of five ahead of them, but it's a great little start. The rookie finds the angle. Stay is caught him. and taken down. Fota getting the reset as he tries to hammer through Wayward's health bar. He dives back into the fight using that ultimate to survive, but he's down. Another reset. The pillar stops Fotik charging forwards, and Fofo is scary. Fotik, you've got to be cautious. Fofo punishes the misposition, and WE stay on top. That is as good as it gets for NIP, and I imagine that's all they're going to get in this game. It's a two for one, all things said and done, but with the Jinx down and no tools left for Rookie, WE walk away with a broken base on the side of NIP. It's uh, a bit of a shaky moment there. You can see that Rookie manages to thread the needle, but all the same. WE walk away with an inhibitor, and we'll be still happy with that one. Going back into the replay, you can see that um, we said, you know, it's hard to catch up Fofo. They have a Mikhail's, they have a Zonya's for him as well. Mikhail's goes down with the Sejuani ultimate, but after that point, you walk up into the big play from Rookie. Fofo still gets caught even with the Zonya's involved with him. It means that he can't immediately peel back off of his AD carry, he immediately dies. Problem is, it's still not a clean reset after this point. Fotik doesn't outrange completely at this point, and Fofo very much reminds him of that as he comes in for a kill. Yeah. Bit of a blunder from Fotik at the end there, to be honest. I think they can maybe defend the inhib if he doesn't die. What a huge moment for Rookie. As this Yone finds his moment, but I don't know if he's going to get another golden opportunity like that realistically. Stay. It's going to be our best behavior from this point on in the game because if he gets caught out like that again, the fans at home are not going to be happy about it. That's three inhibs taken for WE. They are knocking on the door of a 1 0 lead against NIP. This is the ninth seed versus the fifth seed, but WE starting strong and Aki just sends his ult into Narnia. 
does, and uh, Rookie, he can't find his easy an angle. No flash this time. Can't get his easy access onto the back line. NIP really struggling to keep their foot in the door and keep themselves in this game. Huge goal lead for WE. Three inhibitors down as they keep crushing in towards the base. <laughs> the thing is, they don't have Byron. And the supers are a long way away. If you look at the mini map, the supers, the first set of two, just get past the tier one. Ah, uh, Rookie tries to make it happen again. That might be enough. Maybe you don't need supers after all. With Rookie going down, Knockup comes out onto Shanji. Wayward's kind of low, uses that ultimate to survive, flashes back to the rest of his team. Shanji barely walks away with his own life as Foti gets back on the fountain, but with the Nexus Towers down, WE have done it in slow, controlled fashion. They choke out NIP in game one. This was textbook demolition from Team WE. Uh, we have worried about what happens to uh, w, when they don't have Iwandi and Wayward involved early, when they don't get a quiet early game where they're just happy to set up the way that they want to play around Vision. That wasn't a question which we had to have answered in game one. NIP, um, they kind of shook hands in the early game. They tried to play very heavily around mid lane pressure, but then W just responded by bringing everyone else mid lane. It was a 3v3 in mid lane, and that means that the Azir gets to just be babysat up until a really good point of power at that point, and it feels like um, NIP, they didn't have the answers right then. Going into the next draft, I wonder if we need to see Rookie not on something like that Yone again. Needs to be on another mage that can just at least roam across the map and get yeah. out of lane. This Yone couldn't impact the game because W just threw everything into his lane. Yeah, just Yone struggles when it's a 3v3 yeah. <laughs> mid lane instead of getting that 1v1. Fantastic game from WE. Great game plan coming out from them. Let's see if they can repeat it in game number two.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back towards game number two here between NIP and WE. I'm Munch. I'm joined by Nymera as we head towards the second game after a surprising upset from WE. And not just an upset, honestly, absolute domination from start to end from WE. As soon as they got vision control, it felt like this game just crawled ever forwards in WE's favor. Yep. Um, it didn't necessarily come with one explosive play. There were a couple of big moments in there, of course, the Baron sneak, and then there were a couple of picks here and there as well. But on the whole, it was just WE just continuing to push the game forward again and again. And because it was this just complete battle of attrition, the long-range DPS mage in Azir comes out on top. Azir's back, the bird's back in the uh, back in the uh, the coop at this point, and Fofo absolutely made it work very well for them. And NIP on the other side, you just have to ask yourselves, you know, you pick this top side fist fight brawly trio. Uh, and they just couldn't pull the trigger. They got one and kill on Swiwondi, and they couldn't make any fights happen beyond that point. I really don't want to see them play this again if they can't pull the trigger in the way that they need to. Yeah, I... I didn't like the way NIP played this one out, but I did like the way the WE just completely suffocated Rookie in this one, right? He's got this pick that can make things happen, that can win the 1v1. They just never gave him on 1v1. They never gave him an opportunity. And even Wayward, who got caught a couple of times, like got chunked by Rookie, he can just tunnel away because he's playing Rek'Sai. So he can he can get away with so much. Fofo, going to grab the MVP for that one. His Azir just doing absurd. Almost 300% value of the gold oh. he got. In those that is insane. I love that stat, by the way, because it shows how many resources you have and then how much you do with it. You know, that's what it does in base. Uh, I mean, when you're playing a high DPS mage, you expect it to be on a pretty good level, but the fact that he still puts up damage to numbers like that, absolutely insane. Does a really good job of just kind of um, keep wailing on tanks the entire way through it. You know, as the one magic damage dealer, he had real good ability to just be the dominant force in the late game. And when we've talked about crit AD carries taking over the meta and the Jinx being a power pick, you'd think that maybe they'd be the main character. Nope, Fofo rejects this narrative and writes his own <laughs> script. Apparently, Fotek was absolutely second fiddle to the master of the mid lane of Fofo. Colin Peter Griffin, because the bird is the word. No, no Rookie I won't. trying I'm not his doing very that. Stop. Well, it's too late. It's already done. It's already <laughs> done. WE, great start. Yeah. Honestly, I'm just impressed by the like game plan coming in from WE. I feel like this is a very. This is not the kind of game that you can just pull out. This is a game that is drilled. This is a game that came in with like a clear plan of how they were going to play out that early game and how they were going to go from there. Like the vision control, absolutely fantastic. The way they assigned their their support essentially to 2v2 in the mid lane, like fantastic stuff from WE. I can't wait to see what they've got cooked up for game number two as well, because you know NIP are going to pivot. They are going to pivot, and that means that WE, um... I love how you describe that uh, that first game from WE in regards to it was drilled, it was trained. Uh, it reminds me of, um, you know, it comes down to like when you were in a high pressure scenario, the way that things tend to work out is not going, you are not going to perform to your highest ability in the highest uh, professional scenarios most of the time. What instead you do is fall back to your lowest level of training. Now, the fact that WE can come into a series like this and pull out so many good games against OMG and now NIP in the first game too really shows how well that they managed to drill everything they need to about how they organize the game. And that is with a team that has had, all, had roster swaps in their AD carry going back and forth. They had a huge slump towards the end of the split. You know, NIP were another team that slumped too, but you know, both of these teams were ones which we have asked to return back to form. WE could have been a top four team. Instead, they are ninth seed. They can punch above this. And it really feels like they're starting to get on their rhythm again. They are confident, they are calm, they are collected. Game two, we're on the same side. So w once again on that red side, the Ari band, the Nautilus band. It feels like the same band's all over. It does feel that way. There's that Lucian band as well. Callista could be an option. Could be something that something Photix played a couple of times to split. Not not a common pick for him, but did have some winning games. But that Rakan taken away from Iwandi. NIP feeling like that flexibility in the support role was the issue. I don't like this. I don't like this. You've got Iwandi. He's got infinite support picks. He's hovering the Jhana. He's oh going to lock in. God. He's completely happy with that. We I have mean... seen this in the first round plus. The first pick of the Zyre, uh, of the Rakan, might open up a Zyre later on so you can play around Fodes Control playing the Zyre Rakan. That can be fine. But I feel like this is just not playing into the players on the other side of the yeah. rift. Yeah, you can go towards the Jinx. It's a strong carry right now. But I just don't think this is that, that powerful a first pick for NIP. 
Well, the Rumble locked in, you'd assume, for Shanji. Since, uh, you know, Joe's already got his support locked in. Don't really expect Rumble Jungle anymore. It's going to be Renekton locked in for Wayward to answer. I just love that Iwandi just slams the Janet again. Like, Iwandi, for a long time, we always talked about his Janet and kind of, like, wanted him to play it, but we never really got to see it much in the LPL. I feel like he's finally just saying, look, this is a Janet angle, guys. We've got a scaling AD carry. I'm playing Janet. Yay, it's a jangle! It's, uh, no, that's a giant jungle. That's, we won't talk about that one. Either way, the Rek'Sai back for Wayward as well. It feels like, um, you know, I went to go see Dude earlier in the year. I felt like I, f I really enjoyed the way that they had their sandworms be a big part of the, uh, of the narrative. Turns out that LPL has also loved Dune. It is just now the entirety yeah. of the top lane meta. But how did they get off Nymeera? They just never touched the topic. It's an awkward topic. Don't, don't worry it about it. It doesn't work for the don't story, so it. they're just like, let's just not talk about it. Let's don't just worry about it. literally never address it. <laughs> anyway, I'll move on. Um, <laughs> Jungle Pants <laughs> here with the Vi taken off of the board. It's uh, going to be Poppy to answer. So Jungle Bands on both sides. Aki and Hung, we talked mm. about this being a pivotal matchup. Hung very much having control of the early game in the previous, uh, or in the first game of the series. Yeah. Now, you really need some extra CC to level, to layer things up with the Equalizer and then the Jinx ult going over the top for NIP as well. It wouldn't surprise me to see a Maokai locked in for Aki. So in a pick, she played a lot. Again, we, we saw the Sejuani Yone combination on OMG from Shanji, Aki, and Cream as the, as the top side last year. And the other combo they played was the Rumble and then the Maokai as well for huge team fight CC from feels like, um, you know, a whole mile away. It comes from, from off your screen, basically. I'm surprised to see the LeBlanc band away. I really feel like the CC junglers that can help combo up with the rest of the team are more valuable here for NIP. So Talia's made it through. The uh, Azir finally removed from the table and I'm not surprised after Fofo's game one on that pick. But another control mage perfectly available there. Could instead go towards playing with a carry jungle here. Uh, they just the gave Karma. Rookie Talia if he wants it. They could have taken the Talia away. Maybe just given that over to Rookie. We talked about that one. I mean, you specifically mentioned it in the pre show saying, Yep, Rookie, really good at Talia. It's been his pound of pick at the moment with the zero off the table. It wouldn't surprise that one to come in now. But if you want to go towards the Markai all the same, completely happy to do that. You can go towards the Markai as well, which I really think is the prime combination here for NIP's top side. That's the conversation you can see with the Jace hover and then the Talia hover. It's like, do we want the Maokai alongside an AD mid laner or do we want that Talia alongside what looks to be a dive composition here? Aki locks in Nocturne. Wouldn't be surprised to see the Talia here. You could also go for something that leans into that dive style a little bit more, but I don't really know what you're looking for there in terms but, of AP mid laners. But why would you go for full dive into a Janna and a Karma? I, I don't, this is why I look at this Nocturne and I think, yes, you can spell shield the first target, but you're still going to go into Rek'Sai knockup, the Karma shield, the Janna tornado, and the ultimate, and there's a last pick still to come through as well, which could be really good at anti-dive. Yeah, I mean, if Hung does go towards the Shin Sub, that makes perfect sense to me. I mean, you got the Nocturne going in, but you pop the ultimate and the Equalizer into Lear and the Jinx can't do that much uh, to follow up on that as well. I mean, NIP, they could have gone towards the Maokai to just engage them off of screen and deny Janna huge value. I feel like maybe they played into W's hands a little bit here. We've got their last pick to, so again, be an anti-dive champion that can just shut the door. You press the Shin Sao ult here now, and half of the team composition from NIP just doesn't do damage for the next few seconds if they are picking that jungler. Not to mention that Hung presses his ult, everyone's punted away. Iwandi presses his ult, everyone's punted <laughs> away. Like, if you're all trying to jump on in, which, to be fair, a lot of this composition from NIP can do damage from range, right? The, the, the Jinx is following up from range. The Rumble, a lot of it's going to be your ultimate. But yeah, this uh, Nocturne pick could have a bit of a tough time in this draft. And it does feel a little reminiscent, draft-wise, to the OMG series, right? Where WE mm. kind of just started playing for late game AD carry in the Zeri and then a composition around it that just protects it, play at range, play for those late game fights. See if it's going to work against an NIP. I feel like NIP need a solid early game in this one. And what do they have to help them with that there, Joe? They have Rookie on Talia. That's what I got my eyes on. I have worries about the team fight, but I do not have worries about this mid laner on this champion. It was hovered from uh, WE. They could have taken away this Talia. They could have uh, taken it away from Rookie. 
who has been so prominent on this champion, gets out onto the map, is effectively a second jungler. He has higher kill participation than his own jungler. And part of the reason for that is he's playing the Stalir to such a high level. He could be the difference maker, even when I think the team composition from NRP has some issues. We need to be careful that this mid laner is not so easily shut down on this pick in particular. Let's see if WE can repeat what they did in game number one. A slow control composition once more with the Karma in the mid lane for Fofo. But NIP, this time Rookie, is on that Talia. Let's see if he can impact the map. Well, it seems that we have an anticlimactic start oh, it's, this, this, game it's, 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 I love this. By the way, when it comes out of a pause, this is the camera of shame. This is the person who's called the pause more, more often than not. So I'd imagine it's going to be uh, Shanji calling that one out. Shame on you, Shanji. No, absolutely no shame. It's, it's like probably my, the sub. He's, he's there like, guys, uh, my Renekton didn't seem to do any damage in the last game. Can someone, uh, <laughs> look at my, yeah, it must be a problem with the setup, right? I need a new gaming chair. That's the one. Uh, imagine, oh god, that would be so funny. Because um, it, it reminds me a little bit of when, um, of course, when Azir was disabled, it was that bug where he just like randomly just blipped forwards in his EQ combo. It's just like yeah. random moments like that where you're just like, oh no, you just hope that nothing has happened and it's uh, like that. I mean, um, we've actually been pretty lucky with Tech. It. Wait, should I say that? We've been pretty yeah, lucky with Tech. Sh shut up this right split. now. <laughs> shut up right now. There was a couple of pauses yesterday. Um, yeah. You know, it's always the way when it comes to playoffs. Everyone playing in the same arena, a lot of games. Uh, the, the staff over in Beijing oh. will be busy uh, during this week. Do you remember, um, I think it was two years ago now when we had, God, this feel, feels like a long time ago when this happened. It feels like it was quite recently. When um, there was that huge bug when you would take hex gates with hex flash and it would kind of completely break the map to the point where you couldn't even replay the game. It would break Chrono Break as well. That was one of the weirdest times, I feel like, for that one. Um, they also made Poppy a really weird champion for the next couple of chapters after that point because you couldn't take hex flash. And at that point in time, Poppy was such a big champion because of hex flash too. That was... Uh, yeah, but I would say fun times, maybe not. Do you know it's it's kind of funny, isn't it? Because there's a there's a correlation there of like, oh, you know, there's these game breaking bugs that take these meta champions out, and it, it and then can it's like, oh, I spilled my city and all of that. <laughs> it's like part of the reason that it's always big meta champions that fight is because they get played a lot in pro, That's and true. these bugs yeah. get found. Like when there's big Yorick bugs, nobody knows about it in pro. Because nobody plays Yorick. <laughs> like, oh, I feel a, like there probably are a lot of Yorick bugs, to be oh, honest. There's, there's, that one, there's that one person on Reddit who has who had 30 pages of old Mordekaiser bugs. Remember yeah, the had Mordekaiser, the yeah. Was it, was it um, Nerolin? Nerolin, something like that? If I, I could probably just get the name wrong. That was, honestly, the amount of work that that person put into documenting that, that was absolutely insane. I found it so fascinating to a point, so I'm like, wow. So this is how our game works, huh? That was uh, yeah. incredible. Everything is minions, even the, the very river itself. You know that Javan ult? Javan ult was a ring of minions around it. So yeah. I, I did do a bit of game design for a while. I went to I went to university for that um, for a little bit. Um, and it, it's, it's called object-oriented programming, where effectively the rule of thumb is if it works and is stable and you kind of know how it works, keep using it for forever because it's scary inventing something new which just might break in unintended ways. That's why it works. It's actually a very intelligent way to break a, to like build a game. It just it has, you know... When you do it for ten years, it gets yeah. it gets a little well, bit ropey at points. Fifteen years now. Yeah, uh, sure. There's, there's a lot of code there that has built up over the years. Inevitably difficult to fix some of the intrinsic intrinsic problems that you will get. I don't know anything about game design. I'm not going to pretend that I do. <laughs> but I did do a bit of animation at university, so that's oh, pretty cool. cool. Yeah. Um, I did a guy jumping over a fence. So Riot, if you're hiring. Let oh my god, you, you, you animated Talon E incredibly. Basically, I, 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 like, basically. way before <laughs> Talon E existed as well, so not to brag, guys, but... Uh, kind of no one had an event of jumping over fences until you did that animation. I'm I'm so excited to be here, sitting here with the inventor of fence jumping. You're welcome. Alright, back into the game, back into the game. So, we have uh, pause over with. Uh, jungle starting on the opposite side of the map, and there is jungle vision. Obviously, his jungle clears. Blue one on to hung on that red buff, so fighting and draw will know that they are completely fine to do whatever they want um, in there. And dangerously now, Rookie has push in mid lane. 
That is a very big difference from the last game, where Rookie was trying to freeze out mid lane and force Fofo into losing CS. Couldn't really get much value out of that. If he continues to get pushed in mid lane, um, he is very good at getting active early onto the map, and if that can last its way over to level 6 as well. One thing which I love about Rookie's Talir is that um, even when he unlocks his ultimate, he doesn't always throw the ultimate immediately. He'll walk to a play, use Fog of War, find the combo from out of Fog of War, and yeah. then end up kind of um, kind of ulting back to where he wants to be. And I saw some stats on yeah, stats just, Nocturne. <laughs> we we got to talk about that stat that just came up. 27% win rate for Nocturne in the LPL. And we were already saying how it's not necessarily a, an amazing Nocturne draft here. You've got a lot of things that are difficult to dive into. We'll see what Aki... One thing I will say... We talked about Aki, his kind of identity over the last few years being a player that likes to go in and some of the issues NIP have had is like whether or not the team will jump in with him. Uh, Nocturne is definitely a champion that can jump in. We'll see if the rest of the gang is on board. Yeah, I think that with this kind of composition, you need to make sure that you're very, very decisive with your engagers at the right point because you're going to have slim windows of time where Jan is not there or someone's out of position and you can get onto the board. Problem is, um, I want he is already out onto the map. It's always dangerous, and I want he's onto the board here. Oh, he's going straight into rookie. Trouble. Tether's going to come on through, but he gets the flick back, and here's Juo. Suddenly, it's Iwandi that's taken down. Aki with first blood couldn't be better for an IP. NIP keeping up strong first blood presence. Got it in game one, gets it in game two. Chomp is landing in bot side, which might lead to some good damage. Both goes traded for each other. But NIP, strong early start. And this is important because Iwandi is a player that we say pretty much changes the game. When he gets out of lane, the first time he gets out of lane in game two, he immediately hits the floor. It's kind of funny because I was going to talk about the difference between these games being it's actually a 1v1 in the mid lane and immediately I won the and Joel at level 3 <laughs> are in the mid lane but this time so, it goes the way of NIP. So um, basically the difference maker here is that Joel roams up and gets the vision plan to give advance warning on Iwandi. Everyone responds in time and then Rookie doesn't get burst out before Iwandi does on the other side. Aki gets that first blood, which means you're getting towards a first item stride breaker earlier into the game. I do like a little bit of early gold onto Nocturne because um, once he gets that first item, regardless of whether it was Hexplay earlier in the season or stride breaker now, it's a very, very big spike. Nocturne can fall off, particularly in team fights as the game goes on because he never gets tanky enough to really survive the engage. But at one item particularly, he is so obnoxious to play around. Good gold on the board means that WE needs to be even more respectful of the level 6 mark coming in from mid jungle and even Shanji as well if he has ultimate and range to respond to their globals from off screen. Yeah, bit of a weird one there from Iwandi as well, not flashing the play. He went for the heal. I wonder if that was a misclick instead of the flash or something. Bit of an odd one either way. Shanji doing a good job in this top side. Obviously, the rumble. They'd be very happy to just keep pushing in. We've seen some pretty good rumble recently. Oh. We might just see it again as Wayward is being dove, but the knockup comes through. Disaster for Shanji. Goes one for one, but Wayward answers. Shanji with the ghost on the rumble doesn't have something like a flash and an ignite. It means it's a one for a one trade. Wayward comes back and will collect this wave under turret. We talked about this top lane matchup being a uh, pretty spicy one. Shanji, not quite able to cleanly pick up that gold, but still gets it nonetheless. Interesting to me now that he's actually gone for the cooldown boots over something uh, like either the, the Tabi for um, defensive stats or for the sword boots for real early penetration power spike. But still, Shanji um, at least getting some gold on the board. Certainly does. And denied a few minions there, although Wayward was able to TP, so still got his cannon, still got the rest of that wave. So... Not a crazy lead up top. The fact that Wayward is able to get a kill back as well is so valuable for him. It does mean that an MR comes on through. Makes it difficult to rinse and repeat the play for Shanji. A kind of awkward one, honestly, that he ends mm. up going down there. I'm sure he was he was wanting to repeat what ZDZ was bringing to the table <laughs> in the top lane yesterday. And, uh, you know, Rumble has been, I'm pretty sure, one of the very highest presence champions on LPL playoffs so far. We've only seen two step two series, so I don't want to, like, oversell that. But Rumble really feels like he's back. Weber did a great job. Gets the grass proc for a last bit of healing to make sure that there's no extra burn down coming through from uh, the next flame spitter coming through. All the same. Weber uh, playing well on this, this Rex. He has been one of the biggest um, successful players of this champion so yeah. far. It looks like he's going towards the Hollow Radiance. It's harder for him to itemize in this game. He can't quite go towards, you know, the Thought Mail first item into Titanic Hydra, which was so obnoxious in game one. But once he builds up that item, I wonder how tanky he's going to be, actually. Because one of the problems about Rumble nowadays, if you hit two overhe overheated um, 
um, Electro Harpoons in a row. In, in late game, it gets to, once you max it out, it gets towards, you know, 60% shred or, or something like that. It's an incredible amount of shred when it comes through. So I don't think that way we'll be able to do that much. Here comes Rookie. A oh, Rookie's dived into this play. He's going to be rooted up. The equalizer's there, but Hung is the one to go down. Burnt to a crisp. I finish off Foti Keeper wants a piece of the action for the Rookie. A little wide. So, NIP did not need to use Nocturnal, and they don't even need to use any flashes to get towards that too. Reminder, folks, WE chose to give this Talia over. Um, maybe don't do that again. I'm just going to say that straight out. We should not be giving Rookie Talia. He's too talented on the pick. He gets involved in two of the three kills early on. Rookie being involved in the game is typically a very bad sign for teams that NIP are facing. WE, they are not going to have an easier ride into that kind of slow and controlled game style that won them game one. Definitely not. And Wayward now struggling to step up. You saw him helping to get the grubs that's partly to be a helpful top laner it's partly because it's really difficult for wayward to step up in that top lane at this point you can see cs lead building for shanji the fact that shanji can just walk up and threaten hung when the wave crashes as well tells you a lot about where he's at in this lane but hung wants a bit of revenge for what happened with those grubs especially so shanji of course not running the flash doesn't have his ghost up just yet either wayward can't flash knock up and he doesn't quite get in range Shanji tier 2 boots for the extra cooldown, for the extra um, kind of uh, ability to use that scrap shield, gets him out safely. Oh, that's a lot of damage onto Wayward as well. The Wayward does have the sustain in this lane. Shanji, I think, still going to be happy with the way that trade went. And in fact, both top laners get a mm -hmm. go for the reset. I think the Wave pretty much just going to stay mid, but in fact, Wayward going to stick around. In the end, the recall committed by Shanji. Grabs himself a haunting guys as an oblivion orb as well, which against this level of sustain could be really valuable. So, uh, I was actually going to go check on this build again because he's gone for the Conqueror too. It's not going to be the Comet. He's just saying, hey, if I keep hitting Electro Harpoons and I keep walking up, then I can take extended trades and just bluntly win, especially now with early two kills as well. Um, getting towards early items, Shanji will be winning out on the 1v1 harder than I've seen other champions take that to the Rex. I was wondering about. No, what champions could actually beat Rek'Sai straight in a 1v1? I was wondering whether we'd see, you know, stuff like Darius, potentially the Olaf we've seen in, in LEC as well, uh, to an extent doing well um, into the Rek'Sai. I feel like if you're playing this champion out well, and Shanji, if we're talking about Shanji, there are two champions we know him for. There is the Kushanji, which is the Kasanse, and then we have the uh, the Rumble as well, which he kind of brought to prominence in the LPL as a whole. He kind of taught the whole region that this was a champion that should be meta last year. Coming out in this series, very yeah. important if you can bring Wiss. that out as an answer towards that uh, Rex side. Wiss just throwing the uh, the Shivana into the conversation okay, as well. Okay, yeah, from the other <laughs> four, I think, true, I think true. that yeah, needs yeah. to be acknowledged as uh, immediately in the mid lane. Aki diving for a little bit more. Rookie gets the flick back, but they don't have the damage. And unfortunately, two flashes burn for one and no kill gained. I oh, can't quite get that kill there, Fofo. Holds his ground on the cover and the Jigsaw ooh, can't ooh. quite finish the kill. So, this time Fofo. Um, does buy up uh, the big ultimate from Aki. He didn't have his first item just yet, neither did a rookie. I think it's a very different story if you get those um, back in place. Think change, things change a significant amount beyond that point. Rookie still has his ult though, so WE, they still can't completely be um, kind of like um, safe from the globals coming out from the mid jungle. So Rookie will have to see if he can get himself once again involved in the play, close to his own one item now as well, going towards that Archangels into the Seraphs. And I wonder where that ult's going to go. If you can go towards top lane to unlock Shanji, that's very valuable. But any kind of presence towards the Jinx is also much uh, much appreciated. It's going to be needed as well, because when you look at these compositions, if the fights are even later on, it could be quite a difficult game for NIP. But so far, the early game has gone pretty good. Rookie's got the two assists. You see Shanji so far ahead up in that top lane. Bot lane pretty much neutral, which is all you really want for either team, to be honest. You're playing the Zeri versus the Jinx. I say even, though, Stay actually managing to get on towards a second play here as Votic. Tries to move up, but I want these here too. Flame Choppers come down, and he does get one, but the knockup lands. Votic's in trouble. TP it's being rookie. channeled as somebody has to get in amongst this one, but it's Votic who's going to go down. Stay with the kill. Now a knockup comes out from Troll. Can Rookie answer? But I don't think so. Stay. He's going to do more than stay. He's going to dominate in this bottom lane. Now maybe a re-dive as Hung enters the scene as well. Chuo going to have to try and protect his mid lane. Tower points to the minion. Onto the minion. It's not quite underneath the tower though. Stay takes tower shot. Fofo goes under. Hung knocks Rookie out into the mix. But Hung in the meantime sets it all up. It's two and another rocket goes wide. 
Dobbly Wheat, decisive on the bot lane dive, and NIP can't get all of their pieces in the right place at the right time to respond. Rookie's a little late, and now suddenly we're walking away with big gold onto Stay and onto Fofo. First item was hit by Fofo for that play. Stay goes back with two kills in pocket and has a bouncy on his head now as well. Normally in these kind of plays, if Rookie's turning up, you expect Rookie to be the one controlling things, but you can see that he's just a little bit late on the TP. I feel like it should have been happening maybe a couple of seconds before and it would have been the difference maker, but he can't quite get there in time. I wonder what the communication was like about this play, actually, because it feels like if Rookie gets there just a little sooner, you get stay cleanly before they manage to run out away from Turret. But as soon as you've committed that teleport, you know that Shanji can't make his way down, his own teleport's on cooldown. This play is a 4v2, despite the fact that you don't have a full mini wave to come in with. Hung goes in with a double bot back and really gets things off started well. And it's the fact that then Juo, like, all that remains in this kit is his shield, right? Dashes over to get the shield and just, they both get bubbled by Fofo's Mantra Q instead. Iwandi now spotting out that the straight is happening. NIP will take it and I think Iwandi might pay with his life for even looking in the situation, but no. Rookie couldn't quite get the flick back. Iwandi will walk away, but it cost him his flash. This time it is going to be both of the mid lane jungle ultimates taken again, though. These are big cooldowns. Um, you know, you haven't even got yourself, to, you know, your first item for um, Arky to make the most of it. You know, before when before it used to be, oh, you'd have to build your hexplate and then you're just ulting on cooldown. It's not even that case for uh, Nocturne with this current build. So NIP, they need to be uh, hitting these these ultimates home a lot more hard. Now Stay going to find a rookie outside of Fog of War. He's going to jump over, pop the ults. <laughs> That's how you know you're fed on Zeri. When you're looking for 1v1s with the enemy mid lane, and Shanji TP's in, and Aki's here too. And suddenly, it's not a 1v1 anymore. That's what happened to Rookie last game. Now Stay gets a taste of that medicine. Ah, uh, Stay. Uh, you know, I've actually been really happy with how Stay's been playing for a debut split coming from the LDL. Have to mention that, of course. He's coming in in place of Prince, who is, of course, a big signing for WE in the offseason. Felt like um, Stay has been by far the better carry of the two when they've been choosing their AD carries, though. He's still an LDL player in his debut split, though. There are a couple of these moments yeah. where he does kind of doesn't quite get the, uh, the, the right of things. It does mean that there's going to be a big shutdown going to Aki next time he ults. We've talked about that first item um, spike being so big for him. That'll be more powerful. Unless we look towards the current stream that screen, though. It's going to be Herald going down. No real contest available for NIP. So WE, despite the fact that they'll lose their AD carry bot side, will get themselves something as a cross map on top. Oh. Just about. So the Jinx ult doesn't steal. Yeah, at least hit a target this time around. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> just a split second off from getting that steal. As Shanji, like you say, trading on the opposite side of the map. Rookie trying to get some damage down, but this will be the tier 2 taken up here as well. Photic crashing a wave in the mid lane, but I think they will be able to get to that tier 1 in time to catch this one. Or in fact, there isn't. I thought there was a wave behind his icon. There was not. <laughs> uh, quite hard to catch all these things. Okay, so first items now in across the board. I mean, supports notwithstanding because they're supports. Um, still, first items coming through. One, and we've just oh, got the no. south completion. So you stay, getting caught again. No flash, oh. no ghost now either. Oh god, it's just cyberbullying at this point. But Shanji maybe caught out, perhaps a punish? No, WE don't commit to this. Stay. They knew his flash was on cooldown, and they find an angle nicely done by NIP. And that is really, really important because whenever this area is off the board, that's one of your big wave clear machines gone as well. WE, they need to be controlling these waves to get more vision. Remember what we said in first game. Just cast your mind back to how the mini map looked in terms of red wards on the map. Um, that is not the same this time. There's no vision in the enemy jungle. You can't track what's going to happen with the Nocturne and the Talia and even the Rakan as well. Uh, I mean, actually, yeah, shout out to Joao here as well. First pick, Rakan actually getting involved in a lot of these plays too. I questioned it as a first pick. They are making some good value of it. It feels like he's been uh, getting the better over Iwandi in some of these plays, yeah. at least compared to that first game. But thing is, now NIP have got themselves all these plays back to back. You can see that W, they're not playing from the same framework. They don't have the vision control to slowly grind out this game. NIP do have tools to make things happen in this early game. Still 2,000 gold lead as a, a Herald slammed down in the mid lane. Botic, I don't think, can defend this alone. Actually gets hit by the W and Flame Chopper's immediately underneath his own feet. Looks for a zap on to Stay. Stay does have flash available Wayward. at this point. Engage kicks off, but Chuo knocked in. Wayward behind enemy lines and it's Fotik to go down. One HP and actually the Rexxar's on the wrong target. Fotik still alive here, but no, he's on both targets. Wayward with a double equalizer down. Are they going to commit to this one? Aki goes for his ult, but you can't go in on that one and WE win the fight.
They win the fight, they get themselves a mid lane turret, and they get themselves an important strategic objective. Normally we consider the early game objectives to be Dragon, to be Grubs, and then maybe the Herald as well. Honestly, the most important one is the enemy team's mid lane outer turret. Because once you have that now, particularly in a game when you're playing against a Nocturne Talia with big ability to engage out of Fog of War, you can then put Vision down easier into the enemy jungle and stop plays like the big ultimates coming down again. This time though, you can still see that the the Rakan of Draw can't get the big engage, and Wayward gets himself into mid lane off of Vision. Yeah, he probably ults the wrong target first hit. He does end up getting the double either way. I think he'll be happy with that. We'll double kill to the top laner from WE, who's been such a presence for them. Fantastic little flank from Wayward. Sets it up for WE. And most importantly, Foti kind of caught out of position again. We saw him caught by Fofo. In the previous game on that late fight at the inhib set up for that top inhib in game one. And now kind of steps a bit too far forward. Doesn't respect the engage that Hunt can bring to the table. Right, Dragon up in 10 seconds. That would be third for NIP. They do have Teleport and Shandri. He's pushing out top side already. He has Leandris and he has Morello. So if Iwandi wants to start healing people up, it's going to be very hard for him to get full value out of that because the Leandris keeps that Morello ticking. Shandri not at the fight just yet, though. Double are currently in a, in a bit of a salient. They're pushed into enemy lines. They're surrounded. We need to be very careful about that. The yep. ultimates from the NIP back up. Rookie still needs a few seconds before he's got that wall. But Drake going to be down to 2k. They go in. It's smited by WE and full retreat. Looks like they will be able to get away with this one. Joel not going to pull the trigger, but instead NIP move towards this mid lane. Ah, uh, it's a bit of a shame there from NIP that they can't get themselves a big um, advance towards that dragon. It would have been great to get themselves the early soul point. They are still going to get themselves towards mid lane turret. Joel going in. Quickness is going to be used as well. Hung knocked in. Crescent Guard can't save you when everyone's in melee range. Nice little pick off of the back of that play. Yeah, that's important there. It means that they can get themselves that mid lane out of turret. We talked about it and being important for WE. Absolutely important for NIP as well. One of the most important towers you can take in the entire game. Actually, it's just the most important tower you can take in the entire game. And now that means that the next time we're looking for these ultimates to come back up, and since they're now ranked two, and you have some cooldown reduction for a lot of these champions as well, they're going to be uh, more potent and more available. NIP will really look to start breaking up in this game now, in the enemy jungle if at all possible, while WE are not expecting it because it comes out of Fog of War. I just noticed that, you know how uh, in River, Baron yeah. like swims up now before he spawns? Yes. He shows up on the bidibap. <laughs> there oh, was really? a little red dot, like a minion dot, flying up the that. river, and I was like, Wait, there's no Callista in this game. What the hell is that on the mini map? And then he, he vanished as he got to mid lane and then appeared at the top river. I'm like, wait a second. Baron's spawning. Baron shows up on the mini map now. <laughs> I think, um, oh, that, so I have been jump scared by that a couple of times. The other time I was jump scared was back when, um, when he used a sweeper before they changed the color of wards to be like blue instead of red on the sweeper. Sometimes you'd have stuff like the Teemo ward, which looked like an actual Teemo, except it was just a ward. Yeah. That scared the absolute... The heck the little, out of me. The little Orn one as well. The yeah, Orn yeah. one looks like it's a Teemo or something. Yeah, here, we also, okay, here we go. Here we go. Come on through. Knock up. Comes out onto Hung, but which time straight onto the back line. Aki threatening everyone. Equalizer down. But they've separated Hung from the rest of the gang. And Fofo burning Rocket in, but the shield protects him. Hung taken out. They're split. WE up. The shield comes on through, but the last auto monsoon is enough. I wonder. Saves his mid laner. So, Jada all down all the same though, you can't use that to regen up again. You don't have any healing left in the tank apart from that summoner spell. Jungle down, Ooh. what do we have WE got? Rookie finds stay as well, that should be enough to push WE away. But he would trying to threaten for the engage. Fofo is here as well, he reset, but the wall is going to keep a lot of this team away. Baron, the target, no jungler for WE, so it will be taken, but can NIP get away with it? Flash out of the pit as Wayward tries to get in, but he's flicked back now. The knockup comes through and Shanji burns him up. It's NIP with Baron and a bonus. WE push beyond their safe vision lines and NIP pounce. Game one with so much more control from WE. They can't do the same in game two. And NIP have been much more efficient at pulling the trigger. As they come back out now, they're getting towards third items. Shanji particularly starting to really put up some DPS throughout these fights too. Every time this Rumble's doing damage, you've got to be so afraid. This time it's hung caught out and there's no one who can really carry him. Uh, back to his own team in safety. He pops his ult very easily, but he's just not buying enough time. There's no one following up in a, in a, kind of like a strong enough fashion to kind of win out this team fight. He's just too far forward in NIP. They took down that mid lane turret a little earlier. 
They managed to use it to leverage a really big play to get them ahead in this game. With the Baron buff available, you got to imagine that WE are going to be scrambling to defend their side of the map. That fight as well feels like for Fotig, if that's a crit, it's a kill. It's like that. Yeah. There's a classic Corky play from TSM where they get a crit and it wins them the game. I'm not sure it would have won them the game, but this fight is it's a huge pick and the Flame Chompers stop any kind of escape. Fofo caught out and suddenly NIP, they're going from just taking Baron to pushing open the base. That they are, they can siege very well. The Equalizer's back up as well. The Electro Harpoon doing massive work as well. A single tap onto Hung taking down his HP bar as well. WE, they're backing off, they're giving one in here, they're not ready to fight just yet, but if they're not ready to fight right now, when are they? Well, I mean, maybe when Fofo comes back in alive as well. They need that karma back, but it's so hard for WE to defend their base. Wayward well, trying to hold the wave, but I'm not sure you can defend this one, buddy, and he will answer with his own life. Kraken Slayer coming on through to slay the Void Beast. Ultimate comes out from Aki just to threaten Make sure that no engage can come on through. In fact, no, it's not just a threat. He is very willing to pull the trigger. So, Rookie dies on the back end of that as well. So, WE will get the, buy themselves a reprieve. But still, it's going to be a big power, Baron power play for NIP. Almost 4,000 gold. Problem is now that Rookie is going to be dead for the Dragon spawn. Way will be up just in time to maybe influence the backside of that NIP. They need to uh, use the last of this Baron buff to get themselves back onto the map. Losing their mid laner at an important juncture, though, maybe WWE can use this. Would be a second Mountain Drake for them. Only their second Drake of the game, and I mean, it seems like the Baron power play is over. Just 3,000 gold advantage for NIP. Unless there's a fight in the next 20 seconds, which let's not count out. WWE yeah, on the rookie. Drake. Five strong here as the wall comes behind enemy lines. The equalizer set up with it. Stay the target, but is stolen by NIP. Three Drakes now as Aki goes pretty deep for the play. Rookie is alone on the bottom side, and WE start charging towards him, getting good damage out. Is Rookie as he's managing to survive for so long, finally taken down, but answered by Hung on the other side. And now WE on the wrong side of the map, and Fotix rockets follow everyone. As Fofo desperately tries to hide in the brush, but not even hiding can save you now, Fofo. This is NIP taking over. Game one could not look more different from game two. NIP strike back. Wayward falls, and that should be the victory lap for the ninjas in pajamas. We had a lot of hope for them coming into this series. It really does feel like in this game here, they finally managed to find their footing in regards to making those aggressive plays. I can't imagine we're going to see Rookie on Talir again. He helped out the early game too much. Has the late game been? As clean in the early game, no, WE focused him down a little bit more, but this time the rest of NIP stepped up to do the damage which Rookie couldn't do from the death chamber itself. It's not going to be the game it's itself right now, but it feels like this should really be the death knell. I don't see how WE can come back from these kind of team fight losses. A lot of why the reason these team fight losses are so nasty beyond this point is because you can see the combo of the the, the Nocturne, the Talir, and the Rumble make it so hard for WWE to maintain solid battle lines throughout the entirety of it. They've been corralled onto this side, and yes, they do end up killing Rookie, but Rookie buys so much time that the reset comes on the other side, and then you have late game Jinx with a reset. What else do you want? The splash damage from Spade stay goes on to Iwandi, sets him up for another one. And as you said, I can't really stay hidden from Fotic all this time. NIP walk away with a comprehensive team fight victory. Absolutely phenomenal. And we're starting to see, oh, I say we're starting to see, we've seen how this composition can function for NIP because I was nervous that it wasn't going to work out for them, that, you know, they wouldn't be able to follow up on the dives, mm. that the peel would be too strong from WE. But it feels like these fights are just separated. Like Hung keeps on being pulled apart from the rest of his team. He's trying to keep NIP away from diving. But in the meantime, there's enough threat on the back line that you end mm. up trading one for one. And part of that threat is from Shadji's shanji has got a rumble build, folks. He's been cooking. Yeah. Um, don't know exactly what it smells like right now. I haven't quite entered the kitchen myself. Not quite a believer just there, but he's gone for the double mask stacking for the increased kind of damage um, as you kind of stack that up. But he's going for, what, a Rantuan's fourth item beyond this point saying, yeah, I need tankiness to stay and stack my Conqueror. Wow, that sounds I mean, fantastic. I mean, it's working for him. I'm not going to threaten it right damage. now. He's like drain tank <laughs> rumble at this point with a bit of armor coming on through. Supers are about to push onto the final Nexus Tower for WE. They've got to go and defend the base as a wave pushes in mid nip 
Could do with singing up these waves a little bit, to be honest, to try and actually get some pressure down. But with Baron spawning in 10 seconds, I don't think they're too worried about an extended siege. They may just retreat back and go for the neutral. Okay, so that's half the health on the Nexus turret gone NIP. Um, they can't still engage straight down the front and center. They need an extra threat on the side, as you've been kind of saying. The threat on the back side of the fight, or the back line of the fight, has been um, enough to make sure that the disengage from W can't be the, the all and end all. You know, this Jana in the game that we saw against OMG was really powerful in this game. You know, I think it's had some value, but it's not been able to just kind of sit there in the back lane and deny access, kind of like a bouncer into the team fight, checking the ID of NIP, but um, he's been a little bit lax this time. A lot of people in the club yeah. now, and NIP are starting to get boogie with it. Time to show some dance moves here. Look at Jana burning to a crisp. Set on fire. Not even a monsoon can put that one out. Fofo next on the target is Shanji. Just walks through them oh, all. Oh, he's a machine. It's a massacre. And Fotix sweeps it up. Rockets galore. It's time to get excited as we go to game three. Well, looks like WE, they've had enough of dancing. They've exited on stage right. And NIP, it takes two to tango, but they find it only takes one to boogie in this one. Game two, very handily going the side of NIP. Team fights were spectacular in this one. I don't think we should be seeing Rumble for Shanji again. I don't think we should be seeing Talia for Rookie. Fantastic game number two from NIP. Snowballing like crazy, a 28 minute win. A similar game length to game number one. Both teams now with a reasonably comprehensive win on their side. And now the series gets interesting. Now we get to see both teams starting to figure each other out and having to dig a bit deeper. And I love that we've gotten ourselves two very different games in game one and two. It means that now as coaches, as viewers, predicting the next few games as well, it gets much more interesting to see. Well, it's not just going to be one style of gameplay which wins out the entire series. I hope we get ourselves another long series. It feels like these teams, they deserve to show us what they've got. And it feels somewhat evenly matched right now. I'm excited for game number three. Don't go anywhere. It'll be here in a couple of minutes time.
to break their spine and reclaim what once was mine. Those cravens backstabbed me, deceived me. Never shall I tolerate their crimes again. Now let the hunt begin. Oh, seven thousand souls scared and daunted. Such a tale of old. Not too long ago, this village was a golden scene of hope. Call down the reckoning to bring back hope and peace. Restore our glory to live forever. Bring down the dark regime. I know. Eternal power, lead us to order. I am the light bringer. Fellow warriors, I ask you, should my campaign come to an end? There's way more to avenge. Oh, fifty million souls. Living in this realm without much hope, 
Welcome back, everybody, to the LPL and Munch. I'm joined by Nymera as we head towards game number three. We've got a series on our hands. It has to be said every single time. And uh, a lot of the reason for that is Shanji up in the top lane. Tough game number one on the Renekton, but his rumble comes out in game number two, and he decimated those fights. I love the build coming through too. too. Franju is fourth of Rumble, fantastic! You can see the presence he had in team fights. He's getting up in the face of a lot of the carries later on. Popping the slow, stacking up both the, the mask passives from Leandris and that Riftmaker later on. Of course, he didn't start there. It started way earlier and he just continually just was a huge force as he kind of walked into uh, the face of multiple people and just continued to do huge damage. You can see him bullying out a number of members, throwing his ult into the play. I think the NIP in this game, they looked a lot more confident since they had um, the ability to follow up and play so much more easily from a long range. I think in game one, they struggled to pull the trigger. This one was all guns blazing. It certainly was. These equalizers as well doing a good job to split these fights up. Like we talked about how Hung was kind of forced to go in a lot deeper. These equalizers are a big reason as to why the rest of the team couldn't be a part of it. I love this one. Literally just, I want he just burns to death on the equalizer <laughs> the whole time. And you know, I I called out the Rakan first pick as something which I didn't like for NIP. Even in the break, I was wondering whether that was a good idea. And the more I think about it as well, it made the composition so much easier to play. I think that Rakan was great since they had other engage options there too. Plus it also just took it away from my Wandi. Um, Typically, I feel like giving the Iwandi support counter pick is not really great for you. I feel like he has too many champions, but you know, the, the Jana, which we've seen him play you know, a number of times in his career, he picked it out as a pocket pick a couple of times last year as well. And of course, pick came out with a win with it in round one of playoffs here in this playoffs as well. Um, he still looked like he just couldn't contend with what Joel was doing on the Rakan. And he's a player which we had a lot of criticism for before this series too. To, to, so to see him being a big part of this combo in the team fights is very, very important. I say that as he, he dies in this clip. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was a big wayward moment in the game. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately for WE, this was pretty much the only particularly positive play that they managed to get across the course of the game, the rest of it. I mean, this is a good moment of that Rakan where we saw the kind of pick potential that it offered, because obviously there was a lot of all-in from this composition, but I feel like those little picks like that and then snowballing off the back of it was really where we saw NIP shining. Yeah, and Wayward on the Rex side just couldn't survive against the multiple long-range tank-killing threats. I mean, technically, the Rumble counts to that without the Equalizer as well. And if you hit the Electro Harpy, it slows onto the Rex side, really struggle to uh, make them struggle to stick onto their targets. So Wayward on the Rex side, he's been a real force on this and this split so far towards the end of it and into playoffs. But it really feels like now, um, and I'd be have a good answer towards it. I like the Rumble. I don't think the Rumble should be let up if you're going to be um, playing that into uh, into the Rek'Sai, I think that's a good enough answer to, to WE. A couple of their uh, kind of taken for granted picks get pushed a little bit more now. And that's a problem for them, because what we were saying about WE is under ideal conditions, this team looks great. And they have a quieter early game, where they can set up vision control, they can play towards two long range scaling carries in mid and bot lane, whether that's with double AD carry or an Azir or something like that. They've looked good. But when they don't have that setup, it feels like they're just going to sleepwalk their way into these big engages because they don't see them coming. They don't have the vision. Yeah, it feels like it's all about that setup. As you say, it's all about... I, I think a lot of it is honestly about Iwandi, whether or not he can get out onto the map. It didn't feel like this Janna, he had the ability to kind of walk in in the way that he did in the previous game. And, you know, it kind of lends credence to this bard ban that we're seeing from NIP as well. Like, trying to get Iwandi away from proactive picks and onto something that it's a little bit more difficult to influence the game. Do you reckon he's trying to have, like, a really good game on Rakan, a really bad game on the, on, on the Janna, so we can have the good, the bard, and the ugly to finish it off with the bard here in game <laughs> three? Would be fantastic. I'd love that. But of course, his champion pool, it runs deep. He has a lot of different champions in there as well, so... Um, Interested to see if he brings out something else to kind of um, flip the script a little bit from that support. Let's see if they can flip that script. I want to see more from WE. Obviously, game number one was absolutely immaculate. And I would love to see that kind of gameplay again. But NIP snowballing so effectively. And a lot of it through Shanji in the top lane. We are still going to be on the same sides of the map. This time the Rumble banned away, which does mean that Lucian is available. The rest of the band staying the same as they have across this series. 
The other side of this now is that if with the Rumble Band, it means that Wayward maybe he is much more safe on the Rek'Sai. We saw what he could do with that Rek'Sai in, well, both series now, um, so far in Plast from Team WE. So you have to think, the Rakan first pick, valuable last time. Does it allow Wayward to have a very strong lane in top side and allow him to change things though? Ooh. Now we do see that Maokai coming through. So Maokai has been a power pick. I believe it's 4-0 in playoffs so far. Out of the four games it's been played, very high presence, very high ability to just be a safe and reliable go button. Also, is a flex. We've seen it mostly in the jungle, but you can still take it down in that support role for Droll. If he wants to, Iwandi snaps up that Rakan. Now it's available once again. Stay going to go back to the Zeri. Azir open and available. But that Lucian that we talked about, even though it's not really been a big pick for right. folks to draw across this year, still such a powerful ball lane. Okay, so Stay and Iwandi don't really play for lane kill duos uh, like the like a Kalista or the Lucian Nami and stuff like that. Lucian and Nami also kind of suck versus Maokai because when you jump forward with the Lucian, the Maokai ults you back and then suddenly you don't have that dash to go backwards then. Out of it. Now you have the Maokai and the Lucian Nami on the same team, it is so hellish to approach them when you don't have um, like control of the lane that you're around. If Lucian Nami gets a jump on you in mid lane with the Maokai ult coming across as well, you just get gunned down. The first target gets hit by the full culling if they get rooted up as well. I think this means that, you know, Rek'Sai and Kassante become very high value here in the second round of bans for... Um, for NIP, because if Wayward can go on to something like a Kassante and just press W to block out some of that culling for the rest of his team, just body block a bit of that upfront damage, that can maybe help his long range carries, which WE have continually shown that they favor, the Azir and the Zeri, yeah. that could potentially see off this combo, but it is dangerous unless you have a frontline. See what's going to come through. The LeBlanc banned away from Rookie once again. We've seen AD LeBlanc this playoffs. The Tristana already banned by NIP earlier in the draft. So with a Maokai in the jungle, you quite often do see these AD mid laners. Something like a Jace could still be open and available for Rookie, but his Talia taken off the board. Well, I don't think we should see that Talia ever again from Rookie because <laughs> it is too good. We called this out. Right, of all the picks you give to NIP, you give him that Talia in game suit? Nah, I don't think you're gonna um, be doing that one again. No, this is a special team hung in the jungle. Now, it does mean that you can go unstoppable with your passive. And of course, um, that means you can walk through that Maokai route and then still disengage. I don't mind this. This is a WE special. They played it a little earlier into the split. Didn't really see it as much towards the mid and late game. But it is someone that can run at the Maokai, and the Maokai yeah. can't do a great deal to stop him continually running him down. Two wins and a loss with the Mundo jungle across the year Wait, for One Hung. of them was against ZIP. They played it against ZIP in the regular split. I remember this now. They have the experience here in this matchup. Which maybe could be a bad thing, honestly, because maybe NIP have figured out off the back of that game how to play against it. We'll have to wait and see. The Renekton comes through for Shanji. Wasn't that impressed with this pick from him in game number one of the series, but certainly a stable top laner that you're quite happy to take blind. Now we have to see what comes through in this mid lane. I wonder if we see something like the Huey coming through from Rookie. Again, something that can be a really good tank killer given the right kind of uh, uh, no. situation. Don't now, do it, Rookie. Look, Please, He's hovering no. this. Of the players in the oh. LPL which got the Corky pass from me, it was Rookie. We are still in a Zir Corky meta. Look, we had a great patch where we had we had the Nico, we had the Ari, we had playmakers everywhere. And now we have found ourselves back to this mage duo in the mid lane. I have heard some rumblings that maybe Crit Corky is okay now because of the AD itemizations because you can go towards Infinity Edge later on that can be valuable. All the same, Rookie is looking to be Tank Killer Extraordinaire, take down that Rek'Sai and that Mundo. Problem is, if you're playing around Scaling Carry versus Scaling Carry, uh, the enemy team has the Rek'Sai and the Mundo which are tankier than the Renekton and the Maokai in late game and they arguably have better late game damage in the Azir and the Zeri as well. NIP need to use their one and two item spikes very, very effectively, because I feel like they get outscaled. We'll see if they can use those spikes, deny that scaling. I just can't believe we're in our <laughs> third series of LPL playoffs. We got Corky versus Azir. I've been an Azir defender. You know, Azir came back in 85 presence so far in pro play. <laughs> I've been defending it, saying, you know, we get things like the Yone from Rookie in game number one. Things like a Kali can be good options into it. No. But Corky is also a good option into it. And it does mean that we have a bit of a slower one here from NIP. But like you say, the Lucian, very much a power spike that you need to play through. But this is going to be a big team to try and battle your way through with a Mundo and a Rek'Sai. They're going to be invincible. 
Uh, potentially so. Now, there are some bonuses to this. Again, stuff like the Lord Dominus regards. Very, very powerful item right now. 35% armor shred and, and also being able to cut down through high health targets. So both these AD carries looking to get towards that um, as soon as possible. Probably looking at the third item mark from both of these. And you know, stuff like the Infinity Edge and Navori also being buffed up can potentially help both of these champions too. So, feels like this one is going to be very much front to back. Less of that flanking nonsense that we've seen in a lot of these other games. It is just straight up fist fight, kill the front line. Game number three here between NIP and WE. And we essentially start what's become a best of three now between the two teams, both with a very solid win in their previous games. Both of them having a loss that feels like they were a little bit taken apart. WE forced out of their bottom side here. As you can see, Rookie moving in to get a ward on the blue buff as well. Hung moving to that bottom side as he will be by the looks of things starting on his blue. You can see deep vision on the side of WE around that blue buff as well as State takes a heavy chunk to start the laning phase, but Fofo and Hung are moving down. I don't think they'll find anything here at level one. Uh, not at this point. See that Rookie um, also gets to sit here and uh, just get a decent trade level one as well. Gatling going to start. can be hard to get a good trade through the minion wave because once you start auto attacking, you pick up minion aggro, but getting that trade off the wave means that, that Rookie, you know, who has been an exceptional laner, in the early game um, in terms of mid laners. I don't feel like uh, a lot of LPL mid laners are focused on early lane. I feel like Rookie, it's not even necessarily a focus for him. He's focused on everything. He's been a great all-around player, but he's been one of the most successful laning players in the mid lane. You can see exactly how he can eke out advantages like this. And I think when it comes to that mid lane, a lot of focus, especially in metas like this, where we see so much like Karma, Talia, uh, the Azir coming back in, Corky in there, a lot of it is often focused on who can clear the wave the fastest, but when you're talking about players like Rookie, no matter the matchup, there's always a bit of extra strength there. It's a good trade onto I1D coming out from photo control. Uh, but like it, being able to potentially threaten a kill, being able to put direct pressure on the enemy laner often changes these matchups when you're talking about the very best players in the world. And I think um, we've seen this occasionally from W when they were playing with Prince, but even see it a little bit there with Stay as well, where. Um, you know, it, understanding of laning phase is so important. We, you know, we just talked about it just now to a more degree as well. But stay walking away to put a ward away at level one to make sure that there was no le level three funkiness coming down. Opens up a trade for both control to jump forward with a first strike proc coming through as well. That's important. It means that you are playing with less HP when you get towards your level two and your level three. And that can be really important because these advantages from players, particularly like Rookie, and, and obviously both control on the on the Lucian have looked really good with these duos too. Um, of the duos we put them on, I think. The, the Lucian has been one of the more uh, successful ones from NIP. That's why it's been banned away from them so much. And I'm really worried now for WE because if you are giving this Lucian Nami ability to keep Iwandi under turret, what have we said about WE? They are a team which disproportionately relies on Iwandi being out of lane to secure the map for them. That didn't really happen that well in game two because he got shut down when he went towards mid lane and he was killed early on on that Janna. If he is kept under turret, I am again feeling a little bit um, apprehensive about how WE overcome that. I'm going to be able to grab this bot lane scuttle crab as Aki's moved towards that bottom side. Hung leaning towards that mid lane. I don't think he's looking for a gank on rookie here. He's looking to just go straight through that mid lane up towards the top side scuttle crab. So this will be double scuttle here for Hung after his full clear. Looks like Aki will just have to reset, realizes nothing's going to happen down in this bottom side. I think that Aki was uh, just shielding the, the crash in from bot side in the potential um, 3v3 bot side. It could have been something there, but again, it just means that um, uh, Hung Gang slightly far, uh, slightly ahead in this matchup at least, and he'll be going towards, again, very tanky first items. Um, I'm actually interested to see what he goes towards as um, first items, because a lot of the tank items have now changed. Of course, someone like Mundo, he, he kind of just gets a lot of damage just by building a load of HP, which is really nice for him. We'll see what he ends up going towards um, in that regards too. Uh, we'll see what we also see from the first couple of recalls from Photic Control. Photic does manage to get his recall off, so I'd say the more important of the two recalls to be on that timing and be able to get in, get the wave, spend that gold. Fofo taking a hefty chunk, obviously. Rookie has already head back to base for 
a bit of, uh, well, I was going to say a bit of damage. He's bought a tear and <laughs> no magic Ooh, mantle. I wonder he takes a turret shot as Joel managing to hold the wave here. And Fotik not far away from that bottom lane as well. So he's going to miss like three minions there, but getting most of it. It's pretty nice stuff from Joel. It is. It's nice stuff. And, uh, you know, Fotik now back in lane with a Kirchhoff shard. Stay's going to go back and get the same. Uh, it means that now suddenly your, your, um, your laning phase becomes a lot more strong in regards to those quick burst trays, which particularly Lucian tends to be very successful at. Dragon going to be started. It's going to be as Stay comes back towards lane. If there is a fight around this dragon, you'd imagine Stay can come to respond to it. it. Might be a little bit late. Might also be important whether these uh, mid laners come down to the party as well. Fofo ward over the wall it means that he knows that he's not getting jumped on by a flash map. Uh, Shanji actually going to use a Dominus up in the top lane, Wayward. Tunnels out though. It's just impossible to get onto that Rek'Sai, isn't it? Even with the yeah. Dominus, Shanji <laughs> just can't keep on him. Oh, this champion, man, Rek'Sai. Um, yeah, what's there to say about it, really? Um, any kind of sustain in top lane is problematic. To the point where Renekton, who's the other big um, kind of proponent of this, is a uh, trader of all side, actually. And that goes down. Not sure it's going to lead to much of a kill. But yeah, basically sustain in top side. It was removed from Renekton because it was too obnoxious. And then suddenly Wayward comes in and is like, even at level 1, basically sits there and gets to get a free health potion per rage stack pretty much the entire game yeah it's a little absurd currently as we may have a dive at the bottom side Foti getting so much damage uh, down coming down against we's bottom lane as you say hung in the picture now but with we's bot lane so low i'm really not sure even 2v3 they can threaten anything here i'm pretty sure Foti control would just one shot either stay or iwandi exhaust is available for iwandi so NIP do have to be a little cautious not to overstep this one, but just the amount of threat coming down here is so oh. obnoxious, even cancelling the recalls. Ah oh, man, WE, they are not going to have Iwandi that particularly present in this early game, nor are they going to have Stay particularly present either. They are both been absolutely hammered by that Lucian. I know that they ended up, you know, banning out that that Rumble instead of the Lucian here in this game because they wanted to get Wayward into a better laning state. And, and he's doing that, you know, he's doing his job. Um, but the problem is now that... WE need, typically need two things to go well. Wayward to have an impactful champion, particularly earlier into the game, so that means that he gets himself a sane, safe lane matchup where he can kind of just outvalue in topside. He's very good at leveraging them. But you also need to help this bot lane too, because Iwandi has been a real beating heart of this team. Um, it's being stomped on a little bit by the Lucian Nami. It's, Duo is not one that we see let through the ban phase all that often against the players, which really still favor that one. And Fota can draw a good job to kind of uh, just make sure that WE don't get to have that. Big presence for my Wandy. You just see Wayward takes a full trade from Renex. Hang on, Rookie's going in in the mid lane. Fofo gets their Emperor's Divide. And that's just a DPS race between them. But Fofo's win and Hung has moved into the picture. Cleaver flashed away right. from but Rookie too aggressive. Okay, so what Rookie was doing there was trying to W over the soldier placement because obviously it doesn't do much damage if you're not on top of his soldiers. But the problem is he doesn't have the vision to understand that he's going to get um, ganged up on later than that point. Aki's now coming in to uh, protect the rest of this. Rookie's still a little bit afraid, I think, of maybe a, uh, a flash play coming in while he's under turret. It's not enough. Now he's flashing onto Fofo. All big damage coming on through the roots should set Fofo up. The root does land despite the shuffle, and Fofo falls first blood to Aki. Oh, Fofo falls on his face face. <laughs> Rookie and Aki get themselves another first blood for NIP. Three out of three so far in this game, and the gold goes over to Aki. Rookie's still happy to pick up the assist gold, though. Already has himself a hex drinker. The more gold you get on Corky, the more happy you feel. He yeah, certainly do. Wayward starting to do wreck side things now. He's kind of the new Udir of the top lane, isn't he? He's the <laughs> he's the champion that does the Udir to Udir. Yeah, but you've got to be very kind careful. Of just ignore and hit plates. Got to got to be very careful not to say Udir in that one. I think you know April Fools. We just had that one. That one have been a funny skin <laughs> for that one, but we don't we don't we don't say that anymore after that point. So you get again really big level six trade coming through, and sadly the culling is not going to be. That great there, but all the same, 20 CS lead being built up, even up a little bit more with the um, wave coming in, but still CS lead. And Fofo, he just used his ult, burns his flash, Aki, and gets a really good pick off there. And Fofo, after using his soldiers oh, again, that too, so can't unlucky. quite get himself out of that ultimate route. Sapling comes down, Bramble smash, good kill from Aki. He did play it well on the dash, but just the very corner caught there. It's, it's pretty unfortunate for Fofo, to be fair to him. But either way, it's first blood for NIP and a bit of that pressure that had been mounting in the mid lane 
going to be denied here. Rookie going to be fairly even in farm, has that assist as well. And, you know, that level six acquired, so powerful for so many champions. But Corky, absolutely one of them where those rockets are part and parcel of your entire kit. Votic does get knocked up and stay getting a very positive trade. Yes, and that's kind of important. It means that Fofo, uh, not Fofo, it's Fotic, rather. So many foes in this one. So it's like, uh, next thing you know, we're going to be eating noodle soup after this point. Uh, but Fotic, he's going to get a load for himself, a reset. Once he gets the first item, it's really, really strong tip. We've seen the Lucian go towards the Shiv. Uh, for those of you who kind of missed out on that one, it seems like every AD Gary goes to Shiv if they can help it. Fotic can be stopped on that recall. We're going to quite get that clean reset to get that first item where he can really start taking over the game. Yeah, it feels like the the conversation with Shiv, it's, it's less about whether or not it's a good item for your champion, and it's more about, does your champion build crit? If so, build this shit. has a lot of <laughs> stats for not much cold, and it gives you a bit of wave clear too, so why would you not build it? It's just like, it's it, it, you know it's bad when Samira and Jin are building this. It's just it's just not okay if those champions think, yeah, I'll have that one, that'll work out. You know, these champions are not better to build this stuff, folks. All the same. It's really nice for Jin, I will say. I've been playing a lot of Jin recently. Yeah. Just one tap in waves is is very satisfying with the dancing grenade. Uh, <laughs> enough about Jin though. Let's talk about NIP setting up this Drake and I one D. We talked about him being an influence for There's WE. Package, He's though. on a flank right now, but Rookie's found him. Package available. I wonder he could be in trouble, but Rookie going all the way around here. Votic stepping forwards. Wave going to be used to try and deny any follow up. Fofo forced away and stay down in that bottom side. Rookie gets in with the package. And Fofo annihilated. Double bubble from Dwo as Votic looks for more under the tower. Shanji flashes under, but the rest of the team isn't actually here yet. Stay does go down. He's cut to pieces by Shanji. Who needs teammates? Rookie showing on the other side of that fight, too that he has the Corky Pass, returns the package to Sender, and takes down Fofo with it. NIP, great dragon fight. Yes, Wayward gets himself a big advantage in topside, but still, NIP get themselves an important objective to make sure that W aren't just stacking up dragons on the bot side, and they get some good gold onto particularly Corky once more. Corky going to be such a game-changing talent um, in this game. You can see that um, this fight's not clean because Fotic was stopped on that easy recall. Uh, a little earlier, it means that he's starting this fight at full uh, lower HP, but Rookie packages through the Emperor's Divide. Fofo gets completely caught unawares. He goes down without being able to influence the game. You know, Fofo's a fantastic as it, just not able to influence that fight at all. NIP comprehensively shut him down. Oh, in the meantime, Wayward has gone past the mid lane tower. Oh, and is here. Look at the damage coming out from the Lucian. Wayward escapes. These tanks are just not tanky enough yet. Fotic forces them out. Rookie catches the wave. Scary stuff. You can see that the Lucian at the one item and Corky with early gold are starting to threaten them an awful lot. The thing about champions like um, particularly the Mundo, you're a stat stick and you have to stat check. If you can run at them and you can just outvalue them and outspeed them as well, then you run at them and you kill them. If you can't do that, you don't really have a great other amount of uh, gameplay to play through. You can see that, you know, Fotic has the Anathema's chains on him from Hung, so he wants to be just running at the Lucian and landing Qs. But because you now have, you know, so much extra gold on the side of NIP uh, from these last few fights, it's pretty dangerous for them to run straight at him. You can see Fotic putting out a lot of return damage. Really aggressive positioning from Fotic on this Lucian as well. Trying to get as much value as possible. Obviously, you have the sustain from the Nami too, so you kind of can just trade HP with Stay, quite happily take some of the trades that aren't necessarily perfect trades, but as yeah. long as you're not actually going down, you're very happy with the way that that's going and getting value out of the uh, props from your stack ship as well. And Draw also, stepping um, forwards. Okay, I want this fine, I think. So the thing here as well is that you also have this ward on top of the screen. They're so important when you're playing Lucian. It's mirrored on the other side too in mid lane. When you see Lucian, you have to understand that if you have like two wards just over those walls, you feel so much more confident as Lucian because you can take very quick trades. You can position aggressively like this because you have those wards. It means you can go in for big trades and kind of uh, never really have any response on the other side. I mean, the, 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 the Mundo, great if you catch Lucian alone in melee range, but not good if you're trying to respond to him a full screen away. By the time you reach him, he's finished the trade and he's run off. So WE, they're going to be losing mid lane control. You need to be very careful about this now, especially with Fotic with the uh, Ignite and Flash available. If they do get themselves towards this Herald, though. It would be a good objective to take to maybe just contest this mid lane pressure and threaten that mid lane out of turret. So WE will grab that. 
nice little advantage for them. Much needed, honestly, in this game. Thousand go down, but even in Drake's, but now they've been caught in the mid lane. Stay has to flash, but the root still lands onto I wonder. He's forced to flash as well. Quickness out too. Not quite a pick, but two flashes burnt from the side of WE. NIP very willing to pull the trigger in this game. Because they have full vision to do so, I feel like most of this game and most of this series has been about who has gotten control of the information warfare before the big players come through. Game one, WE, they could grind that out because they denied the NIP any vision to make players off of. Game two, felt like it was the opposite. And in game three, again, you've got great item spikes and the vision to leverage these players off of two. While all this is happening, Rookie's pushing in a side lane. They have complete control over the bot side of the map, so their Lucian and their Corky can feel very, very safe when they're going for whatever the plays they want, really. And when we get towards this next Dragon spawn, it feels like uh, particularly Photic and Rookie will be in very good position after farming up these waves and potentially eking out more extra um, CS advantage as well to keep pushing this game forwards. It's feeling good right now for NIP. <laughs> Look at the tunnels. It's like a rabbit <laughs> warren in the top lane here for Wayward, who just will continue trading all lane long. Just goes back under the ground, fully heals up once again. Such a, uh, you know, it's kind of funny, really, isn't it? Because I don't feel like Rek'Sai is one of these champions that's like so broken that it's really oppressive, you know? Like, obviously, it's very difficult to kill. It's very good at nullifying the top lane. It's not like Rek'Sai is taking over these games, so. I just kind of find it entertaining for now. Rookie actually forced a TP here. We'll get away with it. Gets to his tower. Nice threat there from Hung on the dive. Now, he doesn't have the Muramana yet, so he can't really threaten Hung in, in terms of the, um, you know, dispatching the 1v2 even with the tower. Then we'll just press Alt and run at him, especially after Valkyrie had already been used. I think that's intelligent. Understands that he's on uh, briefly the weak side of the map. WE. From this, we just talked about how NIP have been getting control of vision control and then using that to make plays off of. They've just gotten themselves bot side vision, but they don't manage to stop Photic taking a chunk out of Stay's HP. Dragging up in 20 seconds, not having that culling and getting wards in the bot side. Um, it does favor WE now. Teleporting now into the bot side of the map. Fofo coming in with a, a full buy coming through. It does mean that NIP need to be respectful. This dragon could be a point where WE mount a defense. Could be their opportunity. Oh, oh no, TP that's quite through. deep from Wayward. This won't be spotted just yet. As Aki spots that ward, Jwo gonna help him clear it out. But Jwo and Aki are alone here, and Wayward's behind them. Jwo doesn't get caught by the knockup though. Wayward can't find his rookie. Moment. He has package. It will still be Drake taken by WE. And I don't think there's much of an angle for a fight even for NIP. Ah, uh, it's bad timing from NIP. Honestly, the setup for them was really quite poor as soon as Rookie had to teleport away from bot side. They were slow to pick up the package and to stop that dragon going down. So that's going to be unfortunate. They do get mid lane out of turret though, so that will be a fine rec um, recompense for that one. I feel like if you don't get that turret, uh, you feel really just bad about the overall state of affairs. But by getting that mid lane out of turret, because like WE, they're going to be, once again, really lacking tools to deal with the Lucian Nami. However, you need to be using this power spike as NIP. We talked about this from draft. It really feels like, particularly with all of these picks, you need to make the power plays now. Exhaust down onto Photic after he chunks out Fofo. A couple of ultimates use Wayward over the wall, but he's spotted by a ward and will be forced away. Herald comes down. Rookie threatening Wayward on the side lane, but actually Wayward just goes in onto him. Wayward not afraid of this play in the slightest. Herald in. Hung has to back away once again. This duel between Rookie and Wayward on the bottom side of the play is definitely favoring the ranked side. That sustain starting to pay off. And it feels like W want to threaten maybe a dive. I don't know if they could really go for a 5v5 under the tower. But now Cullen comes through from Photic. Big damage onto Iwandi. The Roots coming out as well. But Iwandi will get out with his life. A long extended standoff. It's just a tower. In fact, it didn't even get the tower in the end for WE. But I still think, actually, at the end of this, you're fine with this for WE. Because, again, this is where an IP are meant to be in their point of power. The fact that you can hold them to account, make sure that they don't get to push through that mid lane. You take a chunk out of that mid lane as well. It's, it's, it's still okay for them. They don't fall down in the play. This is not where they're, they're at their strongest point in the game, whereas NIP, they're getting towards the point where they'll be hitting that soon. I think particularly once Rookie starts uh, hitting two, three items, of course, NIP will be able to fire back in the late game. It's not a straight-out scale situation from WE, but still, getting Fofo towards two items, getting Stay towards two items soon as well, I think that's when they can really start to look to threaten NIP if they miss position. WE... Remember, kind of underdogs coming in today. 
NIP coming in as a favorite, but realistically, the organization not got a long history of playoff success. They've only been in playoffs one time under this banner, finishing 7th, 8th. And then before that, uh, kind of a turbulent history <laughs> as yeah. an organization. V5 uh, having some of the best splits of all time and some of the worst splits of all time, managing to, to cover both sides yeah. of that. It feels like Botic and Rookie been along for a lot of that ride. And now as NIP, this I feel like this is their best chance yet as an organization since the rebrand to make a mark in playoffs. I will say you kind of wanted a little bit more against WE. I expected them to come in a bit stronger than what we're seeing. Yeah, I think they've uh, had some had some moments of brilliance, but game one in particular, it felt like they were really just stumped for what W threw at them. You know, um, the old V5 brand had uh, one of my favorite kind of like random anecdotes in league history because for me there was there was a weird thing known as the v team curse where there was v5 and another team called v3 which played in japan and when v5 were the best team in the lpl uh for a short time v3 went on like a record breaking loss streak we'll have to stop that here comes the fight Fotix gonna go down he nearly takes stay with him though almost turns it around in the meantime waywards onto Juo, who flashes to safety and heals himself up one pick in the end but so close to more Turns out that uh, W don't want to hear about the Vikas at all. They want to fight, and they do get a really important kill here because this is once again in the power spike of the Lucian. This is where the Lucian's meant to be taking over the game through the mid lane. The fact that you get a one for none there, it is a good indicator that WE are going to be starting to get themselves a really good point in this game. Wayward using a tunnel, um, it's like the, you know, here's one I made earlier, using that one. So he has another tunnel to get himself even faster into the mid lane. Has another tunnel right here and gets into the play as well. So Dro can't stick around and help his AD carry. WE finding a really good moment to pounce, and now they have their two items. I think before this point, NIP were very much in the point of dominance. Now WE, I think they have the combat stats to really start fighting back. And particularly now, Shanji is in a difficult position too. This is awkward for him. Eing forwards into the wave, just as WE start the play on the bottom side. Fofo in danger though. Rookie nearly finishes that kill off, and actually he has a lot of damage at this point. Malignant's finished off. He would force down, but he can't quite finish a kill. Now to the mid lane we go. His NIP desperately flail around trying to find some kind of answer. And you can see that photo control. They're not really able to get the big kill combos with this Lucian. They've, you know, were shut down the last time of trying. Dragon spawning now. Teleport back out onto the map. No Renekton. and it feels like WE, they have got themselves a great position for this dragon fight. TP up for Shanji when he respawns in 15 seconds time, but Wayward is such a problem on this Rek'Sai. Like he's so hard for NIP to kill. At seven seconds on that respawn as the Drake is just being burnt down here. Stay has so much DPS at this point. As Fotic dives forward, but Fofo just trades onto him. Wave across the Wayward. team, but Wayward's in the middle of everyone, and Fotic goes down. Wayward, the assassin tank on the back line. Shanji trying to do the same, but his champion was made in season one. NIP now desperate to escape. It's two for one and Baron in the eyes of WE. What do you mean his champion was made in season one? Isn't it meant to be the other way around? Isn't it meant to be like the season 10 champion curse or something like that? Well, I guess Rookie doesn't care for this kind of thing. Stay goes down, Photix down, but I think particularly with the Azir and tanks alive, W should shred this Baron still. I'm not sure there's a lot that Rookie can do about this one. He's trying to step up, has a big one in the chamber. Hung is getting fairly low, and that's a bit of damage, but instantly healed back up because he's Dr. Mundo. Rookie is getting some good work done. Maybe some picks off at the back of the play. Baron taken by WE, but everyone just flashing or dashing or tunneling or whatever to get themselves out to safety. And WE wrestle a gold lead. By hook or by crook, Team WE find themselves uh, now leading this game. Um, this is, of course, after Shanji has already gone down, so they don't have him for the setup. And you see that when Fotig is jumping forward, meant to be this uber-powerful mid-game Lucian, he's traded back on by Fofo. He gets some really good damage back on him. Wayward finishes up the kill as Fotig oversteps. I think Fotig has really struggled to use the Lucian power spike. We, we've known him to be a great Lucian player in spring, but this hasn't been one of his best performances. He's kind of overplaying his boundaries now. I think he's getting a little desperate to get damage down before WE come online. Well, the problem is now they are online. WE, they have a a much stronger set of carries unless rookie has something to say about it he's got the package online this could be his big moment will he knock on the door and actually see if they're in or will he just leave it on the doorstep and take a picture doesn't look like he'll do either for now he's still in yeah. the van you can see him on the map on your phone but he doesn't seem to be moving 
Uh, <laughs> well, let's see if they can get themselves a good delivery at this point. Throwing out ults just left, right, and center, and IP. There is no direction to the ults they're throwing out here. I mean, they've got themselves a pick on bot side, but I don't think Wayward is going to die here. He's a tank wreck side. He's just going to start 1v2ing. Yeah, he's almost winning that one, but he stayed too long. He got too confident, but Shanji was baited in, and the wreck side escapes away once again. Shanji still surviving somehow as a pick on to stay. WE forced back now as NIP have a moment to capitalize. That's two fights in a row that stay goes down. And now NIP grab a Drake. Yeah, the Dragon didn't follow the last confrontation. You can see that Shanji really well played around his Rage Bar and the Eclipse for the shielding. It means that he stays up in that fight and stay. Not for the first time, this AD carry has been caught out in important moments in important team fights. Last time we saw this was just in the fight before this when the Baron came through. You can see how much the uh, Eclipse can help in terms of burst, in terms of the extra shielding, but Wayward just so tanky, buying up a lot of time. You, you'd think in a lot of ways, you know, oh, you're buying up so much time in this 1v2, surely you're winning the other side of the fight, but NIP manages the position well. Shanti just about gets through with an empowered Q oh. and an Eclipse shield on top of it. And that's a heck of a threading the needle by Rookie. I didn't see the rocket during all of the action. I was looking at Shanji. But you can never take your eyes off a rookie, can you? Hung, going to be rooted up here. Big damage out from these rockets, even onto a Mundo at this point in the game. And it does feel like, yes, we've had an Azir versus Corky game. And yes, it's been a bit of a slow one. But we're getting to the point in the game now where we're headed towards three items. And that's where these matchups really kick off. Photic already on the three on the Lucian as well. No Baron on the map for now. It's timing out for WE. They've not really got a whole lot done with that buff. Not a huge amount, but they have allowed the game to stall out while NIP have been struggling to make plays. They cancel a oh. teleport. Wait, is Aki going to die for this, though? I don't know. As he tries to go in to deny this play, he ends up going down. Juwon looking for these bubbles, looking to save his jungler. I mean, I'm not... I'm not 100% sure what just happened in this play, honestly. I think he tried to stop a teleport from Fofo going towards a side lane play to try and shut down Shanji, who'd stuck around to take bot side turret. But I mean, you can see just the issue here with Fotek. Yes, he's on three items, but he's going into carries on the other side, which even with the, uh, the Lord Dominic's regards being buffed up for the three item spike of Fotek, are going to out damage him even at this point. Let me get back to a replay of this and see that there was a teleport away, they see him hit, yet they're trying to teleport to get a 2v1 on the sidelane, so Aki says, okay, I'm going to save Shanji on the sidelane, and just doesn't realize he would die for the attempt. Um, the last minute or two from NIP, it's been really quite lost. Uh, they've been throwing Mark ults willy-nilly, they've been throwing Nami ults into, into Narnia, and that one feels like it's just the cherry on top. NIP, they need to settle down. WE feel much more calm, and they feel like they're much more... Um, Heads in the right place for this yeah. game right now. It's a slow late game. Feels like N NW, they're very much at home with this. Aki's going in again. I was going to say, this is WE's comfort zone. This is the kind of game that WE absolutely love to play. Slow as you like. Fofo on his ear. Stay on the Zeri. Like, big old front lines. They've got ways of engaging. This feels very comfortable for them. And Wayward as well has the ability to be creative on this Rex 8 and find opportunities around the map. Like you say, this Lucian getting sort of past its prime at this point. Not that it doesn't scale at all. You know, Fotik's still going to do damage later on if he gets a chance to get on Stay or Fofo, for example. But you don't have the, the advantage because guess what? We're also going to be at the point where Stay can also do damage back. Absolutely. And Navori got an extra 5 AD in its build path. It builds out of a BF sword now um, instead of a pickaxe, which um, can make the build path a little bit more awkward to buy it, as, particularly as you used to sometimes get Navori as a second item, but now with third item um, and the extra 5 AD definitely helps you with that three item spike. The, the price is still the same, all the same, so it's a straight buff to it. Um, so this AD carry very much online. Navori very good at just chewing through tanks. One of the big things about Zeri is that. Now you've got that Hurricane. If you jump forward with your E and you start spamming through those Qs, you'll get so much mobility and extra ability to keep pace with those tanks. Stay over the rocket there, though. Doesn't have sustain in this build. Needs to be careful. Rookie on the other side. Shojin built up through Adam Swag with a Hex Ring Kick. Does a lot of damage alongside Fosik. That's a big rocket. Stay <laughs> feeling the brunt of it. Good lord. Uh, Shanji, in the meantime, Thought he had an all-in onto Wayward. Uses that Dominus. That'll be on cooldown. Now, granted, the cooldown not as long at this point in the game. So, should still be up by the time we have a fight for this Baron. I don't really expect either team to try and force things. I say that. TP Teleport. from Wayward behind enemy lines. Fota could be in trouble. Or maybe just Juo gets the knockup. Juo flashes straight onto it. But it's one for one so far. As Iwandi just gets one shot. 
Man, it's Wayward once again being part of that real initiation of flank threat. The unseen submarine from the side. It's going to be a support for support. I really feel like, though, without the Nami buff, buffing up the Lucian, that's a lot of the power from NIP gone down. Remember that Lucian really needs that Vigilance passive part of that Light Slinger when you're buffed up to really help them uh, get through things. See that hung as well on this uh, Mundo. I haven't really had to talk about the Mundo that much. Build himself up to a War Mogs. Means that any damage you get to try and kill through the front line, if you don't finish him off, he's just going to regen up to full. And then a few seconds beyond that point, WE, even though they lose that support, they hold themselves firm in that mid lane. And they walk forward with even more, again, vision control. That vision control allows for this again. Wait, with Unseen on the flank. And Flash doesn't carry draw to safety. It's a good marker to separate out the team fight. Yaki does a good job there to make sure that there's no follow up onto the other members, but still. The fact that this play could happen out of vision from Wayward is a big problem. To all getting caught out there. The fact that the flash is essentially on to the Rexai as well, not ideal. But gold is basically even in this one. And while, you know, we're talking conversations of scaling, there's always a chance in League of Legends. There's always room for misplay and punishment. Rookie on the wrong side of things here is the kind of kind of corralling and because Wayward IP into the play, Wayward just dives across, but Rookie's there with a package to try and answer. It's way too little, and it's way too late. Stay able to clean things up as Rookie forced out by Hung. Wayward looking to chase as well as Rookie forced out of the play. And in the meantime, Fofo was pushing this whole time. NIP fall apart around the Baron. It feels like when the game slows down, WE just settle into this dominant style of play. In a matchup that we thought that NIP should be coming in, feeling pretty confident about. WE are proving that to be a lot more closer than we potentially thought. WE dominant game three after it slowed down. My goodness, WE are coming out of the woodwork. Not only do they take their first series of playoffs against OMG, now 2-1 up against NIP, the underdogs in the matchup, ninth seed versus fifth, but it does not feel like it on the rift. NIP, I feel like we're revisiting some of the old conversations for them where they get themselves um, that early lead, but they just can't hammer the games home. They got themselves early gold onto the Corky. They had themselves the power spike with Lucian as well, um, at the one, two items. But the fact that they couldn't end up pushing that further, you can see that Fotek in particular, felt like he knew he had to make plays, but when he was jumping forward, he was getting returned back onto, because actually WWE could actually stand and fire by that point. It's a big problem. NIP, they need to find themselves compositions they can more easily pull the trigger with, because once again, they got stalled out. WWE showed that when the game gets slow, they are much more prepared to take that game and actually win it. Yeah, they are comfortable in these slow, drawn-out series. WE, feeling pretty good. We're going to go into a break and find out how this one continues. Can NIP push us to Silver Scrapes for a second time in three series?
Welcome back, everybody, to the LPL and Munch. I'm joined by Namira as we head towards our fourth game of the series. And WE slow and steady wins that race. Fantastic couple of games coming out from them. The slower the game, the better it seems to be for them. And the more Azir Fofo has his hands on, also pretty good news for them. <laughs> for sure. Um, you know, I was I was a little bit worried about the Lucian Nami um, and how that would interact with keeping Iwandi down. But honestly, at NIP, they had themselves a, a good early game. They just couldn't capitalize on it. They couldn't close out that game. That's a bit of worry that we've had about NIP for a lot of spring. And it feels like Fodzik particularly started overstepping his bounds alongside Zhuo multiple times the later the game that uh, it got. And Wayward, in particular, really pounced on them. Um, you know, it was a good, controlled game again from WE. NIP, yep. they struggled to pull the trigger again. I feel like Wayward had some really, really good flanks, but also, like, compositionally, looking back on it, the poke from Fotik and Rookie, 
it's so easy for Wayward and Hug to just absorb that. You've got a Mundo and a Rek'Sai, literally both of them just absorbing everything and healing it back up. And Wayward, after some of those flanks, the pressure he was able to put on and, and force Photic into these awkward positions, well-deserved MVP here on the Rek'Sai. Once again, really high kill participation. He's uh, one of the highest kill participation top laners in the entire league. And he just finds ways to get advantages in lane and then also impact fights. He's been a real stalwart for WE. Feels like when he is impacting the game, good things follow beyond that point. Here, Photog oversteps, he punches well in the team fights. He's playing lane well, he's roaming well, he's team fighting well. This Rek'Sai has been almost unanswerable. The Rumble was good in that game too, but since that's been banned, I really don't think the Renekton is doing it. I need to see a different top lane matchup coming out from the NIP. Either you ban the Rek'Sai, you find another answer, or you're gone here in playoffs. Just feel like something has to happen. I mean, Wayward has <laughs> just played so much Rek'Sai across playoffs already. He played it four, oh no, sorry, three times in their uh, first series against OMG. Now grabbing it multiple times in this series as well. It does feel like just absolute comfort for him. Feels like a champion that he can be very comfortable on. And I want to bring up a little bit of a storyline before we get into yeah. this champion select as well. And that's that Shanji and Wayward, these guys were vying for Rookie of the Year back in 2022 when they came into the league. These guys were the two big names that were making moves in the top lane. Both of them doing crazy stuff up there. And then uh, last year, Wayward managed to do a little, uh, a, a little bit worse, unfortunately, yeah. in the matchup. <laughs> he, he ended up getting benched by Ching Tian. Uh, oh, sorry, he got benched uh, for. What am I trying to say here? Wayward he got benched. benched. Ching, Ching Tian yes. came in <laughs> after how badly he lost in lane to Shanji. Shanji actually said it on Dude P's stream that he literally gave uh, he gave Ching Tian his job back because he managed to get away with bench so hard. So uh, yeah, there's definitely a bit of a rivalry up in this top lane and I feel like today Wayward is winning it pretty handedly. And I just don't want to see this run exit again. You know, I think that the Rumble was a good matchup into that, that, um, that Rek'Sai in terms of at least allowing Shanji to have team fight impact. He is really struggling to close the distance onto. You know, WE have shown that they will play double long range scaling carry. If you need to find a way to range reach that, if that's with Equalizer, that's valuable. If it's with the Renekton, it can't be the same kind of gameplay that we've seen in the two games from it. He's struggled to get onto those carries and have a big team fight impact. So eyes on that top lane particularly for this. It's a first pick. Um, Rakan again coming in from NIP. They won that game two with this. Yeah, I'm feeling like the Rakan is just necessary. Zeri going to be locked in and the Janna going to come on through. Iwandi thinking the Janna was not the problem. It was the Rumble that was the problem in that second game of the series. Now the Rumble is banned. Janna comes through as the answer to Rakan once more. Now, do we see an early pickup of something like the Talia from Rookie? Um, I haven't particularly uh, liked seeing on champions which uh, don't get to have that roaming impact in this series, at least. I think that his team needs him to do that. I think Rookie, on an individual level, has been doing pretty well. It's just what his team needs him to do to stabilize the rest of the map. So it is going to be that Talia, it's going to be that Jinx. What this means, that is you have Rookie being able to peel for long-range reset carry of Photic and also be able to roam onto the map. You were saying, we probably shouldn't see that Talia from what? Rookie again. Still locked in. Why are we zooming in on the tissues, lads? What is going on here? Is there a way we're going to be offering for his top lane pick? I mean, oh, that's just sent me a bit. Fofo gets his Azir again, so very much a late game. Carries on both sides, but a lot of proactivity there for Rookie in the early and mid game too. Okay, so now with, uh, you know, Talia Jinx versus the Zeri Azir, both again, double long range scaling carries on both sides. It does feel like, um, you know, Fofo had a really good answer into the Jinx in terms of just team fighting. Felt like Fotek has been overstepping. You can't afford to overstep into Fofo's Azir. He's been very, very good at punishing on this one. So what are we looking for now? Combos that can work for Aki and Rookie to work together. The Nocturne's one of them. Potentially something like the Vi would also be a good pick as well. I wonder if that'll be banned away by WE. Something that has been banned a couple of times this series already. Nocturne, the Poppy. Could potentially see a Maokai ban as well from the side of NIP. It's something that Hung has looked good on. It's something that's very good currently in the meta. Whether or not you want to play Maokai alongside the Azir is a different question, but certainly good as the uh, kind of just disengaged jungler. We're going to see ourselves a Rek'Sai ban finally. That might be good here, I think. I mean, 
Do you really care about the other jungle pairings compared to the impact that that Rek'Sai's had? I mean, yes, the Talia can answer it in terms of the minefield being put down, but I feel like that'll be a good bam. Yeah, and he's finally call. taken away. So Wayward's going to go away with that one. We could still see Wayward going towards something like a Gragas, which is pretty fine in terms of his playmaking. Because the other pick he showed against uh, OMG, that looked pretty okay too. Let's see where WE are going to go with this one. Feels like... They're very comfortable with what they've got here. They're kind of hands off, or not hands off, but, you know, keeping at arm's length. And that Maokai that we talked about will be locked in for Hung. So again, disengage with this Janna, with this Maokai, and then long range carries. Okay, so now, NIP, you are playing against you stuff that you can't really dive into that easily. What has Aki got left that could really influence this game on a, an aggressive front? You could look towards something like the Sejuani that can throw out ults from a long range. Because again, you don't have to throw your body into the play at that point. There's no trundle this time to uh, shred your resistances down. That'll be locked in. I don't think you need the melee synergy. You just need that ultimate to be an engaged threat from range. Alongside the Rakan, <sighs> that's nice. At least you're not into the Rex side this time, but the Renekton hasn't impressed so far for Shanji. No, it certainly hasn't. Let's see what Shanji can do. Big smile on Wayward's face there. As the Cassante is locked in for the top side. The Sejuani Renekton. Will we see more proactivity this time from NIP? We wanted a bit more of a scrap when they locked this combo in earlier on in the series alongside Rookie's Yone. Bit of a weird game. WE played around it extremely well. We need to see more aggression, honestly, on the top side if you're going to play this Renekton Sejuani combo. But then the inherent issue with that is that even when Renekton Sejuani and Renekton Jax, oh no, rather like the Jax Sejuani was really, really meta, Cassante answered those duos because if you play it right, you get your W. Um, unstoppable and damage reduction through that combo, then the combo falls apart. So Wayward in a position to be a strong frontline again that can influence the game. I feel like this Cassante is a great last pick for him. NIP, they do need to find some early advantages. Get Rookie out onto the map onto the Talia. That has been often been a winning factor for them. They won their Talia game, and I feel like that will be, once again, all eyes on Commander Rookie in that mid lane. Because when it comes to late game 5v5s, you have a better front line for WE. You have the Janna to keep them healed up as well. I feel like if it goes slow and it goes steady, WE will win this series. NIP need to accelerate. Gotta see more from NIP. We gotta see more from this Talia in the mid lane. Rookie, once again on a signature pick, once again can control things. If he's given the setup, if the rest of the team is on the same page, let's see if the Talia is enough to push this series to game five and keep NIP in the series. But WE, they've got everything they could want out of this draft. This is their comfort zone, and they're on the cusp of an upset. I don't know if it's just me, but I yeah. feel like the WE GIOs are getting stronger. And the NIP GIOs, quite the opposite, unfortunately. Perhaps the fans losing faith at this point with how these games have been going. It does feel WE favored right now with, uh, I mean, the fact that they have an extra game in the series. That's always going <laughs> to help feel favored. But uh, it does feel like, honestly, to me, WE have been the better team so far today. We need to see NIP show us something more if they're going to go to five games in this series. And to me, that more they need to show us is just how to get the game going faster. Chain more plays together in a shorter period of time. Not kind of like hesitate before pulling that trigger so much. I think that NIP, they get spooked when they, they know they've lost vision and they're playing around Fog of War. I feel like they just need to be a little bit more bold. And then WE, if they kind of made sure that NIP aren't playing with full information, and if they can keep doing that again, I feel like NIP are in a very, very big spot of bother as we head into this laning phase. Let's see if anything can start off well with Rookie getting pushed. Maybe him influencing the map early. Oh, Hail of Blaze Jada is so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> nice trade, though. Coming back from Juan and Photic, the heal comes out from the queue as well. So still will be NIP with Pryo. Obviously, on the Jinx versus Zeri, you kind of anticipate there's the, the Pryo going the way of the Jinx anyway, but nice little bit of trading to start off from WE. And they will be eventually forced out. Nice cues from Joel. Being able to get both heals this mm. early in the laning phase really does help. Oh, yeah. Every time you, we talk about Rakan, we think, well, why is Rakan so good in laning phase? Uh, because if he hits cues after the last round of buffs he had on that ability, just makes it so hard to 
um, keep HP differentials sticking. Gets those Qs and everyone's all healed up after that point. So early push achieved by Photo Control and bot side. Not surprising when you've got the Jinx versus the Zeri. Zeri doesn't have wave clear until uh, much later into the game. Photo gets it all the way from level one. That means that NIP pushing mid, pushing bot. They have a ward into the enemy jungle on both jungle entrances. So Hung will be spotted whichever way he chooses to leave the spot side jungle, which gives some information to Aki that he was just spotted on his ward on the way in. There was no ping on him, but you would expect that information to be there. Hung looking for the smite. We'll find it. Good combo with the Q. Aki gets a little bit of a trade and actually moving into the jungle, maybe looking at the wolves here. Rookie in a position where he could potentially follow up as I think there's yep. a big wave about to crash in the mid lane. And I think in bot side as well, Jaw had a chance to, to roam up from bot lane too. Again, it's very hard to force a fight with Jana um, in terms of hard engage. You're not playing a Nautilus, which can hook in the AD carry in that 2v1. So as you can see, Jaw is moving up into bot ready. You can see that Stay and I want it up been forced to back off, trying to defend this Grom take. Oh, Smite comes out from Aki as well. So Wolves and Grump stolen oh, away. Dashes across. And obviously we saw Hung had to use his Smite on that blue buff before. So that now means that not only those two camps taken as a bit of an engage on the bottom side. Flame Tromp is there onto Iwandi as well. Stay forced out. But importantly, off of the back of those two camps, also the Skull Crab at the bottom side. Yeah, we'll see what can happen to us top side. Oh. Is the shot back into turret? Turret aggro dropped though, so we're not able to get the full kill onto Shanji, but three pushing lanes means that Aki potentially gets a double scuttle and a double camp steal into the enemy jungle. This is insane jungle diff in the early lane, uh, early laning phase, really, because, you know, all three pushing lanes allow Aki to get so far ahead of the game. This Maokai is not going to be very happy in terms of XP and gold. Not the way that they're wanting it to go. Still, all in all, positive signs here for NIP. And I'm going to be honest, I'm glad because I'm, I'm a little bit nervous for them in this series now. I'm starting to lose a bit of faith. Um, when I'm saying, like, we need to see a bit more, it's not just, like, in terms of... I, I, I like Rookie, you know? I like yeah. Photic. I <laughs> want these tell. guys... Tell. <laughs> I want these guys to, to do well. I want to see these guys succeed, but it just doesn't feel like it's happening. Dive in the middle lane from Dwal. Just takes one turret shot for his trouble, but Fofo forced back. And again, the supports. I swear they've spent more time in the mid lane this series than they have in bot. Oh, man. That's been one of the big things that's kind of changed in the LPL in general. Sometime midway through the split, we saw um, a lot of big changes, particularly in the champions that were played in terms of Nautilus making his way back into the meta, uh, much more than just the occasional pick. Uh, because it was a lot of range supports before that, but then we've seen a lot of mid lane roams come with that too. With them being so active on the map, it means that they're going to be going towards this bot side dragon as well. Would be a 2v3. Hung's not going towards that. Hung needs to take camps. He can't really be contesting that much. If he can get himself some grubs, at least that's an XP back as Aki takes dragon on bot side. So Aki will grab that objective. Vision is there for both teams on the grubs, so Hung starts that one up, but NIP will have information of that fact. Shanji's been able to get. Cryo up top, so maybe there's some angle of a contest, but you'd expect at least a couple of grubs to go over to WE before anything can come through. Well, the first one's gone over, and the first one gives the double XP. That's the important thing. He gets two with the smite. He has himself... Maybe my flash um, thrown here, actually. Rookie's trying to cut him off. What's going to happen here? Well, flashes actually goes on to Rookie, but Aki flashes into the plate as well. Hung, knocked up. There's the stun to follow it up. Can they actually finish the drop? Red buff, take it away! And Rookie finishes off first blood. Bad it's a worse for the tree man in the jungle. Hung goes down, and it has been a comprehensive shutdown from all three lanes of the ninjas in pajamas. They're uh, sticking the knives in nice and early this time. It's another first blood. Four for four in terms of first blood from NIP. Been very successful in that amount. They've got themselves some good leads in the jungle. Now uh, an extra kill into mid lane as well. Will definitely not go amiss. So good start in the early game from NIP. That hasn't been where the questions in this series have been though from NIP. But this is a good start. Need to see them go more than this, though. What are they going to do to make sure this Maokai never becomes a factor? Aki, already a full level up over Hung in the jungle matchup. Been really benefiting from the pressure that's been put out from the team. First blood yeah. going over onto the jungle. Adds insult I, to injury. I do wonder if Fofo could have saved Hung there. Like, had Empress Divide available? I don't know if he just didn't want to, you know, get too much in the mix and potentially risk losing his own life as well. Either way... Kind of just, <laughs> kind of just watching his jungler die, honestly, which is. They expect uh, one of us in the wreckage, brother. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this it's pretty odd brand for Fofo, honestly, across his career. Uh, very much a, a player that's playing for his lane as opposed to uh, the rest of the map. I mean, 
In fairness to him, he's done a good job with it when he's had actually good laning lead. So, you know, while it is funny, and as a juggler, you're sat there going, damn, wish my mid laner moved for that one. He has been putting some dividends out of that too, so I'm not going to uh, judge him too harshly for that one. Top side matchup, um, Renekton for Shanji. At least got that early push and got some value out of it. Um, need to really see what happens around this top side matchup from Wayward. He has been a very strong frontline force team on the Rex side. He might get him 2v1 here. The Renekton Sejuani, very powerful combo. Dominus pop. Here we go, W, not gonna buff for any of the CC, never mind, buff for it, he's one shot! Oh my word, Wayward gets absolutely slaughtered in the top side, butchered up by the Butcher of the Sands. We're acting in that top side, so Shanji, talks about uh, him and Wayward vying in years past to be rookie of the split, back on their debut splits, and in this one, trying to get the better of each other, it's mainly gone the way of Wayward, but the Renekton and Sejuani definitely adding some extra value in, common oh. mid lane, I wonder he gets burst, wow! He died in the previous uh, Janna versus Talia game. This time, Rocket flying across the map. But there's no one there. Okay, the Observer's kind of baited me there. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> I want you to back up well into his own jungle to make sure that he could get out safely. He has himself the boost of swiftness to get himself more quickly back onto the map as well. But, um, you know, this Janna, not the first time that we've seen him kind of not really find good value into mid lane 3v3 plays. Uh, the last time, of course, it was the Rakan as well. Um, you know, this Janna hasn't really managed to survive, well, get early lane presence against the Rakan. I know that Rakan can get punished by the Janna if you jump into a tornado, it can be very difficult. But then also not being able to out skirmish as well. It feels like Iwandi has not really had the best of this particular champion matchup in this series today. Yeah, it doesn't feel that way, does it? Especially considering how quickly and confidently he slams it in the draft. <laughs> I will say, I, I kind of want to talk about the top laners a little bit here. Uh, in terms of matchups as well, because it does feel like Wayward, while he's had a, a very good day today on that Rex site, it has been specifically when it's in the right matchup, right? That we saw the Rumble game earlier from Shanji, and that looked absolutely fantastic. Grabbed himself an MVP, like really took over the game. Now on this Renekton, feels like having a much better game when he's not up against that Rex site. So I'm, I'm hoping we get a little bit more out of Shanji than what we have been seeing outside of that Rumble game. And maybe this is the Renekton game. We've seen him using Aki, having that Sejuani up to pressure in the top side. Maybe this is the chance now to show that NIP can still dominate that top side. I, I love the optimism. I just have played, I, I have played Renekton into Jana before and I have wanted to cease playing the game. Sometimes you just sat there and the disengage is too much. So Shanji, it's a lot on him to make sure that the cooldowns are down from, you know, Emperor's Divide, the All Out from where we're trying to shut you out of the fight, Maokai ult, and then the hop over the wall from Zeri, and the Q in the R from Janna. So I'm sat there just thinking, well, I mean, it's nice to have that lead into 1v1. Um, team fights are a different question, so we shall see. You know what? I'm going to err on the side of just being kind here. We'll see. Um, not an easy one, though. No. But then, it's not meant to be easy in LPL playoffs. That's sort of uh, why these guys are here is because... They're good at the not easy stuff, you would hope, <laughs> at very least. Uh, Chuo could threaten to dive here on to stay, honestly. Aki's in the area, but in fact, Drake is up on the map. So NIP going to be focused on that neutral objective. They got the first one of the game as well. You can see Hung not even close to the area. He wants more of those grubs. He does. Um, now, the thing is, early in the split when Azir, before the, 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 the good days of Azir being disabled uh, came through, um, <laughs> Azir being put into a side lane with Grubs was really powerful because you get towards Nash's Tooth first item a lot of the time, um, and then you just get to hit a side lane turret with the Grub buff. Azir is already massively good at killing those side lane turrets. You get a lot of gold for it, which against the ghost popped up here. Now you're going to get you know multiple Grubs taken from WE. Need to see Fofo get the ability to hit some turrets. Feels like he's the one person who's going to get good value killing side lanes in this game. Rookie roam down off the back of Fofo resetting to try and look for an angle in this bottom lane. Stay will just commit to the recall here. Fotical crash the wave. Don't really anticipate him sticking around here, yeah. to be honest. He's going to have to go for a reset as uh, well. But we're seeing first items coming on through now. Seeing first items coming through. And I was just wondering what was it. So I was just looking at the minimap. So Fofo is going to tag on towards bot side. And we just talked about five items. Na five, uh, five items would be very, very scary to start that point again. <laughs> five uh, items five in 11 minutes. Of, God, incredible. Man. Never seen this before. It's actually just five glowing motes. The most powerful power spike. I think, wow, so much build here. <laughs> um, you have Nash's Tooth, five grubs. And now because NIP... Um, they, they kind of like, you know, they left this reset to kind of get that plate down there uh, after they got that plate down there. I wonder how much time Fofa's going to get on the tower. Sadly for him, NIP managed to stick around bot side just a little well enough, but NIP needs to be very careful not to allow Fofa onto a turret. If he gets that, honestly, like two plates are just disappearing immediately. So 
But now the bot lane's shifting into mid lane. It felt like W were trying to buy a way for Fofo to hit turret. Can't quite get that though, sadly, for themselves. EC State will be able to get Pryo mid for a second hit. Now, usually, stack shiv on both sides. You still expect Jinx to be getting Pryo. But uh, Votic had stepped away to grab himself a little red buff there. And we'll be able to maintain presence. It's like, oh, you can have a red buff. Here you know, you've been a good AD carry this game. Get yourself a red buff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, rookie forced to flash here. And Fofo's going to follow it as well. Iwandi's here. He's trying to set up the kill for his mid laner. Fofo needs to take Oh, the save! He arrives and saves the day. Rocket in from downtown. Fotic cleaning things up as Fofo will fall. And what looks beautiful for WE falls apart in seconds. Oh, Aki, the hero from the jungle, comes in to save the... A real carry of this team for so much of this split rookie. Aki coming in in a crucial clutch moment. If WE had gotten that kill, they could have gotten a, a you know, a zit onto that bot side turret for free. Not to be the case. Fofo goes down. This is a big moment. That should have been such a big breaking point for WE. As it stands, NIP, they stave off that assault. They get to go put Rookie back into top lane now. I'm going to go back into a replay to see how it happens. You see that Iwandi on the roam. Doesn't quite hit himself the, the Q, but the slows is enough to at least force Rookie into a difficult position. He can't quite get behind Rookie to shunt him oh. back with the ult. Back into live though. Shanji in a 1v3. Uh, I was going to say a dive, but they're just between towers here. Shanji can't even get the sustain off. Just take it down. Nice bit of map play from WE. Catching out the enemy solo laner as Rookie tries to trade in the top side. But Fofo's on the t Oh no, the plates fell off. Fofo doesn't oh. get any of the plate gold. Oh, that's a shame. They're still going to get themselves first turret down there because again, it's the Azir on the turret, but still... That's kind of lazy from NIP. You can't split the map that well, especially since you don't have the Dominus on Shanji to be safer in that dot in that um, in that bot side, kind of weak side of the map. At least Rookie is going to get himself turret on this top side as recompense kills an entire wave to that one. But just while we were saying, hey, you know, it would have been a fantastic moment in that last play for WE to get onto that bot lane out of turret for free with the Nash's two five Grub is it? They do get it eventually. <laughs> Foti wants absolutely everything, and he gets it as well. Chicken nuggets on top of a fillet and uh, he's not going to be hungry anymore he's already finished his cult as well this is a big old jinx that started to build up off the back of that kill in the bottom side already shiv there 30 cs lead on the 80 carry then ip yeah and i think particularly if you get towards you know three four items you're going to get towards um i mean we'll see something like the fire cannon potentially or, 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 or um, something like that coming the in. Hurricane, yeah. The hurricane or something like that. You know, you're going to see a little bit more attack speed. I think once you get towards Infinity Edge and Lord Dom, so towards um, four items, you're going to be in a really powerful spot. I do think that, you know, with this build, I, I almost wonder if you should have gone towards a bit more of the, um, like the core AD damage build just before that. I feel like uh, going towards like a second attack speed item in this game when your job is cutting through frontline, maybe that one's not going to help quite as much. See, I want to... <laughs> trying to trade against Fodic there. He's feeling it as uh, the Janna. I like it. I like the <laughs> the, one, the Janna 1v1s. If there's anyone that knows this champion's limitations, it is I1D. He's played so much of this champion over the years. Before he was even a pro, he was a Janna one-trick streamer. So this guy, he knows the ropes. At this point, very happy to go for these trades. Mm. Let's see what the build is going to be. Obviously, the nice thing for Jinx is uh, these attack speed items obviously getting quite a lot of it, like we already talked about. Shiv having quite a lot of stats on it. But you do get a reasonable amount of AD on your attack speed items these days yeah, compared true. to how the items used to be back in the day. Yeah, particularly since I, I think the next one's going to be the Kraken Slayer as the item coming through as well, thinking about it again, um, in terms of just what I've been seeing from Jinx builds recently. Do you get the Herald um, into that turret? And if you do start popping off with the lethal tempo, and then the extra attack speed as well. It's very, very hard to stop this champion from killing your squishies. You're just killing that first target, which is going to be the problem. Dragon has spawned WE. They have themselves ults. They have themselves a pick, though, onto their own players. Nice combo, Hung taken down. NIP making it look easy as Hung just kind of walks into all five of them. Flicked back by Rookie and uh, set up beautifully. That's going to be three tricks in NIP. <laughs> if you showed me this game in isolation, I wouldn't have even believed they were down in the series. It's going to be the flip back once again onto Wayward as well. Now he doesn't have a W, he doesn't have the extra damage reduction. He's going to go down here. Is he actually can, he's dashed to his teammates. The rocket onto Fofo doesn't betray his team, stays away <laughs> from the AoE. Gosh, one of the big differences here. I was thinking that, you know, oh, Fofo would have loved to see an early Lord Dom's regards to kill through the front line. Um, 
That's completely forgetting about the early game from Hug. He is so far down in this jungle matchup. He's a level down. Um, he's been really cut out of this game. And this Maokai, who's gone for a Kinnick Rook and first, is not going to be um, a tanky frontline. He's level 9 here. He's two levels down on the AD carry. Foti just walks up alongside the flick back from Rookie. This Maokai is not a tank due to the early pressure put out from NIP. The first clear has shut this Maokai out of the game. And that's a huge problem for WE now. They need to play front to back. They don't have backline engaged. Not really, unless Wayward gets a really insane angle. He needs to be there in the front line. He needs to be there pressing W in front of the big skill shots. And that's going to be a big problem, because that's going to unlock Fotix to just run forward and get resets. Are we just seeing a Rek'Sai diff <laughs> in this series? <laughs> Is that what we are witnessing here today? I will say, fantastic uh, game so far from NIP. You know, having advantageous lanes is definitely helping them out. The fact that they had such a strong early game off the back of these winning lanes. But the question remains, as it always does with NIP, can they close it out? They've got themselves a big lead, over 3,000. They've got themselves three Drakes. They've just got to dot the I's and cross the T's. Doesn't help when you're missing cannons like there, Mr. Fotik. That's the second one. <laughs> Mid lane losing that Looks get Delphial observers. They don't miss this stuff. Wayward oh. missing his ult now. Wayward going real deep on this one into four people. Rocket comes out. Second fight in a row where he just about gets away with his life. But that's kind of Cassante's speciality. That is. He's got a teleport to go back, regen, and come back into the play. But it doesn't stop the fact that NIP are walking forwards, throwing down vision in the enemy jungle, and just throwing more rocks under this tower as well. Mid lane out of turret slowly broken down nip taking a very important structure and whereas in the previous game where it felt like they did actually have an early game lead and they couldn't push that advantage they are actually finding some important moments here because it feels like particularly hung and wayward are not strong enough to back up the rest of their team in terms of like surviving long enough for the follow-up to actually be realistic on the other side of things they're going to be waiting a long time before fofo and stay feel safe enough behind their front line to really team fight effectively. Yes, there are two items on Fofo, but it's so hard to team fight as um, a backline when your front line is losing. Front line diff is a very real thing at the top level of play. It certainly is. Especially when you've got these carries that snowball fights so effectively as well. Like both Jinx and Zeri essentially stack up off of the front line. You know, Zeri stacking the ultimate, Jinx getting the excited passive, and also, I guess, power power to some extent. But the point being, Whoever kills that front line first, then just pops off for the rest of the fight. That's a dangerous situation to be in as the team who got front line diffed, as you worded it. Baron up on the map now, and NIP looking to shift their vision control up there. Already some deep vision from them. Hung desperately trying to fight against that. And your recall in from Rookie, presumably that's going to be a Leandris completed as his second item. We do currently see, though, the fact that we uh, have a couple of members on the board for just a moment. Means that they can push in mid lane. For that, they can start throwing down the cheat wards of the Maokai Saplings, one of the most broken champions of the game in pro, because he can just throw Saplings down and effectively bypass that ward cap. Means that uh, it's much easier to keep yourself some extra presence in that top side. Fofo, he's trying to do as much work as he can, but NIP, I feel like as they're soon as start they get the opportunity, they're going to bait this at the very least. They have the Sejuani ult to throw over the wall, and let's be honest, who gets the face check from WE? It is just Wayward, who's currently on the bot side of the map with Teleport. Very easy to blow the Teleport, a bare minimum from NIP. Then they probably just go back to straight to the Baron afterwards. That should be the bread and butter play for them. Certainly should. Mid prio acquired. Fotik starts to move on over as Shanji clears the wave. So. Pryo in all three lanes here for the side of NIP. TP's available for both top laners. TP's available for both mid laners as well. But a reset comes through from Joel. He's picked up a Mikhail's now. Oh, that's all. Big coming down. pick up as Wayward forced to ult. That's a really awkward moment now because Wayward doesn't have the ability to disrupt the backline without his ultimate. He's already, you know, trying to do double duty in frontline because Hang is not really a frontline right now. I am. Um... A little surprised that NIP didn't go for the Baron Bait at that point, because now if they were to go towards something after they set up the vision, it would overlap with the Dragon, which is Matt and Soul for them. I figure if they'd managed to buy a Teleport from Wayward, they could back off of the Baron and then play around the Matt and Soul, which is coming up in 30 seconds. So maybe a missed opportunity there, and does kind of mirror some of our opinions about how NIP have not necessarily closed out games through objectives, as well as potentially would like in the late game. Wayward now has to face check, though, and this would definitely help NIP. No ultimate available this time for Wayward, and Dominus is there for Shanji. He might just go down. Quickness going to be used by Juo. Sets up for the finish from Shanji. 
And Shanji yes. absolutely winning the top matchup. This time, Hung's caught out in the meantime. Elsewhere on the map, an NIP. Two picks right as Dragon Soul spawns. That is perfect. We may be eyeing down some silver scrapes here, Nymera. And IP wants to take us the distance. They want to make sure they have a last hurrah at this one. Fofo, stay, Iwandi, sticking around to see if there is anything left to say. But it is a 3v5. What can they realistically do? Oh, look at this flank. Oh, okay. Rookie doesn't quite find the knockback. And Fofo trades back onto him. But there's no smite here for WE. So it will be Drake taken. Mountain Soul. And now Draw can dive into the action. Staying Fofo forced away. But Shanshi is behind enemy lines. And he's diving onto the backline. Fofo pushes him under the tower. But it just doesn't matter. It's a stats diff at this point. On top of a numbers diff. It's on top of an NIP diff. The ninjas bury the blade in Team WE, and they are determined to take us to a game five. It will be the second one, two days back to back out of three series only just played in LPL playoffs. I mean, let's be honest, folks, everywhere from about sixth down to 10th in LPL playoffs in terms of seeding was oh so close coming down to the final week of play. It means that these teams really are finally matched between them. We were talking about how NIP had full control over the map, particularly over Baron. This one felt like, you know, because the soul was just spawning, Wayward has to do something, but he's too far from his team. I think it's a bit of a greedy face check, knowing there's no follow-up behind him. He's just hoping for the best, and the best does absolutely not come for him. On the other side, Hung, the other front lineup, showing how far behind in the game he is. NIP, they're walking back onto the map, eyeing up Dragon now, uh, Baron now, rather, in live picture. WE feeling the pressure here. The fact that you're staying around 3v4 without a jungler kind of shows the amount of pressure that they were feeling to try and contest this. Uh, but in oh, the meantime, dead again. Oh, it's been caught out and another ult lands. It's onto Bofo. Force away the rocket. Hits onto both carries too. Hung gives over the reset as the rocket flies on by. Nearly kills the wolf <laughs> as they've come out of their pit to join in the play. NIP absolutely destroying them. They're not... They're still in their pajamas. <laughs> Haven't even needed to get into their business wear for this one. They get themselves, roll out of bed, and slam in a five-game series, all the more likely against Team WE. It's another fight. Again, it's not going to be the end of the game here and now, but with such a huge gold lead, with Mountain Soul, with Vision Control on top side, and with three members dead from WE, it's going to be barren. It's going to be resets. It's going to be the end of the game. Surely after that point, is WE scrambling to mount a last-ditch defense. Looking for the opportunity, but realistically, there's nothing else to be done here. NIP, outside of a monumental throw, this one is in the bag. And it feels like Rookie's Talia is a very key part of that equation, but also Shanxi having a good matchup in that top lane. This game felt like a bit of a lane difference and a much better draft than what we've been seeing. Yeah, it really does feel like NIP have been uh, turning the screws a lot more effectively than they did in the last game, but they had a lead, but they couldn't see it out. Once again, you're just using the fact that the front line from WE just can't face check. They can't face check. Wayward can't, Hung can't. No one else is, is even remotely tanky enough. And that means that even though you have two late game scaling carries, they have no platform to do damage off of. NIP really just tearing this game apart. Oh, and they've even found a little bonus onto Fofo with the bottom side. He zips back in to try and do something to Fotek, but it just is not happening. Yeah. And my goodness. I will say, this series, while it's close in terms of the series overall, the individual games have been very one-sided today. It, it takes a little while. And uh, do you reckon if Fofo gets hit by another ult from Sejuani, he becomes Froyo instead? Bit of a bit of a chilled treat? Um, I guess. I, I'm lactose intolerant, so I'm not, not a big fan <laughs> of the frozen yogurt-based humor. Uh, it makes my... Wow, thanks. I tried that. I tried really hard there. Fofo can't really try much harder in this game. He doesn't really have the items, and he doesn't exactly have a life right now. Yeah. Feels like uh, a bit more of a Frodo, because it feels like he's playing with nine fingers at this point. <laughs> uh, that's a bit unfair, because I don't think Fofo's had that bad of a series. In the meantime, Fotik is just cleaning house here. I want to be taken down using the Jinx Excite to uh, finish things off, to snowball these fights. In the meantime, Shanji pushing up top. And I mean, <laughs> look, when NIP are winning the games, they are clean with it, you have to admit. They are. Um, I feel like both these teams, it's uh, therefore really based on how the early game and the draft goes. A lot of the time, if the, if the NIP um, early game goes well with the composition that they're happy with, pretty good at closing it out. Uh, it 
which is something that we've had some um, concerns about coming through about this team. It's okay, they get themselves some leads. Can they close it out? Feels like with the drafts becoming a little bit more comfortable and removing some matchups away from Iwandi and Wayward, they've managed to find their way under W skin. That's not going to be another frozen treat for NIP as the ult goes wide from Aki, but they still have themselves a push oh. into these turrets. Held and out. Oh, okay, that's an engage. Photic took a good chunk of damage there, but there's not really enough to finish the job, and he still survives. Aki keeps them away as Iwandi falls, and it is just a bit like. If the gold is less than 15,000 in favor of NIP, maybe that's a fight win for WE. But alas, <laughs> that is not the case, and Photic survives. Yeah, buried under the weight of NIP's bank accounts in this one. And you're just keeping up the siege. Fofo, you got to be careful there. Oh Another boy. crit comes through, and Photic will kill you. you got to be very careful. Has himself flash. And Sadly, doesn't have himself any team members to look for a shuffle play. It's going to be another inhib down uh, in the mid lane. They can go straight towards topside after this as well, but actually probably shouldn't think about it. There's uh, Elder up in 30 seconds. If they get themselves a reset, Double E, um, yes, you could say that, oh, yeah, but there's always the chance of an Elder Steal. Look, if you're getting in range to get an Elder Steal, you have to go through a significant amount of damage, and you're probably dying just after that anyway. So Double E really, really preying on a, on a miracle. Multiple items, third items now completed across the board from NIP. Still only two and a half for state. Basically a full item behind on the Jinx now. Or versus the Jinx, I should say. WE here, though, they're going to start this Elder off. This is the miracle that they need, Ooh, but that ow. ain't Iwandi caught again as he goes down, and it's the Drake to finish the job. One last blast as NIP charge on forwards in the series. The wall comes out as Rookie actually stunned out of it. Wayward keeps the mid laner out of the fight, but I don't think it's going to matter as Fotic is untouched elsewhere. Redemption comes on through to keep NIP going, but Wayward has actually found one kill, and Stay is stacking up. Surely this isn't how it ends. NIP forced away. They do survive, but Elder now started by WE. It's not the first time we've seen Atalia interrupted, and now Rookie won't be here for the fight. Going down to a flip for Elder. Oh god, it's too tense. Hung is there. Aki jumps into the pit, and he gets it. No! NIP denied. Aki can't find it. And WE get Elder. While this is happening, there are two waves of super minions taking down the Nexus turrets of WE, but Jana Shields and the turret just about helped that one. You can see that there's a, a recall stop by a Jinx Rocket, but that is it. Wayward heroics around the bot side of that fight to stop Rookie being the difference maker. He chooses this angle as he always does. He tries to cut off the play, but if you get in his head and you manage to predict where this wall is going to come in, yeah, you can just knock him off of it. This um, Kasanze has struggled to be a frontline in the 5v5, but in a 1v1 versus a carry with no defensive stats late into the game, doesn't matter that you can't stand up to the Jinx and the Talia. If you can make it about just one of them, you can make things happen. Wayward seriously saving the game here and giving a last gasp here for WE. And so crucial after what has to be his worst game of the series. He's been caught out a few times, but makes the hero play happen. Aki tries to get in here, but just pinned against the wall. Hung, great smite out from him. Aki was in contestion there to get the smite, but unfortunately can't find it. Wayward doing a good job to be that bruiser. My goodness, it's tense, and now, what, they've got a minute left on Elder. It's not really going to be enough for WE to find a lead or anything like that, but it's kept him in the game, and that's what matters. Well, I mean, the gold lead was about 15,000, now it's <laughs> yeah. about 10,000. You're still against the Mountain Soul, but we're getting towards the point where gold is meaning less. It's not quite the point where it means nothing, because we've still got items to be completed on NIP, so we haven't capped out on builds, but all the same, WE... Um, it's a big moment for them. Teleport away from the side lane from Rookie. He wanted to push that one out. Baron going to be taken by WE. This is going to get one shot, but you don't want to play against the Elder anyway. Realistically, NIP, I don't think they want to be fighting for this. They want to stop recalls at best. Another objective bounty claimed by WE. Resets can come on through here. I don't think Aki can do much about it. Maybe they could just kill Aki, honestly. Kind of separate from the team, but Iwandi will finish his recall. NIP get nothing. Baron taken off of the board, as was Elder. And actually, WE have bought themselves a lot of time here denying that Baron. Stay has been scaling up this whole time. And now you're getting to the point where, you know, you've got a Renekton who is not going to be a frontline, especially against the um, carries of Fofo and Stay. If he doesn't end up getting onto a carry very quickly, we talked about how hellish it is as a Renekton playing into this team composition without the good angles later into the game against Jhana or against the Emperor's Divide. Shanji's job is going to get harder. 
wayward. He's getting towards three, four items. Going to get easier for him. NIP, they're waiting to us, uh, see if they can yeah. get themselves um, an inhib against the Baron buff. WE, they can potentially look for a flank now with wayward on the side. It's a game of finishing the job. Oh, knockup does land onto Aki. That's a good bit of damage as wayward threatening on the backside of the play. Aki still alive here as redemption comes in. Wayward buffering CC, getting the knockbacks. Juo next on the target. It's two kills for stay. NIP struggling to end games all split long. And now, as they're pushed to the brink, Stay takes down Fotic and WE make another miracle. NIP have taken down three inhibs in this game, maybe even more than that, but they can't take down the damn Nexus. NIP, we've always criticized them for not finishing off the games when it felt like it's in their hands. WE, they still have objective bounties to take, but it doesn't matter. They're winning the fights. They stop that. Wait, I mean, Wavers just died on the other side, though. They need to be careful. He's just going to end the game. They have to reset because Wei would just go 1v1 by Shanji. Uh, I mean, this is just awkward at this point, but my god, WE hanging on by their fingernails, but hanging on nonetheless. Hanging on just about, Shanji. Heroics there in his own right. We've used that word a couple of times because it feels so, so appropriate. Managing to separate the front line from the back line out, WE managed to really show how much their carries can do. Most of this game has been a difference in front line. With the Jana Q hitting in late game onto Sidwani to separate them away from their front line, WE finally find a gap in the armor in a team fight in a straight 5v5. See that, you know, Renekton's not a part of this play realistically. And WE, <laughs> see how happy the fans look. They know that the game is on now. This game is no longer 15,000 gold no. in the advantage of NIP. This is a fair it's fight. Look, it's 3,000 gold difference at this point. Elder coming up in a minute and a half. Now, that Mountain Soul still counts for a lot. The front line is still very difficult to get if Aki isn't caught out by a tornado and whatnot. But Hung exists at this point. He's no longer that tree that was massively behind in the jungle. He's at the same level as Aki at this point. He's on three items. This is a tank on the side of WE. They've got a late game as here. They've got a late game Zeri. This is not over. And that kind of... That kind of given win that we were believing in 10 minutes ago, it's basically gone. This very much could be the last game of the series if WE can keep this performance alive that's been happening for the last few minutes. And for a team like the Ninjas in Pajamas, which promised a lot with this roster, this would be, well, it would be something of a cap to this split. That would not be what they want. This roster, we expected great things. I mean, I guess WE on the other side, we thought that they could be promising too, particularly after mid-split. Fofo showing on the side lane, though. We've got Hung here too. Is there a turret to be put up? There's no Zonius here for Fofo. He gets up with the shuffle. Slides himself to safety, dodges the knockup. Shanji flashes in Emperor's Divide to keep him alive as long as possible. But the rocket flies on through, and Fofo is found. WE to punish, though, as both solo laners have sacrificed themselves to find the Azir. Shanji cannot survive and stay, doesn't go down. A knuckle comes through, but there's no damage because he was Fotic? in the GA. In the meantime, Fotic only just arriving. Shanji still going strong as Wayward's on the backside. Fotic getting some resets here, but stay is still alive. It's 3v3 now. Now, absolute carnage in the top side, but NIP might just come out on top because Fotik's getting his resets. That's two, make it three. Fotik finds four, and NIP push to five. NIP are made to fight for it, but they fight with bare knuckles. The ninjas can't find a clean assassination, but they will with bloodied lips find themselves towards a final game in this series. I don't think the death timers will do it. Five seconds left on Fofo. They still need to get through a turret. Maybe he can pull off something, but I just don't think it'll be enough. Short of a miracle, this one is done. Get excited for Fotik means he's got the damage to take the fountain, to take the Nexus, and to push us to silver scrapes. NIP, they hang on and they push us further from a 15,000 gold advantage to having to win in a fair fight. It's not the game end that they would have wanted. And there is uh, maybe some knocks to the confidence there as well from the ninjas, but still, they walk away with a win. A win is a win. We find yeah. ourselves split down the knife's edge for game 
five. It's a second silver scrape in two days. It's uh, it's something, that's for sure. NIP, that should have been an easy win. It was a win in the end, but my God. The sh WE, fair play, absolute heroics coming out from this squad to keep them in there. But it means we go to five games. We're going to jump into a break and we'll be back in a few for the climax of this series. You do not want to miss this.
Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to Game 5. If you couldn't tell by the silver scrapes, if you could still hear me after that silver scrape. Hello, I am Nymera. <laughs> I am joined by Cranial Carl. <laughs> That's me. My massive forehead dictates it. Uh, we're going to Game 5. NIP just about Clora with there from the jaws of defeat. And they had a 15,000 golden. I cannot wait to see that gold advantage. It doesn't look like it's going, oh, it's all blue, right? That's 15,000 gold in 28 minutes. And it goes somehow down, almost like, you know, even, to be honest, for that point of the game later on. It, it was ended off by focusing on the Jinx. This Jinx has been a real game-changing pick in the LPL coming through into playoffs. And, um, felt like with Wayward not being able to beat that Rek'Sai drain tank with the ability to hop in and out of a fight, WB really struggled to have the same backline threat that they've had in previous games. To me, we said this multiple times through the game, it felt like a frontline diff at multiple points in the game. Fofo also on the Azir having a uncustomary struggle, honestly, on the pick. It was uh, a tough game for him, getting caught out to start off that final play as well. But Fotic gonna grab the MVP, and rightly so, doing so much work on this Jinx. His positioning was very good. I think both AD carries, we've had little criticisms of their positioning across the course of this series. This game, it feels like he really buckled it down. He did, particularly in the very last fight of that game. That was a real savior moment. I think that on the whole, when it came to late game, NIP weren't great at setting up fights for their AD carry to be the late game one. It felt like he was there and kind of ended up doing that towards the very, very end of the game. But still, I feel like most of these fights are actually just about who could really end up being um, uh, giving their AD carry the best platform to work with. Stay had some great late game fights. This was the one which ended things up. Uh, Fotic ended up being late to this play because of some real fracas on the sideline as both uh, solo laners of NIP were briefly collapsed on after finding a pick of their own. But still, Shinx cleans up the late game. It's full health coming into the last, uh, last part of that fight. And that is enough to finally bring them across the finish line. Well, not quite the finish line. The game four finish line. The series is still only partly done. One last game to decide it. What a way to go as well. I mean, WE, they can't be in too low spirits off of that loss after nearly coming back in that game, after how far behind they were, they're nearly coming back, nearly managing to get what would have been a massive comeback win at the end of the series. I imagine they're still in reasonably high spirits. I feel like on average, WE have been the better team today because they, even though they, we're they, even in the series, we've got three games that were not far off with WE wins. They've been the better team. Um, in terms of better individuals, that has gone back and forth between different games. But in terms of the way that they've set up the map, a lot of their fundamentals, their objective setup, their vision control, that's largely been better. I think that NIP, they've been better at exploiting winning lanes on the whole. I think particularly in mid lane when um, Rookie's been um, on the Talia. I mean, obviously that pick, I, I cannot believe he's had two games of it in the series. That is beyond me in a lot of ways. And particularly when, you know, Shandu is on the Rumble. If they have a winning lane, particularly for the solo lanes, it feels like NIP have really ran away with those kind of leads. But in any kind of even game state where it comes down to more actually how you play around the macro, how you play around your combinations, I feel like WE on the whole have been better pound for pound. Now going to a game five, it's, um, it's very dependent on this draft to me. I wonder if one of these power picks is going to be boldly let through to see what these teams think they can counter and what they can deal with. See what they're going to go for, how this, I, I honestly, I would not want to be one of these coaches coming into this game five of the draft, I feel like. There are so many questions. There's so many things that I feel need to be banned as well. I think that's the biggest thing is there yeah. just aren't enough bans at this point in the series where you already, have, like we've essentially had the first six bans throughout the series. Um, and I'm assuming by the way, maybe we'll swap sides now. We've had NIP on the blue side this entire series. It may well be that W want to swap sides at this point and go for the blue side themselves. Oh, it'd be so bold to do that. I mean, a last game side selection to just kind of throw a Hail Mary and say, let's just hope that this one uh, blue side plan, when we've had mainly red side ones, uh, could work out for us. I mean, I think blue side could work out well for WE if you managed to let through a first pick, um, a first pick, uh, particularly of something like the Tristana. I think that's a power pick, but I think that the problem is 
once you predict the bands that are coming through, which have largely stayed static in the first two, maybe the last one has changed um, between the Rumble and Revolution for sure. Um, what do you think is going to be left up for a first pick? It, changing that on the fly mid series is is so such an intricate balancing of factors. It's why we have series meta. It's why things evolve through the games. And the more games there are, the more information you have. One last draft. You have all the information you're going to have. The coaches have one last chance to influence this series. And once again, the bands are looking very similar. No Nautilus ban through just yet, though. That might be something which will be concerning. They have swapped sides. WE on the blue side. Talia and away. Denying Rookie that option. The Tristan has gone. Do you ban the Nautilus here, NIP? Can you afford to let Iwandi have that Nautilus? And if the Nautilus is banned, do we see something like the Rakan make it through once again? Uh, because, I mean, Stay and Iwandi have really just been sticking to their guns with the Zeri. I think the Zeri has been a bit good kind of crutch pick for Stay to have a solid laning phase. Not win it, but solid. And then go towards uh, later game team fights. Faris, lane dominant, good pack into good pick for Photic and Guo in their own right. Stay and Iwandi, are they going to stick towards that Zeri again? They are not. Faris locked in for the first time for Stay in this series. So Faris as our first pick here. Things changing up compared to the rest of the series. The Nautilus open and available, and you would fully expect that to be locked in for Zhuo. The question is, what do they want to go alongside it? Because yeah. a lot of priority mid laners still there, but you could just try and lock in your bot lane matchup. You could try and go for a jungler. I feel like there's many different directions we could go. And with NIP on the red side, it changes up. I mean, there is the chance of going to something like a Senna Nautilus. And Photic has been one of the better Senna's in the LPL across his tenure here as well. Thing is, I really don't like Senna into the Varus, so I might dissuade it because Varus tends to be really good at cutting through the bruises you're with. If you go for the Senna, you're likely to have an on-hit Varus coming through from state because you kill tanks easier and the Nautilus is tankier with the Senna. Maybe it locks them into that. Iwandi almost certainly going back towards the Rakan. He's been so good on this pick. It's been first pick worthy through this series. They could go for a bit more lane dominance, but this one to me makes a lot of sense to last stay and Iwandi. The creativity, but also the ability to get the leg over in bot lane, which they haven't really had in this series so far. Certainly not been the case. Weak side for NIP there. And I wonder if something like a top lane lock-in here could be something good for WE, but I suppose NIP still have the opportunity to count pick. Could just go for your jungler instead. But no, they do just want that right side. Looks like the blind pick gonna come right. on through. Wayward gets back on comfort. Okay, that is going to be that rack site, and that's important because if you're playing around the center Nautilus, you are going to be, you know, throwing out hard CC. You need to disrupt the back line somehow in the middle of that combo. Rack site, hard to kill as that first target into the fray because as soon as they're, uh, they're buried, they can get a lot of HP back. I don't know if I like this Renekton and again. It really feels like Shanti has struggled in this particular top lane matchup. Great game four. One out against the Sikasante. Did not win against the Rex side the two times we've seen it on an individual level. And Wayward with a laning lead is dangerous now for NIP. Chanji looking kind of nervous on camera there as well. I think he equally is not a huge fan of this as the chosen matchup, but it's going to be what's locked in. We'll have to see if he can change what's been happening across the course of this series. But with the, the center in your composition, you do expect NIP to try and play towards that top side a little bit more. We'll see what the jungle is going to be for the side of Aki. Whether that Sejuani comes through again, that has been their favorite pick alongside this Renekton. Uh, Sejuani is okay, and it does mean that you have very high bruise at front line. But the problem is you lock in too many tanks into a Varus, and it just feels like the Varus chews you up in terms of on hit. Yeah. You need threat onto an on hit Varus. You need something to stop him from firing. And having stuff like the Sejuani and the Renekton, yes, you can kill the front line. What happens when Varus starts firing back at you? I would almost even wonder if you go towards, maybe you could look towards a Jax for Aki, pick up some more damage there. You need some higher damage threats with backline access for Aki and Rookie. The Maokai removed, Poppy and Maokai, these jungle pads have been so consistent. Uh, either banned or picked, but removing the disengage is the most important thing. And I think that leans into what you're saying. Trying to go for a bit of dive here. The Nocturne from WE indicates that they know the situation as well. And the Vi going to be taken off of the board too. So a lot of jungle pans coming on through. You need that would access. be interesting. Now, I was thinking Wukong or Jarvan potentially for Aki as well. They could get on towards that back line. That could potentially help. You need something that can reach that Varus and stop that Varus being just the mainstay of that team fight. 
If you lock in some of that release in, you've already dealt away with the Tlir and the Poppy. It means that there is less ability to play through that. I really don't want to see multiple tank lock in from an AP. It feels like WE, with this now being locked in with Sejuani, despite the fact that Sejuani Renekton is a strong combo, WE can lock in another tank killer from the mid lane. Maybe lock in something like the Huey that's been missing from this series. And you can just hold that front line at bay. I'm really curious what Rookie's going to go for. Rookie having counter pick in this series does feel like uh, somebody out there is writing <laughs> this series. Rookie gets the counter pick for the final game. Let's see. The Trundle comes on through. Hung looked fantastic on the Trundle against that Sejuani before in the early game. Whether or not it can happen again is a different question. Did get caught out by the Talia on that pick, if I remember correctly. But that way that you talked about will be locked in. So very much a, a tank shredding squad here for WE. It's, oh my god, hands together. Yeah. Maybe in a bit of a silent prayer to go further in this one. This <laughs> It's tense on our side, folks. Imagine how tense it is on stage. Rookie, last pick, though. He's got a swell on his face. He's been in more tense series um, situations than this. Offering over that call, you do need damage from the mid lane. You need something that I didn't love the fact that Rookie couldn't influence the game in the same way in terms of roaming. But still, it would be the damage that they need. And a couple of picks being hovered over. Last pick for Rookie. What'll it be, Master of the mid lane? What are you going to put in here? And it is Aurelian <laughs> Sol for Rookie in the mid lane. I like this a lot more now because you have a lot of people that can shield the Aurelian Sol as he flies into the fray. You can hide behind the Sejuani, the Renekton, the Nautilus, have a Senhol and the Skies Descend on the same target. If NIP choose their angle well when they layer their ultimates, nothing is stopping NIP from slaughtering Fofo and Stay on the immobile backliners. We've been seeing the ASOL around the world as a scaling option. Another scaling dragon in the game. Rookie brings it out. Game five, the first red side game of the series for NIP, and Rookie gets counter pick. He locks in ASOL, and we'll see if it's going to be enough. You can see Fofo on the other side, eyes closed, hands together, praying to someone up there for strength in this series. He goes for the way, the tank shredder up against this tanky squad. Feels like scaling up both sides. We could be in for a long one, but I think we're gonna be in for a good one, no matter what. Oh, I really hope so. It's a silent prayer from people in the crowd as well. I absolutely do not blame them. If you are fans of these teams, I fear for your heart rate. But this shall be entertaining nonetheless. For all your friends, this one is definitely one to watch. You've got Rookie on the Aurelian Soul scaling up. I think on the other side, stay a huge amount of emphasis on the Rookie for Team WE to be the carry on this on this Varus as well. Chewing through those tanks will have to be their game plan. With Fofo on the way, it can definitely help Varus. Way they need to put out a lot of damage. It's absolute chaos in the crowd. Absolute chaos. Oh, Rookie's been found at level one here. Knock up flashed away from Flash already, though, from the NIP mid laner. Ah, uh, that's not going to be particularly nice because the thing is, Asol is pretty hard to um, to get on top of when he has his W, but once you have the pillar for someone like Hung as well, it can be really threatening. Rookie maybe forced out of the early levels into a pause very, very quickly. And if it wasn't tense enough, we have ourselves a brief break to. See what's happening is it's a W pause. A, you know, when you come out of pause, whoever the camera goes to first, is, I like to call it just the camera pan of shame. Someone on WE, do something quick, hopefully quickly fixed on stage. Fingers crossed we'll uh, get back into things shortly. You can hear the silver scrapes in the background <laughs> telling you we're in game five here. And the ASOL locked in for Rookie. I'm excited for how this one's going to go down. But I'm looking at the early game as well, because we've got scaling on both sides, but it does feel like the early game is going to dictate a lot in this one. Trundle versus Sejuani, both picks that have the ability to influence the game early on and kind of take over the rift a little bit. But also this top lane matchup that Wayward really has had the best of across the course of the series. Siaki, uh, pondering, pondering what he should do there, deep in thought. Um, I do think that you're looking now at a flashless ASOL who typically doesn't have wave control in the first level anyway. So we used to see the E start from Aurelian Sol to push waves a little quicker and to stack up your killing minions in the E. Um, big changes to Aurelian Sol have been largely you don't max your E second anymore. You max it last because you so much value out of maxing your W, which is your flight, and you're flying over because it buffs up your breath. And the breath in itself is where you're getting most of your stacks. Now hitting champions is how you stack up as ASOL. You're not just passively farming the entire game. 
Having no flash though, means that it's harder for you to kind of position aggressively, potentially waste the flash in, in lane to uh, kind of keep yourself up in kind of HP trading. So that means that you're likely losing top lane push. Without the flash in mid lane, you lose a mid lane push, and that means that Aki there, um, on the other side of the rift from the W players we're seeing on screen, is going to have less options than you did in that last game. Remember, first clear from, from last game is absolutely disastrous for the Marco It's going to be a lot easier for him this game. You have to feel in the trouble. Certainly expect so. An order of drinks coming in there. I wonder if it was a spilled drink situation. I didn't see anything on camera. Do you remember um, back in the day we had like the sippy cup meta, which was, I think it was LCS in, in, in NA, where in a playoffs game, I think it was, I'm trying to remember if it was Fenskeren back then, who spilled a drink like twice in one series, and they had to bring in rules to have sippy cups on stage. Yeah. Funny how all of these regulations come in around all these sports events. We have learned this the hard way through many broken keyboards. Yes, we have. And there have been many keyboards over yes. the years across League of Legends esports. I wonder. That's the, see. These are the stats that we need in esports. How, How many, many keyboards, keyboards per game? have been destroyed throughout LOL esports history, whether through water or through smashing on a desk? I don't know. I or by really play... seen that much. But you know, actually, that's one thing we kind of miss out on in League of Legends. Yeah. Very few like rage pop-offs. I can't really think of many at all. Uh. I can think of a few, but not on... Okay, you know who does Not like do this? in the eSport, you know. In eSports, the closest we get is CB LOL. Now, um, of course, when we get, you know, closer towards the end of the split, we'll be seeing, you know, who from there is going to make it through to MSI itself too. They are very passionate players. And, you know, occasionally you have a player or two kind of standing up and screaming at the end of the game. Very rarely does it happen mid-game like it has uh, over there in, uh, in Brazil. They tend to be very, very passionate on that one. Here, though, it is... Uh, I'm not going to say it's less passionate, because that's not true. It's just different ways of showing it. You can see the stress on stage. You can see um, these players and these teams, they really are at the start of a new era for both of these. This is a thing which I think that we both wanted to talk about a lot. You know, NIP, they're kind of inheriting the V5 um, kind of standing and, and um, organization legacy, from yeah. that. And the legacy. But they have to forge their own picture, too. This is the most... Um, like intent they've put into a roster so far. This their second playoffs as the NIP ro um, os uh, roster as well. But on the other side, you know, WE, a team with a lot of history, but not, not necessarily in recent history. They themselves are now coming over the, the loss of you know, a couple of franchise players themselves, particularly Shanks in that mid lane. Both of these teams are trying to start things on the right foot. And they would love to move forward here and face FPX in the next round. They certainly would. It'd be their best performance since 2021 for WE, if they were able to make it to the top six. Remember the winner going up against FPX as well. Like the next series, gonna be no slouches. And I have to say, imagine if WE wins this one, right? First off, we've got a bracket run on our hands, which is just exciting in of itself. But second off, they beat OMG, this team that were trying to run these dive comps and they managed to stop the snowball. They managed to s stall it out to late game and win those late game fights. Then in this NIP series, it feels kind of similar, honestly, where WE are really trying to slow the game down and, and kind of hold off the storm until the late game. Well, FPX, their entire MO has been the early game storm and Milky Way taking over games and snowballing like crazy. And yes, their macro has been pretty decent and their late game has been pretty decent. I'm not saying that's not the case, but it does feel like WE, they, they're very, there's a very clear, like, linear way that they have to play through this playoffs. But the, this is so fascinating for me because, you know, I looked at WE and I honestly thought they weren't going to make it that far because I thought they were telegraphed, but they've shown a lot more depth than I gave them credit for. Particularly at the end of the split, I was really wondering, you know, if they managed to crawl into playoffs at all. I mean, that was a question we asked of many teams. Had positions, you know, 6th to 10th were all very, very close together. Even the top of the standings up, well, I mean, top two were separated, really, um, to a certain extent. But it felt like the, the bottom end of playoffs was an absolute brawl. Team WE, they were not a team I had a huge amount of confidence in. They, they proved me wrong. I mean, even if they were to lose this game, they did perform already better than I thought they would. If they continue past that point, every year, every split, there is a team from the LPL which does better than you expect it to. There is just such a momentum shift from regular split to playoffs. This time last year it was BLG. BLG beat Weibo. They got into a finals versus JDG. They took them to five games in the first and then, you know, sadly BLG didn't have the best record against JDG in particular, but they started from a position of middling expectations. You just have to wait and see which one in spring yeah. here it will be from this playoffs. Is that, is that your expectation then? 
his what, BLG w? went from from like middling. We don't have actually expect that much to literally MSI, MSI finals. finals. <laughs> is that the expectation with WE um, now? That this is the beginning of the run. Uh, oh, I need that copy pastor. Have you thought? Wait, you thought that Team WE was was bad. Wait, we'll, we'll smurf soon. <laughs> Maybe we'll have that copy. I need to go find that. We get ourselves <laughs> hey! into game, and we'll see whether that smurfing will start right here, right now. Time to find out. Awesome. <laughs> I love that rookie Jayo at the end there. There is some passion in that voice. I love that, that you know, we came into game number five and the Jayos were all over the place. That's what the pause was for. Chrono break to go back and get some better Jayos in here. <laughs> now, to remind everyone, in case you missed it, the first time we started this game, uh, rookie forced to flash at level one. So that ASOL going to be flashless for the first few minutes of laning phase. And you know, Trundle, not normally a champion with a huge amount of gank pressure, but as soon as he gets to level 3 and you get that pillar, there is a chance that if Rookie misplaces his W or uses that W and it's interrupted by the pillar, there is gank pressure. Also, Iwandi, also been going towards mid lane very, very quickly uh, in these games too. So watch out for W making aggressive moves as they start in bot lane. Nice knock up onto Photic. Good damage to start this lane off and stay. Really, really punishing off the back of this trade. Jwalt and Fotik forced pretty much out of lane at this point. Stay very happy with the way that this is all started off. He's going to hit level two first, and it does mean that Fotik and Jwalt just have to back all the way underneath their tower. This is one of the reasons I don't love picking Senna lanes into Varus. Varus is very, very good, even early into the game, of uh, punishing the tankier um, supports which go alongside the center if you're playing stuff like the, the Tom Kenj, the Braum, the Nautilus, the Alistair. So that, you know, a lot of these picks are uh, pretty good for NIP. Photo Control, they are one of the best center duos in the LPL. I remember the, from the, you know, their time back in, in past seasons as well. They've had some really good moments there as yeah. well. But Stay and Iwandi, who haven't had the best time in laning phase at least, starting this game off, the most important game of the series off, well. Yeah, and I love the, the little draft stats we're getting there at the bottom of the screen that I won the 8 and 1 on this Rakan this year. But opposite, Juo, 8 and 3 on the Nautilus and on a pick that most teams are banning right now, unless they are on that blue side because it's such a potent support here in the LPL. We'll see what Juo can do with this pick. It feels like when you get a Nautilus in a draft right now in LPL, it's sort of mana from heaven. Let's see if NIP are hungry. See if they can use that mana to cast any more spells in this case. So, you are sure not quite <laughs> getting himself that hook onto that target there. Hunting now down on bot side. Aki going towards top side. Instead, I don't think realistically there's a dive potential here. I guess you don't have combat summons. You don't have heal and ignite. There is the chance that you've got the heal on the side of Iwandi. Are they going for this? Level four, level three is on the bot lanes. It's a big old wave that's going to be crashing, and guess where Aki is? He's up in the top lane right now. He's nowhere near to try and be a part of the play. Hung, moving in, Photic the target, flashes away first as I want the tank of the tower. No, stay! His tank of the tower, forced to flash away. Joel's done such a good job to protect his laner, and Hung forced to flash as well. That's three summoners from WE. Okay, what's going to be the implication in mid lane? That's the only real thing that WE could get off this now. You can see that Rookie can't teleport back to lane. That potentially is a problem. Rookie, no flash, no teleport to reset that laning phase. Gives a lot of responsibility now to Fofo to pick up the pieces of a failed bot side dive. It's not the worst case scenario. They don't die under turret. That could have been absolute disaster for them. But still, not what they would have, would have wanted. So you need to see some advantages from mid lane being gamed from this. We certainly do. We'll see if those advantages can come on through. I'm looking towards that mid lane match for Wayward. And Shanji sparring once again. Shanji with a lot of pressure on his shoulders here in game number five. He's played this matchup multiple times in this series and it has not looked good for him. Wayward has very much had his number on this Rek'Sai. In the previous game though, Shanji looking a bit better on the Renekton once he was outside of this matchup. This is whether or not he can... This feels like the monkey on his back right now. Uh, does and it gets I mean it's somewhat easier to play this game than it is against um, you know the John or Azir of last game which is so heavy disengaged that Renekton typically really suffers against it's taking a bit of a trade here remember no teleport to get back into lane if these trades go badly enough Fofo already used his teleport to um, get himself an early buy so he could force Rookie to stay in lane against superior combat stats but Shanji speaking of oh. this doing well in the early lanes so far at least that's what we're talking about. You see the sustain, though, from this Rek'Sai. So frustrating to have to play against. But Shanji, 
I mean, we talked about it earlier in the series. Renekton, kind of known as the top laner that has that sustain that is difficult to push out of the lane. It does feel like old versus new a little bit. Uh, but obviously, Wayward going to be forced back. TP's back into that top lane. Shanji will be resetting as well. A strike taken by WE. And NIP answering with Grubs on the top side. So, stay um, safely in the spot side as well. One of the biggest factors, arguably the biggest, biggest factor in every game of this series so far, and if you're wanting to keep track of this at home, this is a great way to look at it. Just keep looking at oh. the vision on the mini-map. Votix oh, in trouble! Man. Sky's Descent comes down. I wasn't sure if uh, a Lightning Bolt would be available for Fofo. Didn't have it in his arsenal. Votix survives. Holy moly, things are getting close and a bit frantic, but again, just watch out for those vision wards on the map, basically, folks. If you're looking for vision control, NIP, they've struggled to make plays when they're on vision. W being very good at getting that if they have the opportunity. Blue Ward in the enemy jungle, that's a good thing. Wayward getting into the enemy jungle as well, potentially even looking towards an aggressive play on Aki. <laughs> this is a good start from WE, at least on that front. Aki just gets the knock up while Wayward's tunneling, so he can't get the unborrow. The Wayward immediately alone. slams an emote. Here we go. Round two. Someone ring a bell because we're about to kick off again in this bottom side. This time, though, Joao on his own. Oh, oh no, he's closed the way! What are you doing? Not in game five, not like this. Oh, and stay for the rookie on Team WE, who's honestly had a hell of a split for himself. That is not the way you want it to go in the most important game of your split so far. Important first blood, and it pulls apart WE's intentions towards bot side. NIP, they win on bot side while they still get to stick around top side. Big moment for them. That is such a freebie from Draw. I mean, it's just heartbreak. Juo, obviously very good at clearing the wave. I wanted hunger here, but Juo has vision over this wall, so he knows that so long as he doesn't go up to the yeah. brush, he's certainly fine. One of the things about Senna Nautilus and why it's so strong is that you can max E on Nautilus, which means that your wave clears better, which means that you can kill the minions and hook him under that turret. He's got the Barmy Cinder and triple cloth armor now. He just wanted an extra shirt on, I guess. He's wearing three on the back of each other. That extra armor can very much <laughs> help Dro be such a big factor and a big tank in these early fights. You gotta think about how big Nautilus is, right? Each shirt <laughs> just goes on like an elbow or a shoulder. It's a lot of shirts. Maybe they're like hockey jerseys, the, the really big ones. <laughs> I think he might just be able to do that. He's, uh, he's definitely working to be a big uh, defender in this game. Certainly is. Lead for NIP off the back of that. They got those three grubs as well, so we'll be keeping our eyes on Shanji in that regard maybe gets a chance to get onto some of these towers, especially with Fotic moving up to this top side, changing the way that they approach this uh, Renekton matchup. And uh, we just split them out once again. Joel, you may have got a kill on the last one. This is a four-man play in the bottom side on towards Joel. But like you say, Aki's here. Luckily, Hung was not tanking the tower because that CC chain would have finished him. NIP's macro has been much better in game five in this early game. Now, what you do with the center and why you're seeing the center run top lane is because, of course, the Nautilus is really hard to dive, especially with that kill earlier. The extra gold there allows Fotic to then stack up on the melee top laner of Wayward, just does the auto Q tap to get souls from Wayward for free, and it stops Wayward getting an individual advantage. So, you've shut down Wayward a little bit. Draw is safely farming on the bot side, and the dive's been diverted, and Fotic gets plate gold in top side in the 2v1 and extra souls. NIP showing a masterclass on how to use the Senna and the Senna lane partner to its full advantage. I never get bored of watching Wayward, man. No, he's so <laughs> cheeky. Stops the recall, immediately the emote comes out. He's looking for another one. Oh, he goes wide this time. And the recall does come off through. That would have been huge, honestly, if he stopped yeah. the second recall there. That could have been massive. As uh, they just continue. But in the meantime, State managing to get two plates of his own. Can't quite finish that third one. And you can see much more careful positioning <laughs> this time around. This time around, yeah. Now, Rookie, how's he doing in the mid lane? Despite the fact that he lost this flash at level one, even in CS, lost the turret plate, maybe two under this mid lane, but considering that, I was wondering whether there could be some threat onto him. It's obviously not been too bad. Rookie ends up eating a uh, severing bolt out of Fofo, a lightning bolt from the heavens as well. Um, it's often said in uh, Chinese mythology as well that to uh, overcome yourself, you must go through one of those uh, trial by heavenly tribulation. It's the lightning bolt from the sky. I feel like that's pretty fitting for a game five and Rookie himself in this mid lane. That Riley is now finished off for Rookie TP's back into the mid lane. And Asol, one of these champions that, you know, everyone always talks about the scaling aspect. And yes, of course, Asol is an incredibly sh strong scaling champion, but not massively dissimilar to Talia in that you can get out onto the map using that movement ability of your W, the Astral Flight, to get into these other side lanes. But WE 
on the top side of the map here will be able to get themselves these three groups evening it up to three and three or as you see nip grouping up very heavily looking towards the drake that's up in 20 seconds okay so really good vision control from nip there are some flank wards from the side of w but no teleport for where to use it so that's basically just some advanced warning because you again a bit of a leg up in that advance in terms of that information warfare i don't think there's going to be a contest from w because of that they've taken the grubs on top side no real point throwing yourself into the early game front line of NIP. Instead, they go for a cross map. Hung just wants to be under towers. That is his game plan today. And the ultimate used by Wayward to deny things. And actually, Shanji died before. I feel like if you dive back under tower, maybe something could have happened. But WE, they get the dive and they'll get so many plays for it. I think Wayward ended up of, um, avoiding the stun with his ultimate. So Shanji couldn't get the... Uh, the kill before the uh, or the stun before the tower re aggro reset so it's going to be a full cross map three grubs to three means that it's going to be even in terms of tower taking potential lower health though of course you have a trundle trundle one of the best tower killers in the game as well so double e going to win the race on that front more gold in pocket at the cost of a dragon but a kill and more plates potentially first turret will definitely work out for them actually saying that you're not gonna be able to stick around for the full turret itself i don't think shandy should be able to wave clear this in theory although fofo doing a good job of pressuring him off yeah, and almost finishing off the kill. Shanji's out of there. Fofo will finish this tower and he will not let any crocodile stop him. <laughs> That's a big moment. That should have been first turret being secured by NEP potentially on the other side of the map, but uh, both sides now being staved off. First turret finally being taken by Fofo on this top side. This way can be such a difference maker. Halfway through the draft and going towards the end of it, we're saying, hey, we don't really want to see the triple tanks coming in from NIP, especially against Varus and the Hui. They will just shred, mince up these tanks in the front line if you let them. Yes, the ASOL in the center. The double ults put that into question a little bit more. This, these carries are not going to be safely chewing through the low range front line. But when Fofo is getting so much gold, getting himself towards two items and the uh, Seraph's completion, WE do have the damage to take away these tanks from NIP. Fofo, 600 gold up individually, 1,000 gold ahead of anyone that's not a mid laner, which is, you know, a very cherry-picked stat that I'm saying, but nonetheless, very fed so is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> oh, that's a hook and a half, isn't it? I want he caught out in the root lance as well. I don't think they have the damage to finish a kill here. I wonder on that Rakan can just dash back out to safety. Still a good hook from Joel. That is so, what are we looking at here now? Mid laners uh, now uh, going to be put into a side lane. It's the ult on stay. Gets that flash away from him. Again, this AD carry coming up from the LDL. And caught out of position a couple of times. He's definitely been preyed on by NIP. They're trying to put him under pressure. And in fairness, if there's anyone to put under pressure in a game yeah. five where everything's on the line, it's the person who is least used to that. I mean, I feel like WE in general are under pressure. You saw Fofo, who is a veteran. You know, Fofo is a player that's been playing a long yeah. time. He's made it far deeper into playoffs than this before. But it felt like he felt the pressure when we were looking in Champ Select or just after Champ Select when that Hui was locked in, speaking off on your screen there. But Stay definitely should be feeling the pressure. This would be the furthest WE have made it in playoffs since 2021 if they can make it to that next round and earn the honor of facing against FPX. And I think particularly for um, Wayward and Iwandi who had mixed last year, particularly Wayward in that case, this would be so big for them. Maybe you could even say the same of Rookie on the other side, not making it to international events for a player who's, you know, widely known as one of the greatest of all time. It's an ult for him to stay, trade for the cleanse. I wasn't sure if that was a bit of a bait. Honestly, the ult from Fotic perhaps over the top there. The hook does land, but realistically not much else. The cleanse came out, and in the meantime, Harold has been started. WE happy to kick this one off, and honestly, without Senna ultimate, how confident are NIP? Very, apparently, as they muscle their way into the river. Oh, Wayward Shandy's moves in the top side yet. of the play. That's a lot of percent damage coming out from the ace hole. Skies descend available as Aki moves in. He's trying to steal here, but he's alone. Flashed out of the play. Iwandi gets out of there. The comet comes down, but it doesn't achieve anything. Once again, we see NIP being a little slow to one of these objectives. Shanji, no teleport. Had to walk his way up and waddle his way up river. Couldn't get there in time. NIP. They snatch and grab at a steal. They're lucky to get away with just burning a couple of flashes, but they don't get that objective. It's a big bounty kind of a, well, not bounty, but big win for WE. They get themselves that uh, Herald to potentially use on that mid lane out of turret as well. Again, we keep talking about how important that is in terms of just keeping yourself up ticking in terms of that, that vision. Keep pushing it forwards into the enemy jungle. 
as it stands, WE, they already have themselves good objective control there. MIP cannot afford to let WE slot into that style again. That's how they've been winning, getting control of the vision, getting control of the objectives, stopping NIP from pulling the trigger cleanly. It does feel like NIP have kind of opted in in this draft, though, to some extent, right? Where, yes, I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, that that is the way that W have been winning, and to be honest, it's not really what I expect from NIP, but the fact that they locked both the ASOL and the Senna is like, we're stacking, boys. <laughs> we <laughs> want to go as late as physically possible. We want to try and play front to back with these tanks. Whether or not they can be tanky enough, we've talked enough about the tank shredding from Fofo, from Stay. It definitely feels like this is a style that NIP are opting into. And the fact that we are three grubs apiece, the fact that we are one Drake apiece as well to start us off, does feel like it is setting up for this big late game barn burner for both teams. Rookie safely farming up in a side lane. That's important to note. It's they're definitely prioritizing this A Sol. You tend to see that Trundle pillar getting somewhat out of mouth. Misses on the draw. Chor does manage to hook over towards the wall and actually gets a triple knock-up stay. Caught out by Akizol as well. The damage isn't really there to follow up. As in comes Shanji, shields across the team. Dominus to get him tanky, but he's not tanky enough. The sustain comes through, but he goes down in the end. The route won't land from Fotiki. The WE, another pick as Drake spawns. The NIP frontline just can't deal with the damage coming out of WE in the early game. Yeah, the center and the ace all the up. Here comes the ult, but it misses from Rookie. It actually just clips two, but I don't think it's enough. It saved Fotik though, it kept them from going any deeper and finishing Fotik off. Wayward nearly picking him off himself there. But the Heralds charge mid lane and actually they can keep going through this one. Fofo gonna try and stop Rookie, but no, gets through the wall anyway. Herald charges in the mid lane. I don't think they'll finish the tower though. No, they won't finish the turret, but all the same, NIP threw a lot of ults at WE and you can see the problem of trying to deal with the Hui and the Varus who just stand and gun down your tanks. This Renekton has been giving up farm to Rookie, understandably so. This ASOL is going to be a huge artillery cannon in the late game. But for now, before you kind of got up to the point where you're really tanky or doing a load of damage and dealing, dam dealing damage to the tanks all the same, this Renekton is not going to be a good frontline. It's a great Nautilus assault. Honestly, the Sejuani ult's great too. You're, you're teleporting straight on top of the CC from Quay. It tags onto oh. him, follows him after the flash, and he goes down so, so easily. Renekton is not tanky versus these carries. He's certainly not. Couldn't get the sustain off, couldn't get the damage off. Caught out and right on the corner of that fear as well. That was yeah. millimeters away from Shanji surviving the play and maybe uh, the dragon going a different direction. But either way, doesn't matter what nearly happened. What matters is that Fofo found the fear. He found his target and now two Drakes on the board for WE. It's Chemtech Soul, which means that not only is it, you know, not the most impactful soul of the game, but more importantly to me is the type of rift that it leads to because there are all kinds of shenanigans when it comes to these mega blast cones and when yeah. it comes to the amount of sustain you get from the honey fruit, like it feels like it changes the game completely. And even the base dragons are, are nice, so uh, people kind of forget about this, and I don't blame them for it because it's been changed a couple of times. It gives you heal and shield power and tenacity. I think that's valuable um, in, for both teams, actually. I think particularly with the tenacity against the Sejuani, the Renekton, even the Asol stuns up there too. Senna stun, that's nice. The Rek'Sai healing will be increased per uh, dragon stack there as well. A lot of this can be quite valuable. Hell, even Rakan gets some good value out of that too. So WE, even from base dragons, NIP would like to not give them too many because it feels like in the front back they're gonna need a little bit of help until they get a huge amount of stacks and that's uh that's gonna be questionable in its own right whether w will let them do that nip making a play for top tier one tower in the meantime wayward is playing opposite to trade nip seem unsure about stepping up to this one i don't know if they thought we were trying to make a play in the area but either way they won't step up and it means that the tower does survive so we now three towers on the board iwandi on the flank spotted by aki Wandi, real shout out to Hung and I, Wandi. I think as a duo, when they are unlocked on the map, the amount of control they give this team is absolutely oppressive. Wayward as well, with the Tremor Sense on the wreck side, can help them play safer on weak side, scout out into the enemy jungle. NIP, they need to show that, yes, with a composition that can be a little bit more patient, but all the same, they need to be able to pull the trigger at the right time when the opportunities show themselves. They've struggled to do that when they've lost the vision control. They can't afford to do that in this game, or their spring ends here. It does feel tense, doesn't it? And it's definitely been the the slowest game of the series so far. Even the Corky Azir game 
makes uh, Huey Aesol yeah. <laughs> look fast-paced. Uh, but like the Corky Azir game, we saw a lot of contestion from both teams. We saw a lot of scrapping and like posturing around each Drake. While we have seen a little bit of that, it's felt more nervous and rightly so. Again, a lot on the line for both of these organizations. Game no And I'll tell you what. Yeah. You can tell playoffs have started, can't you? This feels <laughs> like playoffs. LPL playoffs is always a banger, but my God, we're only in round two and already our second five game series, already so much at stake for the teams. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, it feels fitting, you know, that both these teams go the, the five games after everything was so close in the bottom end of the playoff seeding. You know, we talked about the, the heavenly tribulations earlier. It feels very much like these two teams are being tested in terms of uh, just in terms of the mindset as well, both these teams, you cannot afford to get yeah. um, get get your mindset rocks here. You have to be consistent. The rookies need to help their um, kind of like uh, their brothers in arms here, particularly stay. You have to look at this guy, the rookie on the team for Team WE, and say, can he withstand this pressure? He's doing okay so far, but he has been under threat. One more big mistake might open the floodgates for NIP. We're getting to the point where you know, Baron's on the table. It's a big problem if you make a mistake now. Something worth mentioning as well is that Stay has Ghost, which not necessarily a bad thing. Ghost on Baron is very, very valuable in team fights. However, Aki hits one ultimate onto Stay late on into the game, yep. and that could be really bad news for the side of WE with no cleanse there. Iwandi has the option to go into Mikhail's. Yeah, he's got the Mikhail's game. already. That definitely oh, he's already helps. He's gone as the first item. However, if you blow that, which is easy to do so, that's the only thing you've got. Here comes the ult from State. Oh, Chuo was caught out here. Shield comes on through. And he will survive. Shanji got onto the back side, forced the flash from Fofo. His way, we're trying to tank up for his team. Shanji, a no, Fotic! Fotic! We talked about the Mega Blast codes. I didn't expect it that quick. Fotic just about gets away with his life. But this should be Drake for WE. Duffy, does this guy been playing Helldivers or what? He just throws himself <laughs> into the enemy lines. Oh, I almost lost my mind and my voice seeing that. That could have been it so badly. Out of position in that one. It means that W get to push out on Dragon. Wayward goes oh, again. Oh, Fotix no flash because of the blast cone. And now they get onto everyone. Rookie has that ultimate available. Dashes over the wall, keeps himself alive. But Fotix gone. If it wasn't Drake before for WE, it certainly is now. And that will be sole point. Oh man, NIP, they have lost this um, push of spears in this bot side jungle to go towards this dragon. WE, it's been like the rest of the games they've won. It has been more controlled. They've sat in an area of the map and they bet that NIP just can't find a way into their battle lines. And that has been the case here. Yeah. Shanji did get himself onto the back line very briefly. Um, that happened actually just after this point. See him hanging over that wall. But while this is happening, the fight is very split. You know, Fofo does get hit up and. It, you know, he misses his ult there too, which is a bit of an unfortunate moment for him. But even with that, even with the fight split and the carry's not in the best place, I see that if I can do it. Rookie! That's rookie! He just right clips behind him and almost loses his oh, team the series! No. Rookie, what a mistake to make. My goodness. And then Fotig just. just doesn't respect what's available here. Wayward flashing onto him. There we go, easy finish off for Fofo. Ah, a bit unfortunate there. But the WE fans are going to be over the moon with the way this one's going. See the very quick drawing there of that a prayer, the hands the hands together there. From what we saw in the players before this uh, <laughs> series came about. NIP, I mean, if that ain't a gift from the heavens as Fotic just goes yeah. plopped into your team. Um, I don't know what it is. They're going forwards again. Not able to quite catch out. Stay. Here comes the ult defense though. Oh, Still oh, good. Oh, oh. Uh, Rookie's doing some damage now. If Rookie slams his comet out there, I'm not sure, but maybe that's a kill. Fotic, my god, he is squishy, isn't he? Fofo just a, just railing him. And I want to quickly point out the fact that this is Fotic center. Fotic kind of famous for how good at center this guy historically is. He brings it out in game five when they are pushed to the brink, when they barely won game four to stay in this series. You expect a magnanimous performance. You expect something incredible. But so far, a little lackluster from him. And perhaps feeling the pressure of game five. And then I keep given this pressure again. They can't afford to just withdraw into the shell and, and cower beneath the pressure of WE. Do you think there needs to be some kind of, um, you know, you need to be respectful about the way you approach it? Absolutely, you do. But NIP, they can't just afford WE to have the run of the map. Now, particularly since you're getting to the point where on hit Varus can shred through Baron, and Trundle's pretty good at tanking it too. I mean, Trundle's going to be a fantastic champion in this game. That ultimate going to get more and more value the later the game goes. It wouldn't surprise me to see a very quick Baron start now, particularly yeah. with a 2-3 item mark from this Varus. Absolutely shreds Baron.
I mean, earlier on in the series, we saw a two-man Baron from WE at like 20 minutes. Like, this is a team, you know, we, we keep talking about this team being slow and controlled, but once we're past 20 minutes, they are not afraid to pull the trigger. They are proactive when it comes to their map plays, when it comes to macro, and out playing the other team on the map. They're very happy to make things like that happen. I wonder, trying to get creative with it, looking for a flank on that Rakan. Oh, using the shroud? In. That's some big damage available from Rookie as well. Burning through the trundle, but he's damn tanky in his duo. That might just go down and send lightning from the sky, but it's Anson with a meteor. Where you were trying to escape on the front line is Fofo trying to trade that damage back, but Shanchi's getting tankier. And NIP go even. Rookie diving under the tower, hung the target as he's forced away in the root lands. But Wayward zones the rest of the squad. NIP are not done yet. Dwo uses the corner hug of Senna's Shroud, where you can come out of Fog of War, and there's a brief moment where you can't see it, to get an unexpected hook onto Hung on that trundle. Really well played. Both control, they are absolutely no slouches at playing with the Senna, Senna combos. Using the Shroud's a great effect there. Very nearly gets them a clean win. You get a kill onto that jungler, that's Baron. They still got something left. They need to be clutch. They almost find themselves a game-winning play at that point. Genuinely could have been. That could turn the game. You get that Baron and suddenly everything is so much easier yeah. for NIP. And it is a definitely a reminder to WE that while they have control, they might not always have control. And crucially stay. No summoners for the next few minutes. That could be everything here. Let's take another look. Right. As you say, Joel, starting things off with a great hook. Yeah, he comes out of the Shroud from center, goes around the corner, so Punk just doesn't expect that to come through. Another big thing which people weren't expecting this, you get a lot of stacks from Asol from hitting your ultimate as well. By hitting three, he's almost next to it, three to his next Skies Descends too. That means that he's going to be up very, very quickly, even pretty much as soon as it comes up on that next one. If he can continually have the Skies Descend for these big fights, Rookie will be such an insane backline back line assassin. Speaking of big fight, straight coming up in 40 seconds, and neither team wants to give any kind of space. Votic cleansing from the charm from Iwandi. The engage from WE kind of mitigated. There's a reasonable amount of sustain here. Away, we're trying to escape. Tunnels over to his team and will survive. But Aki is chunked. Need to see how close Rookie is to that ultimate. I really feel like he's going to be close to it due to hitting a three man ultimate just before this. Also, important, Trundle still has his ult. While he has ult, it feels like W can just choose one target to remove from the team fight. If that's draw, it's going to be very uh, hard for him to survive. He's caught out right now on the pillar. It's kind of tanky, but Fotik is now way too far forward trying to protect his support. Almost goes down for it. That's his flash. His cleanse is on cooldown from the previous scrap. Now a TP coming on through as well. Shanji rejoins the action. You can see Aki on the top side of the play. This is tense because it could be sold for WE. Hook onto Wayward, but do they have the damage to burn these tanks down? It doesn't feel like it for now. Uh, you need to have the, the carries in the pocket for WE. Stay needs to be auto attacking. Hard to do so while the Nautilus Assault is around. Such a fencing match. This could be it. Aki steps forward, threatening as he dives into the back line. Fofo gets the Mikhails and gets himself out to safety. Shields across the team. Aki flashes out as well. Juo on the front line as Shanji escapes. But Juo, can he get out with his life? The Meteor lands, but it doesn't finish anybody off. Everyone walking away. And WE win themselves the soul, it feels like. I don't think NIP can get in in time. They can't teleport back in. They don't have those globals. The WE, they don't get the kills, but they get themselves the objective. NIP left waiting for another one. Couldn't quite get the skies to send in time for the huge team fight Comet. Only the small one available. WE with this will now shift their approach towards this Baron to see if they can get themselves the other Uber buff to potentially finish off this series. It feels so very tense and I think NIP thanking their lucky stars that it is a Chemtech soul in this game. Fotek at 86 stacks at this point, getting close to that 100 mark that we always talk about with the center, getting towards that late game, although on the lethality center, not as much of a late game threat as the, the kind of classic yeah. Kraken Slayer build that we used to see all that time ago. And it feels tense. It feels like as well to me that, honestly, NIP's composition is not doing that much damage to these tanks. Like Wayward and Hunk consistently just sat on the front line, soaking up a lot of this damage. Yeah, and I think that you're really waiting until, you know, something like the Void Stack comes in from Rookie. Fotic, yeah, he'll end up doing some okay damage throughout the late game as well, just because stacks give you so much extra stats to throw on top of things, but you need just a little bit more. The Blood Song also helping with that too. The ex kind of the exposed weakness can very much help with regards to that. Rookie, does he have himself that big ult next? It comes up. I don't think it's seeing it on that icon there. would love to know how close he is to that one. If that Sky's Descent comes through, maybe you just kill the backline. It doesn't matter if you don't kill the frontline as quickly, if the carries are dead. 
Certainly true. He's level 16 at this point. And again, rookie. First game of the series where they're on the red side. Gets the counter pick in that ASOL. And now he has to carry. You see almost 300 CS at the 30 minute mark here. As Aki does get himself over the wall. Wayward threatening on the top side of the play. But the pillar already on cooldown. Means NIP walk away. But these long range fights. WE are winning every single time. I mean, it's just the nature of Huey. Huey gets to be pretty much everything in a mage. You can't do it at all the same time with all the same cooldowns. You've got to choose one of three different flavors of them. When he's firing through those skill shots from that Q, particularly the QW on people who've lost a bit of HP already, he absolutely shreds. Rookie is like a stack or two away from the big ult. He's going to get it on this wave, I think, as well. He'll copy on this, and we'll have it after that. WE, they need to be very, very careful. Their tanks are tanky. They win the front line, but there they cannot is. afford to have the dive work on to stay in Fofo. Skies descend, comes on through. Photic using the ult to spot out the Baron. It's enough to dissuade WE, but that's a big cooldown for NIP. Rookie steps on forward, does need to be a little cautious himself. He does, again, damage on both these teams. It's late game now, folks. It is very, very late game, so we're getting to the point where the stacks are starting to really, really uh, come to bat. We've got lots of items on both sides. If Wayward finds himself onto a backliner as well, make no mistake, Rek'Sai can sometimes struggle to stick to a target, but once he's mela range, oh my word, he's going to do damage. Wayward. He's the wall. He's spotted out. He's rooted down. Okay, bit of damage coming on through. Chuol flashes on the opposite side of the play. Wayward's caught, and Wayward's down. Rookie finds the kill, and Chuol's hunting for a little bit more. Iwandi dives over the wall himself, but now NIP inside track towards the Baron. Okay, that's a huge moment. Only one frontliner left in the form of this trundle, and NIP now have the chance to go towards the Baron. The ASOL continue to just breathe death on the Baron and try and burn it down. They do this so quickly, but WE trying to engage onto Chuol as Photic moves over. Stay gets caught by the depth charge. In the meantime, Fofo -fo gets a fear. We've switched onto sides. Shanji and WE, they're being corralled on the wrong side of the map, and Fofo -fo can't be a part of the play. Chuol gets onto Iwandi. He's trying to buy time and space for his carries, but it's Stay and Hung that the rest of NIP are hunting. Rookie over the wall. The Skies Descend still available as he starts to burn through WE. The root comes through onto Hung. Aki here to follow it up. But that breath of light is all but darkness for WE. The ninjas work in the darkness, but their midliner brings a flickering flame of light, which roars into a full bonfire. That could just be it. Jungler down, AD carry down. That should be Baron going with it. Even though the Chemtech Soul was a nice pickup for WE, it doesn't mean they can win these fights against the scaling carries. Baron going down sees NIP into this game. Rookie doing the damage, being the carry for the squad. He got the fifth pick on red side. He locks the ASOL and he's carrying these fights. Huge one for NIP as they burn through the Baron. There's no contestion whatsoever from WE. They realize they can't fight for this one. Baron secured an Elder up in a minute and 15 seconds. Yeah, it's a perfect timing for the Elder because now what this means is that you get the Baron, you get to reset, you get to push out another set of waves and contest for that on full value. Wayward spotted on Vision. He's looking for a tunnel over the wall. He did this so well earlier in the series, but really the root over the wall from Senna I think it was. It wasn't just blind. You can see them with that ward just over Raptor Pit. This is what changes everything. The thing is, though, he's trying to bait him in because, you know, if Votic gets hit by Wayward, that could be the fight over in itself. But the whole team flies over the wall and suddenly the front line is down. So much of this late game of this series has been about front line versus front line. And in this game, in the important moment here around the Baron, it's NIP who managed to just about last things out until it's actually Wayward that makes an uncharacteristic mistake on the right side. And I think part of that mistake is the fact that. A soul can shred you. He's been so invincible. He's been so unkillable. The rest of this series, not anymore. 20 seconds on Elder. NIP desperate to keep their playoff streams alive. This would be the furthest they've ever got as an organization away. Would forced away by Rookie on the A soul. Drake oh, about can teleport to back in. He can teleport back in, but will he be in time? Here comes the fight. He's not here. It's a huge pick, and it's Iwandi on his signature Rakan that goes down. Shanti's found the backside, but Fofo survives, and the spiraling spiral turned around. But Dro gets onto the rest of the carries, and Rookie burns them to a cinder. The stars collapse down around WE's ears. It's a quadra kill for Rookie, one of the best to ever do it. He gets the counter pick, and he destroys. Destroys WE!
How fitting is it that in the year of the dragon, it's the dragon from the mid lane which sees NIP through to what we will it seems to be a real heavenly matchup with the Phoenixes in the next round. Quadra kill for the mid laner, pushing down mid lane. You thought this was the year of Smolder. No, no. This is the year of Asol. First Nexus Tower in trouble. Wayward gets some knockups. Can they finish the kill slow? The health bars down to half, but Votic survives. Wayward trying to tank up for his team. He might just have held on for WE. Oh, wow. We've got ourselves a final twist in this. NIP, they still walk away with that one fight, but importantly, they can't end the game before the Elder, uh, well, before the Elder's been taken. So now they don't finish that game. Elder's still up. We can still have ourselves an Elder flip. And well, we've just been talking about NIP, potentially doing this as a victory lap. WE have maybe one last fight in them due to the last minute wave clear from Wayward and Iwandi. It has been so long since we saw Rookie on an international stage. It's been so long since we saw him on a team where it felt like he could succeed. Even the top esports roster not working out. And now, Barisol. on the cusp, game five, Aki core out. Damage coming out from Rookie is enough to save his jungler. It is, but that's the Trundle and the Varasol, two very important tools. No ults really used on the side of NRP. Well, they use the Sijuani ult, but they do have the Skies Descend. And that might just be enough in itself. Rookie ready to go again, looking towards that angle, looking towards the flank. Who's he going to find? Wayward chunked immediately. And I love that Rookie just holds this ult until the perfect moment. Doesn't want to give the game away, doesn't want to use that resource. Elder started off by NIP now as WE. They've run out of time to scale. They've got to fight. They've got to hold onto this series. Rookie looking for the flank. This could be it from NIP, but no. Cancels the dash. Doesn't go in just yet. He's on a control ward, so they don't know where he is. Hung pulled in, but now 1D is behind them, and he's found Rookie. That's the knockup. The Comet falls, but it's not enough. Stay dashes to the backside. He's low, and Aki finishes the job. The Sejuani dive, but Wayward takes out Rookie. And Hung now forced away from the play. Iwandi trying to survive, gets the heal, but he just goes straight down. Fotik is still firing. Fofo has to be the carry for WE. Wayward gets yet another knockup, and the Way has its moment to shine. Aki will be taken down and hung is still in the picture smite available we they will get elder dragon and nip flee with their tails between their legs oh, the GW! taken from the other side of the map as Dro desperate to escape but he's burning hung can't chase for more but we get elder Fofo teleports back to the base to save nexus turrets but we we were ready to wipe wipe them off Felt like after the quadra kill, that should have been it. Should have been NIP through to the next round. The WE, oh my word, they have pushed, pushed the ninjas the entirety of this series. It won't end the game, this Elder, but it will extend it beyond what we thought could possibly happen. We have ourselves another twist, another chapter oh. still yet to write. The stacks keep stacking, the game keeps going. And how fitting is it that it's Wayward that finds the shutdown <laughs> onto Rookie, his old teammate. Rookie in the pit, but Wayward flanking the flanker. And Fofo, late game Way. We haven't had much chance to talk about it. He hasn't really had the team fights to show it so far, but you know, it's a, a pretty overextended kill onto Stay. It takes a lot from Aki to get there, and it means that Rookie has no peel left for him. So Juani goes forwards, no one's there to save. The uh, Assault, even with all of his stacks from this monstrous wreck site. Elder is still on for another minute, NIP. They can wave clear for now. Of course, there's no uh, Baron buff on the side of WE. Baron buff spawning in a minute. And with this Elder, it does mean that WE get to do that thing, which has typically given themselves the leg up. Walk into the enemy jungle, drop wards, control the map, try and slow things down, and try and make sure that NIP don't have the angles for the engage. So Rookie can't just fly over a wall and end this game. It feels like such an important series here for both organizations, not just in terms of, you know, the players we've been talking about that, but also the actual organizations themselves. Both of these orgs committing a lot financially to these rosters. These are the biggest rosters these two orgs have seen, for, I mean, for NIP ever, for WE in a long time. And they need to make it work here in spring, here in game five. Can they make it to round three? WE. Off the back of that Elder, will secure themselves that Baron. Shanji answers it with a tier 2 in the bottom lane. And WE now with the potential to siege into this base. 
We've got that handy little graphic on the bottom left-hand side of your screen as well, which is the mid lane inhibits it. Time up being down. Only 20 seconds, so WE will be able to um, kind of protect their base a little bit easier with that one now too. They did lose the Nexus Tower, so NIP, um, if there is an opening shown, <laughs> I mean, how many times have we seen a game 5 be ended through? A uh, little bit of a teleport through to that Nexus. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm just putting it on the table because this game has been very, very tense. WE, uh, feels like the base is a bit of a glass house right now. Got to be careful to throw too many stones. I will say as well, we're 40 minutes into the game with this much damage on either side, even with the inhib towers up. I'm not sure NIP's base will survive a lost team fight. It's down to this positioning this is where we have been at their strongest all split long it's when it comes to the late game when it comes to map positioning when it comes to vision control and vision control they absolutely have in this bottom quadrant it's tier two nip moving over to defend it five strong here on the defense most important things to look out for of course rookie need to see when he hits his next guy's descend he doesn't have it right now the most important ults in this game are particularly the trundle ult i think also the virus ult is really important too i think they're really good at pinning one of these frontline members down you see that we they're splitting across the map trying to take the uh, as many lanes of pressure as they can and nip they need to just try and wave clip particularly stall out until that sky's descend comes back up way we're just kind of ignoring shanji in the mid lane as well actually takes the inhib tower down with the help of those Baron minions. Still another minute of Baron to work with for WE. And they are slowly but surely working their way through these towers. Aki moving over towards this mid lane. They will be able to defend that inhibitor. But it should mean that the tier two in this bottom side goes down. Still a minute on the Baron. Perhaps WE can push for a little bit more. Uh, I think they can. Again, they have themselves some really powerful ultimates. A good Vara Assault can really change the story of this game. This front line is not very tanky when there's a Trundle on them as well. The Trundle Pillars setting up for a Vara Assault could be a very, very big tool to use. Shanji trying to hold off Wayward in the mid lane. Rookies moved over as well, but Wayward just tunnels on out. This is the, the pain of dealing with a Rek'Sai on the enemy team. 30 seconds on the Baron, this is pretty much the last minion wave that they'll get to work with. Rookie trying to clear it as Photic moves in as well. And the siege is weathered by the side of NIP. We're in game five, we're headed towards 45 <laughs> minutes on the clock. Gold is 300 apart between the teams right now. And Elder respawns in just over 60 seconds. Okay, huge item completion or half item completion coming through for Rookie. He has a Seekers now. Much harder to shut him down if he chooses the right moment to go as Golden. I mean, yesterday in the game five we had, just yesterday by the way, between Weibo and IG, we saw some pretty awkward Zonias in the late game which didn't have value. However, if you manage to get good enough stasis so you don't get that immediate kill, you can flash out. Flash Zonia is very powerful. Rookie can reposition. And that could potentially be a huge tool for NIP. Now, Elder coming back up again from 40 seconds. Vision control and the whole map being pushed in the favor of WE. Can they stop NIP from finding the angles, which saw them into a near game-ending state just a few minutes before? Wayward's on a flank again, but he's spotted out. And we'll have to rejuggle the situation, try and find another way in. Fotic with a spell shield here, keeps it intact. Keep your eyes on Fofo, trying to pop that spell shield from a distance to set up for a potential all-in from Iwandi. NIP desperately trying to muscle their way into their own half of the mid lane. It doesn't feel like it's their half right now. It's Iwandi, though, chunked. Photic, by the way, is full build on this lethality center. Yeah, he oh! has himself a warning That's the ult, but it's the cleanse away. The Mikhail's bought for the Suwani ultimate. Aki, nice little shot there. I got a little overexcited. Mikhail's exists. <laughs> and Stay <laughs> will get away. But that was Fofo's flash as well. That's important. OK, so. Now they get to win this mid lane pressure through that Sejuani ultimate. They can enter the river through the safe part of it. But is it safe enough? Wayward on a flank. Iwandi on a flank. Photic oh, no God. spell shield, but has cleanse. And the Elder has started. Couldn't be tenser. Here we go. Hung being burnt on the front line. Iwandi tries to get in, but he's forced out. Juo barely surviving with his own life as Hung steps forward on the front line. Wayward flanking once again, but he's stopped. He can't finish it off. The rail going to cross the team and Wayward out the top side of the fight. Baron. Uh, Elder, sorry, still at 8k as Shanji tries to find a flank now. NIP onto the objective. WE have to step up. Wayward, Wayward's back. Sustained back to almost full HP. There's a reset and a TP coming on through from Juo. The front line regenerated. It's a smite. Goes to Aki. And Aki wins it. Hung will fall. Fo 
Mofo is next, and after all of that, NIP take it on a 50-50. It's a flip for the series. It's a flip for their lives in NIP. They get the Elder, but can they get the wave into the enemy base? Wayward, he's trying to stop it. He doesn't manage to get the very last minion. NIP with these death timers, they're going to give it a good damn shot at finishing the game, and they should be able to do it. There's only one Nexus Tower. Who cares if you've got minions? I'm pretty sure five strong NIP can finish this one out. After five long games, they manage to finish the job. Rookie gets counter pick in game number five, and Rookie carries NIP to round three. They are bloodied, they are bruised, they are exhausted. But the ninjas in pajamas make it a full five game series victory for themselves. They overcome Team WE and honestly hats off to them. They did so much better than I would have expected after the regular split. They can leave sad, but with their heads held high. What a series it was. Such a privilege to be able to watch this League of Legends. The tenseness of it, the drama of it. We play it out to the full extent here on the stage in front of the fans. NIP go on to face the Phoenixes, Thun plus Phoenix in the next round for another mythical matchup. The furthest this organization has ever made it in playoffs since the rebrand. And now they have to live up to V5. V5 either <laughs> the very worst team in the world or one of the very best teams in the world. Let's see if that's going to be a similar story for NIP. They've got an opportunity to make a run through this bracket now. They've made it to top six. But you thought the uh, A-Soul was into Galactic. They're up against the Milky Way next. <laughs> I like that. That looks nice. So anyone, get all your telescopes out ready. We're going stargazing next time. Two days in time. Tell your family, tell your friends. That will be a hell of a matchup. I think NIP, you know, they had themselves some worries about what happens when they can't close out these lanes, these leads cleanly. Even in game five, they had a near game-ending scenario. And it really should have been that. He almost threw a 15,000 copies earlier in the season. Series, yeah. rather. They gave us some drama. And you know what? I'm glad for it as a spectator. If you're a fan of NIP, I'm so, so sorry. That is going to be a one. Uh, yeah, we'll check your pacemakers after that one. Yeah, I mean, for, for WE as well, that's got to be a heartbreaker. That's got to be one of the most crushing defeats for these players. They were so close to finishing this one out in that game number four. They were so close. Game number five, it, it could have gone either way this entire time. And it feels like they came into playoffs so much stronger than people were expecting. And unfortunately, falling at the final hurdle here. But NIP, massive congratulations to them for, for making it into that third round. And, and I think specifically for a lot of the individual players on Team WWE, they have had a real revival split for themselves. I think Iwandi, um, you know, this guy, I, for me, if I had him as maybe third best support in the league, third or fourth. He's up there. The fact that he's in the conversation, fantastic for him. Wayward, after a lot of people slated this guy, we've just really sledged this guy for last year. Um, you know, he was on that team with Rookie and yeah. people were saying, well, this Rookie not playing with the top side of the map. Yeah, he did struggle last year. Not this year though go back and watch all of his games this is a split for him to be remembered by and even in this series wayward probably by and large outplayed shanji on the whole he was a huge factor in this series and then against omg as well pretty much everyone on this team even you know stay coming up from the ldl he has given yep. um a really good first impression for me watching him this team can definitely build off of this despite the fact that they will not be moving further forward in spring i, th I think the thing is with stay as well like yeah he got a couple of moments of mispositioning throughout the series, but this is his first ever split in yeah. the LPL. He's in round two of playoffs in game five, the most tense games he's ever played in his life. Like, it's not that surprising that a rookie has made a couple of little slip ups in this kind of series. Like, I think he's had a tremendous performance here today, and I think he should be proud of what he's done. The whole WE squad, I think, can be very proud with what they've achieved. And I'm excited to watch this team develop for some of them because I feel like this is a team with some serious potential in the LPL. For sure. And, you know, returning back to NIP as well, this is a team which we've always known has had potential and they have another series at least 
to show us how far that potential goes. Next round against Fun Plus Phoenix is it's a hell of a step up. Uh, based on what we've seen from Fun Plus Phoenix, they are a hell of a team. They beat JDG, they beat Top Esports. They did get demolished by BLG out of the top three teams. But this is one of those rosters which you you know you come off a regular season, and if they keep that level of form, NIP needs you once again step up. As you kind of always say from these teams in the gauntlet, the climb starts here. You win one series, you feel great, but that is the start of the journey and how brutal and efficient and rigorous the LPL playoffs is. You are never left wanting more from these teams. They show everything they have to give. Yeah, they absolutely do. And especially when it comes to that, that FPX series, I'm excited for how those drafts are going to pan out because it's a totally different beast to what they were up against today with WE. Let's take a look at our post game as uh, we round out game number five of the series. And look <laughs> at that. We talked about the mid lane matchup coming into oh today. It couldn't have been closer. And that is absolutely absurd like levels of DPM. Um, so both Fofo and Rookie had about 1,300 damage per minute. 1,300 damage per minute on in a professional game. That is absolutely absurd for both mid laners showing up and uh, being counted for. Fofo, another player, you know, we mentioned Wayward and Stay and Hung and I wanted to do Fofo in the mid lane. This guy, 100% kill participation gold. and damage to gold for both these mid laners. I, I, both of these mid laners can walk away heads held high. I know Fofo, he'll have to feel broken by that loss. Yeah. But honestly, what a performance for him, even in a losing game. Almost 400% value for good. Like, that is, I have to whip out the calculator that's, for this stuff, folks. <laughs> that, that's the biggest one I've ever seen, I think, on, on damage to gold value. Yeah. Insane game from Fofo's way. He tried his damnedest, but unfortunately, not enough at the end of the day. It was rookies to win. And I, I just can't get over how poetic it was that NIP were on the blue side for all four of the first four games of this series. And then the final game, they swap to red. They give Rookie the counter pick, and Rookie's the one that brings it home. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal stuff to witness. And you know, um, Rookie is one of the greatest players of all time. He's on that short list up there. The last year or two of play, I think he has not met his own standards. And that's important to note. You know, Rookie, he's already, with, with the body of work he's done, he's up there as the greatest of all time. But if it, to see him potentially return back to those upper echelons again, go to international play, it would be so, so special. Again, the journey starts here. Uh, you have another couple of rounds to go through before you even get towards, you know, double yeah. elimination and top four. But the fact that he is on this form after this split as well, after being one of the best RE players in the world, having an absolutely godlike to live, and then showing that he has a couple of these counter picks in pocket as well. It is good to see that old vintage rookie taking some games by the scruff of the neck when he yeah. needs to. And I will say, like, Rookie has had some of these rosters that haven't really been able to make it that far with it. But when you think about who's been on those rosters, players like Shun that he was playing with. Well, Shun is now one of the best strugglers in the world. Maybe <laughs> Aki uh, will have a similar treatment of being trained up by the god of the mid lane himself. These Meteors oh. doing so <laughs> much work in these fights. Porcelain, Aurelian, Soul, it's a hell of a skin to uh, mark the occasion as well. That one there. Uh... That was definitely a piece of art. It's a fine china that from uh, Rookie. Of that hey man play. Oh my word. He really just monstered this late game. It felt like if you misused any of your engage or you split at all, he used the mobility so well from ASOL. The thing is, once you've clicked that W, you, you ain't changing where you're heading. You're either going to make a game changing play or you're flying into Doom itself. <laughs> On the whole, he really positioned well. Nicarellian Soul is definitely in a place in the meta where he can be picked in a lot of different moments right now. You know, I feel like having this specialty pick to say, all right, fifth pick, Rookie is back. This is really important. Now, as a, as a team going later into this, I know that Care, he's another one of the Aurelian Soul player in the next round as well. He needs to be afraid of that pick being taken away from him in certain situations too. That's a good point, actually. This could be a big ace whole series in the next round of playoffs. Yep. <laughs> I want the really, really great flank in this fight to set up for the pick, like stay trying to survive but in the meantime rookie going down this was one of the closest team fights we've seen oh, in yeah. eight like this was down to the wire aside from maybe the one where uh, you know all 10 players died yes. recently <laughs> uh, this was about as close as they get and this play here this is why when we really remember that fofo is really striking and stuff both 80 cat well i mean one of the 80 carries is dead and the other one's a center so this is a bit weird fofo was so so clutch in that last fight sadly couldn't clutch it out in this one at the very end, uh, it was heart, heart in your mouth, the entirety of this late game. And for me, as a spectator, again, 
all I can say is I am privileged to watch this level of entertainment and be part of this alongside the rest of you watching as well. Every day we come into LPL playoffs, we're reminded what a spectacle it is. And I, you know, as fans of losing teams yeah. or winning teams, I'm sure you have very different emotional connections to it. Even as someone who loves players on both sides of the rift, I'm just so happy we get to have LPL playoffs again. It's been a so long waiting for this. It's just so good, isn't it? It's just so much fun watching these series go the distance, watching these teams throw everything at the table and see what sticks. NIP, the, the one thing that does concern me for them now is they have to go up against FPX, who have been chilling. They've been watching this series and they have yep. so much footage to win work with to prep for their series that series is the day after tomorrow nip don't have a lot of recovery time before they have to face fpx oh and that that series is going to be i mean how do you it's going to be such a different um decoding uh, compared to this one i think particularly yeah. you know shallow who on an individual level probably not at the level of wayward shanji might have an easier time in that top side so shallow who will have to step up to shanji now rather than shanji having to step up to wayward potentially i think that you know um, you look at the early game, though, on the whole from FPX, it might be less about the vision control slow creeping ahead in the game, but if you make a mistake, this team explodes you, particularly with Milky Way playing more carries. That changes the whole dynamic there. Maybe you can't just play a lot of these tanky engaged champions because yeah. Milky Way can pull you out of your own jungle. There's a lot of different equations at play and here. I think that's an important point because NIP is not a team that makes no mistakes either. So that could be a really oh. big focus in that series. Let's take a look at our MVP of game number five in our second round of playoffs. You already knew who it was going to be. It's, of course, Rookie in the mid lane, 8 1 and 6 on the A Sol. 42% damage share. What is that? Oh my word. We get to see all of these cool players again. You know what? Just show me all of the big ults. It's so cinematic. How can we not do this? That's Whirling Dragon. Of course, uh, uh, the LPL trophy is known as the Silver Dragon Cup as well. He's uh, just putting his, uh, his intense there. His dragon last pick, Year of the Dragon. It all comes together here. Oh my word, his team fights were so immaculate. There was the one team fight we gets picked off by Awani, but besides that, you were just waiting to see how Rookie <laughs> would pull it out. Absolutely insane. I just love that these replays, this isn't about like analyzing the play. This is just like, let's look cool. <laughs> let's show League off of Legends. these cool cinematics, yeah. It's absolutely popcorn League of Legends. I love it. And again, like, there is a huge amount of tenseness behind this too. And you can analyze this down to the fine art as well. But just take a second to enjoy it, folks, man. They're, these kind of games when it comes to the hyper late game, I say they don't happen very often. LPL occasionally does have them. But still, every time it happens, you're left just edgy your seat. I think particularly Photic as well on the center, helping just the extra wombo come in. <laughs> we just get to see more and more of these. Oh, it's so cinematic. Man, it's like... Uh... What was that film called? 2012, is it? Where the, the world ends and meteors oh, yeah. rain from the sky. <laughs> you thought it was just the dinosaurs that were going down. Apparently, the uh, the meteors are coming for League of Legends Champions 2 <laughs> after this performance from a rookie. Absolutely phenomenal stuff. I love that we get the full-on montage highlight reel with the dubstep <laughs> behind it and everything. That feels, uh, feels very 2013, doesn't it? But fantastic stuff. Amazing series from Rookie. Amazing series in general. I have had my fill. Like, absolutely phenomenal stuff today. Let's take a look at uh, our results as we finish things out today. 3-2 in the end, and what a way to do it for NIP. No, and again, it just reminds me how close, particularly round and two, round one and two, were likely to be between all of these teams. Pretty much the whole bottom half of playoffs were um, in it down to the game score, down to just the last couple of series, the last couple of days of play. And um, yeah, you know, teams which came in as 10th seed, 9th seed can absolutely go further than that. Um, of course, tomorrow we're going to have Weibo versus LNG as well. I expect that one to be another potential five game as well. That series is definitely one which you tune in for. You have uh, LNG who have been on a bit of a revival. Weibo still consistently inconsistent. And remember the last time we saw these two play last year in spring, Weibo yeah. LNG went to five games and it was a final Nexus defense which saw LNG through against them. It's also... Weibo versus LNG, it may not look like it, but that's Xiaohu versus Scout. RNG <laughs> and EDG didn't make it to playoffs, but Scout and Xiaohu did. They both have had pretty turbulent splits as well, but started to come true towards the end and now in a best of five in playoffs in one of the most legendary mid lane matchups i mean probably the most legendary mid lane matchup at least here in the lpl i, I just cannot wait for that series tomorrow oh there's so much history there is so much recency as well two teams which went to the world championship and now have to claw their way back up into the higher ends of playoffs they have 
As so many teams do in the LPL, an entire mountain to climb. This climb starts here. The playoffs bracket of LPL is ruthless, but oh my god, it's entertaining. <laughs> it sure is. That's going to be it from us today. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I've been Munch. That's been Nymera. It's been our honor to bring this ridiculously <laughs> great series to your screens, but that is going to be it from us. We'll be in chat tomorrow, so we'll see you there. But until then, we'll see you in Jump Select. Thank you.